Chapter Twenty Nine of Snarleyow by Frederick Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In which Jimmy Ducks proves the truth of Moggy's assertion that there was no one like him before or since. Nancy and Jemmy serenade the stars. As soon as Moggy landed at the point with her dear darling duck of a husband, as she called him, she put his chest and hammock on a barrow, and had them wheeled up to her own lodgings, and then they went out to call upon Nancy Corbett to make their future arrangements. Moggy proceeded in rapid strides, and Jemmy, trotting with his diminutive legs behind her, something like a stout pony by the side of a large horse. It was in pedestrianism that Jemmy most felt his inferiority, and the protecting fond way in which Moggy would turn round every minute and say, Come along, my duck, would have been irritating to any other but one of Jemmy's excellent temper. Many looked at Jemmy as he waddled along, smiled, and passed on. One unfortunate nymph, however, ventured to stop, and putting her arms akimbo, looked down upon him and exclaimed, Well, you are a nice little man, and then commenced singing the old refrain. I had a husband no bigger than my thumb. I put him in a pint pot, and there I bid him drum. When Moggy, who had turned back, saluted her with such a box on the ear that she made the drum of it ring again. The young lady was not one of those who would offer the other cheek to be smitten, and she immediately flew at Moggy and returned the blow, but Jemmy, who liked quiet, caught her round the legs, and, as if she had been a feather, threw her over his head, so that she fell down in the gutter behind him with a violence which was anything but agreeable. She gained her legs again, looked at her soiled garments, scraped the mud off her cheek, we are sorry to add, made use of some very improper language, and finding herself in the minority, walked off, turning round and shaking her fist at every twenty paces. Moggy and her husband continued their course as if nothing had happened, and arrived at the house of Nancy Corbett, who had, as may be supposed, changed her lodgings and kept out of sight of Van Slyperken. Nancy was no stranger to Jemmy Ducks. So far as his person went, he was too remarkable a character not to be known by her who knew almost everybody. And, moreover, she had made sufficient inquiries about his character. The trio at once proceeded to business. Jemmy had promised his wife to join the smugglers, and it was now arranged that both he and his wife should be regularly enlisted in the gang she to remain at the cave with the women, unless her services were required elsewhere, he to belong to the boat. There was, however, one necessary preliminary still to be taken, that of Jemmy and his wife both taking the oath of fidelity at the house of the Jew Lazarus. But it was not advisable to go there before dusk, so they remained with Nancy till that time, during which she was fully satisfied that, in both parties the band would have an acquisition, for Nancy was very keen and penetrating, and had a great insight into human nature. At dusk to the house of Lazarus they accordingly repaired, and were admitted by the cautious Jew. Nancy stated why they had come, and, there being at the time several of the confederates, as usual, in the house, they were summoned by the Jew to be witnesses to the oath being administered. Half a dozen dark-looking bold men soon made their appearance, and recognized Nancy by nods of their head. "'Who have we here, old Father Abraham?' exclaimed a stout man, who was dressed in a buff jerkin and a pair of boots which rose above his knees. "'A good man and true,' replied Nancy, taking up the answer. "'Why, you don't call that thing a man!' exclaimed the fierce-looking confederate with contempt. "'As good a man as ever stood in your boots,' replied Moggy in wrath. "'Indeed? Well, perhaps so. 
if he could only see his way when once into them, replied the man with a loud laugh, in which he was joined by his companions. What can you do, my little man? said another of a slighter build than the first, coming forward and putting his hand upon Jemmy's head. Now Jemmy was the best-tempered fellow in the world, but at the same time the very best-tempered people have limits to their forbearance, and do not like to be taken liberties with by strangers. So felt Jemmy, who, seizing the young man firmly by the waistband of his trousers just below the hips, lifted him from the ground, and with a strength which astonished all present, threw him clean over the table, his body sweeping away both the candles, and so they were all left in darkness. "'I can douse a glim, anyhow,' cried Jemmy. "'That's my darling duck,' cried Moggy, delighted with this proof of her husband's vigor. Some confusion was created by this maneuver on the part of Jemmy, but candles were reproduced, and the first man who spoke, feeling as if this victory on the part of Jemmy was a rebuke to himself, again commenced his interrogations. "'Well, my little man, you are strong in the arms, but what will you do without legs?' "'Not run away, as you have done a hundred times,' replied Jemmy scornfully. "'Now, by the wrath of God, you shall answer for this,' replied the man, catching hold of Jemmy by the collar. But in a moment he was tripped up by Jemmy, and fell down with great violence on his back. "'Bravo! bravo!' exclaimed the rest, who took part with Jemmy. "'That's my own little duck,' cried Moggy. "'You've shown him what you can do, anyhow.' The man rose, and was apparently feeling for some arms secreted about his person, when Nancy Corbett stepped forward. "'Do you dare?' cried she. "'Take what you have received, and be thankful, or—' and Nancy held up her little forefinger. The man slunk back among the others in silence. The old Jew, who had not interfered, being in the presence of Nancy, who had superior commands, now read the oath, which was of a nature not to be communicated to the reader without creating disgust. It was, however, such an oath as was taken in those times, and has since been frequently taken in Ireland. It was subscribed to by Jemmy and his wife without hesitation, and they were immediately enrolled among the members of the association. As soon as this ceremony had been gone through, Nancy and her protégés quitted the house and returned to her lodgings, when it was agreed that the next night they should go over to the island, as Jemmy's services were required in the boat in lieu of Ramsay, whose place as steersman he was admirably qualified to occupy. Much better, indeed, than that of a rower, as his legs were too short to reach the stretcher where it was usually fixed. The next evening the weather was calm and clear, and when they embarked in the boat of the old fishermen, with but a small portion of their effects, the surface of the water was unruffled, and the stars twinkled brightly in the heavens. One article which Jemmy never parted with was in his hand, his fiddle. They all took their seats, and the old fisherman shoved off his boat, and they were soon swept out of the harbor by the strong ebb tide. "'Ain't this better than being on board with Van Slyperkin, and your leave stopped?' observed Moggy. "'Yes,' replied the husband. "'And I not permitted to go on board to see my duck of a husband, confound his sniveling carcass?' continued Moggy. "'Yes,' replied Jemmy, thoughtfully. "'And in company with that supernatural cur of his?' Jemmy nodded his head and then in his abstraction touched the strings of his violin. "'They say you are clever with your instrument, Mr. Salisbury,' observed Nancy Corbett. "'That he is,' replied Moggy, "'and he sings like a darling duck, don't you, Jemmy, my dear?' "'Quack, quack,' replied Jemmy. "'Well, Mr. Salisbury, there's no boat that I can see near us, or even in sight.' and if there was it were little matter. I suppose you will let me hear you, for I shall have little opportunity after this. 
With all my heart, replied Jemmy, who, taking up his fiddle and playing upon the strings like a guitar, after a little reflection, sang as follows. Bless my eyes, how young Bill threw his shiners away, as he drank and he danced when he first came on shore. It was clear that he fancied that with his year's pay, like the bank of old England, he'd never be poor. So when the next day, with a southerly wind in his pockets, he came up, my rhino to borrow, you're welcome, says I, Bill, as I forked out the tin. But when larking today, don't forget there's tomorrow. When our frigate came to from a cruise in the west, and her yards were all squared, her sails neatly furled, young Tom clasped his Nancy so loved to his breast, as if but themselves there were none in the world. Between two of the guns they were fondly at play, all billing and kissing, forgetting all sorrow. Love like hash, says I, men may all go in a day, while you hug him so close, don't forget there's tomorrow. When a hurricane swept us smack smooth fore and aft, when we dashed on the rock and we floundered on shore, as we sighed for the loss of our beautiful craft, convinced that the like we should never see more. Says I, my good fellows, as we huddled together, they shivered and shook each fizz black with sorrow. Remember it's not to be always foul weather, so with ill luck today don't forget there's tomorrow. And not a bad hint neither, Mr. Salisbury, said Nancy, when Jemmy ceased. You sailors never think of tomorrow, more's the pity. You're no better than overgrown babies. I'm not much better at all events, replied Jemmy, laughing. However, I'm as God made me, so all's right. That's my own darling Jemmy, said Moggy. And if you're content and I'm content, who is to say a word, I should like to know? You may be a rum one to look at, but I think them fellows found you but a rum customer the other night. Don't put so much rum in your discourse, Moggy. You make me long for a glass of grog. Then your mouth will find the water, rejoined Nancy. But, however, singing is dry work, and I am provided. Pass my basket aft, old gentleman, and we will find Mr. Salisbury something with which to wet his whistle. The boatman handed the basket to Nancy, who pulled out a bottle and glass, which she filled, and handed to Jemmy. Now, Mr. Salisbury, I expect some more songs, said Nancy. And you shall have them, mistress, but I've heard say that you've a good pipe of your own. Suppose that you give me one in return. That will be but fair play. Not exactly, for you'll have the grog in the bargain, replied Nancy. Put my fiddle against the grog, and then all square. I have not sung for many a day, replied Nancy, musing, and looking up at the bright twinkling stars. I once sang when I was young and happy. I then sang all the day long. That was really singing, for it came from the merriness of my heart. And Nancy paused. Yes, I have sung since, and often, for they made me sing. But twas when my heart was heavy, or when its load has been, for a time, forgotten, and drowned in wine. That was not singing, at least not the singing of bygone days. But those times are bygone too, Mistress Nancy, said Moggy. You have now your marriage lines, and are made an honest woman. Yes, and God keep me so, amen, replied Nancy mournfully. Had not the night concealed it, a tear might have been seen by the others in the boat to trickle down the cheek of Nancy Corbett, as she was reminded of her former life. 
and as she again fixed her eyes upon the brilliant heavens, each particular star appeared to twinkle brighter, as if they rejoiced to witness tears like those. "'You must be light of heart now, Mistress Nancy,' observed Jemmy soothingly. "'I am not unhappy,' replied she, resting her cheek upon her hand. "'Mistress Nancy,' said Moggy, "'I should think a little of that stuff would do neither of us any harm. The night is rather bleak.' Moggy poured out a glass and handed it to Nancy. She drank it, and it saved her from a flood of tears which otherwise she would have been unable to repress. In a minute or two, during which Moggy helped herself and the old boatman, Nancy's spirits returned. "'Do you know this air?' said Nancy to Jemmy, humming it. "'Yes, I know it well, Mistress Nancy. Will you sing to it?' Nancy Corbett, who had been celebrated once for her sweet singing, as well as her beauty, immediately commenced in a soft and melodious tone, while Jemmy touched his fiddle. Lost, strolling, or strayed, the heart of a young maid, who shall ever the same shall find, and prove so very kind, to yield it on desire, they shall rewarded be, and that most handsomely, with kisses one, two, three, Cupid is the crier, ring-a-ding-ding, -ding. Cupid is the crier. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, here is a pretty mess, a maiden's heart is gone, and she is left forlorn, and panting with desire, whoever shall bring it me, they shall reward it be with kisses one two three cupid is the crier ring a ding ding cupid is the crier was lost on sunday eve or taken without leave a virgin's heart so pure she can't the loss endure and surely will expire Pity her misery, rewarded you shall be, with kisses one, two, three. Cupid is the crier, ring-a-ding-ding, -ding. Cupid is the crier. The maiden saw it around, it was not to be found. She searched each nook and dell, the haunt she loved so well, all anxious with desire. The wind blew ope his vest, when lo the toy in quest she found within the breast of Cupid the false crier, ring a ding ding, Cupid the false crier. Many thanks, Mistress Corbett, for a good song sung, a good tune with a sweet voice, said Jemmy. I owe you one for that, and am ready to pay you on demand. You've a pipe like a missile thrush. Well, I do believe that I shall begin to sing again, replied Nancy. I'm sure if Corbett was only once settled on shore in a nice little cottage with a garden and a blackbird in a wicker cage, I should try who could sing most, the bird or me. He will be by and by when his work is done. Yes, when it is, but open boats, stormy seas, and the halter are heavy odds, Mr. Salisbury. Don't mention the halter, Mistress Nancy. You'll make me melancholy, replied Jemmy, and I shan't be able to sing any more. Well, if they want to hang me, they need not rig the yard arm. Three hand spikes as shears, and I shouldn't find soundings, eh, Moggy? Nancy laughed at the ludicrous idea but Moggy exclaimed with vehemence, "'Hang my Jemmy, my darling duck! I should like to see them!' "'At all events we'll have another song from him, Moggy, before they spoil his windpipe, which I must say would be a great pity. But, Moggy, there have been better men hung than your husband.' "'Better men than my Jemmy, Mrs. Corbett? There never was one like him afore or since,' replied Moggy, with indignation. 
"'I only meant of longer pedigree, Moggy,' replied Nancy soothingly. "'I don't know what that is,' replied Moggy, still angry. "'Longer legs, to be sure,' replied Jemmy. "'Never mind that, Moggy. Here goes a song in two parts. It's a pity, Mistress Nancy, that you couldn't take one.' When will you give up this life of wild roving? When shall we be quiet and happy on shore? When will you to church lead your Susan so loving, And sail on the treacherous billows no more? My ship is my wife, Sue, no other I covet, Till I draw the firm splice that's betwixt her and me. I'll roam on the ocean, for much do I love it, To wed with another or rank bigamy. O oh, William, what nonsense you talk, you are raving, Pray how can a ship and a man become one? You say so because you no longer are craving, As once you were truly, and I am undone. You wrong me, my dearest, as sure as I stand here, As sure as I'll sail again on the wide sea. Some day I will settle and marry with you, dear, But now twould be nothing but rank bigamy. Then tell me the time, dear William, whatever, Your Sue may expect this divorce to be made when you'll surely be mine when no object shall sever but locked in your arms i'm no longer afraid the time it will be when my pockets are lined i'll then draw the splice tween my vessel and me and lead you to church if you're still so inclined but before my dear suit were rank bigamy Thank you, Mr. Salisbury. I like the moral of that song. A sailor should never marry till he can settle on shore. What's the meaning of big a me? said Moggy. Marrying two husbands or two wives, Mrs. Salisbury. Perhaps you might get off on the plea that you had only one and a half, continued Nancy, laughing. Well, perhaps she might, replied Jemmy if he were a judge of understanding. "'I should think, Mistress Nancy, you might as well leave my husband's legs alone,' observed Moggy, affronted. "'Lord bless you, Mogg. If he's not angry, you surely need not be. I give a joke, and I can take one. You surely are not jealous.' "'Indeed I am, though, and always shall be of anyone who plays with my Jimmy.' or if he plays with anything else? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Then you must be downright jealous of his fiddle, Moggy, replied Nancy. But never mind, you shan't be jealous now about anything. I'll sing you a song, and then you'll forget all this. Nancy Corbett then sang as follows. Fun Mary sat on Henry's knee. I must be home exact, said he and see the hour is come no henry you shall never go until me how to count you show that task must first be done then henry said as time is short addition you must first be taught sum up these kisses sweet now prove your sum by kissing me yes that is right twas three times three arithmetic's a treat and now there's another term subtraction you have yet to learn take four away from these yes that is right you've made it out says mary with a pretty pout subtraction don't me please divisions next upon the list young henry taught while mary kissed and much admired the rule now henry don't you think me quick why, yes, indeed, you've learned the trick, at kissing you're no fool. To multiply was next the game, which Henry by the method same, to Nancy fain would show. But here his patience was worn out, 
she multiplied too fast i doubt he could no farther go and now we must leave off my dear the other rules are not so clear we'll try at them to-night i'll come at eve my henry sweet behind the hawthorn hedge we'll meet for learning's my delight that's a very pretty song mistress corbett and you've a nice collection i've no doubt if you've no objection i'll exchange another with you i should be most willing mr salisbury but we are now getting well over and we may as well be quiet as i do not wish people to ask where we are going you're right ma'am observed the old fisherman who pulled the boat put up your fiddle master there'll be plenty on the lookout without our giving them notice very true replied jemmy so we break up our concert the whole party were now silent in a quarter of an hour the boat was run into a cut which concealed it from view and as soon as the fishermen had looked round to see the coast clear they landed and made haste to pass by the cottages after that nancy slackened her pace and they walked during the night over to the other side of the island and arrived at the cottages above the cave here they left a portion of their burdens and then proceeded to the path down the cliff which led to the cave on nancy giving the signal the ladder was lowered and they were admitted as soon as they were upon the flat moggy embraced her husband crying here i have you my own dear jemmy all to myself and safe for ever End of chapter 29 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 30 of Snarleyow by Frederick Marriott This LibriVox recording is in the public domain In which Mr. Van Slyperken treats the ladies On the second day after his arrival van slyperken as agreed went up to the syndic's house to call upon ramsay the latter paid him down one hundred pounds for his passage and services and van slyperken was so pleased that he thought seriously as soon as he had amassed sufficient money to withdraw himself from the service and retire with his ill-gotten gains but when would a miser like Van Slyperken have amassed sufficient money? Alas, never, even if the halter were half round his neck. Ramsay then gave his instructions to Van Slyperken, advising him to call for letters previously to his sailing, and telling him that he must open the government dispatches in the way to which he had been witness, take full memorandums of the contents, and bring them to him for which service he would each time receive fifty pounds as a remuneration. Van Slyperken bowed to his haughty new acquaintance and quitted the house. Yes, thought Ramsay, that fellow is a low, contemptible traitor, and how infamous does treason appear in that wretch! But I, I am no traitor, I have forfeited my property and risked my life in fidelity to my king and in attempting to rid the world of an usurper and a tyrant but indeed i am playing a traitor's part to my host but still i am doing my duty an army without spies would be incomplete and one may descend to that office for the good of one's country without tarnish or disgrace am i not a traitor to her already have not i formed visions in my imagination already of obtaining her hand and her heart and her fortune is not this treachery shall i not attempt to win her affections under disguise as her father's friend and partisan but what have women to do with politics or if they have do not they set so light a value upon them that they will exchange them for a feather yes surely when they love their politics are the politics of those they cling to at present she is on her father's side. 
but if she leave her father and cleave to me her politics will be transferred with her affections but then her religion she thinks me a protestant well love is all in all with women not only politics but religion must yield to it thy people shall be my people and thy god shall be my god as ruth says in the scriptures she is wrong in politics i will put her right she is wrong in religion i will restore her to the bosom of the church her wealth would be sacrificed to some heretic it were far better that it belonged to one who supports the true religion and the good cause in what way therefore shall i injure her on the contrary and ramsay walked downstairs to find wilhelmina such were the arguments used by the young cavalier and with which he fully satisfied himself that he was doing rightly had he argued the other side of the question he would have been equally convinced as most people are when they argue without any opponent but we must leave him to follow van slyperken mr van slyperken walked away from the syndic's house with a comfortable idea that one side of him was heavier than the other by one hundred guineas he also ruminated he had already obtained three hundred pounds no small sum in those days for a lieutenant it is true that he had lost the chance of thousands by the barking of snarleyow and he had lost the fair portsmouth widow but then he was again on good terms with a frau vandersloosh and was in a fair way of making his fortune and as he considered with small risk his mother too attracted a share of his reminiscences the old woman would soon die and then he would have all that she had saved smallbones occasionally intruded himself but that was but for a moment and mr vanslyperken walked away very well satisfied upon the whole with his esse and passe he wound up by flattering himself that he should wind up with the savings of his mother his half-pay the widow's gilders and his own property altogether it would be pretty comfortable but we leave him and return to corporal van spitter corporal van spitter had had wisdom enough to dupe van slyperken and persuade him that he was very much in love with babette and van slyperken who was not at all averse to this amour permitted the corporal to go on shore and make love as van slyperken did not like the cutter and snarleyow to be left without the corporal or himself he always remained on board when the corporal went so that the widow had enough on hand pretending love all the morning with the lieutenant and indemnifying herself by real love with the corporal after dusk her fat hand was kissed and slobbered from morning to night but it was half for love and half for revenge but we must leave the corporal and return to jemmy ducks jemmy was two days in the cave before the arrival of the boat during which he made himself a great favorite particularly with lily who sat down and listened to his fiddle and his singing it was a novelty in the cave anything like amusement on the third night however sir r barclay came back from cherbourg and as he only remained one hour jemmy was hastened on board taking leave of his wife but not parting with his fiddle he took his berth as steersman in lieu of ramsay and gave perfect satisfaction the intelligence brought over by sir robert rendered an immediate messenger to portsmouth necessary and as it would create less suspicion moggy was the party now entrusted in lieu of nancy who had been lately seen too often and it was supposed had been watched moggy was not sorry to receive her instructions which were to remain at portsmouth until lazarus the jew should give her further orders for there was one point which moggy was most anxious to accomplish now that she could do it without risking a retaliation upon her husband which was to use her own expression to pay off that snivelling old rascal van slyperken but we must leave moggy 
and the movements of individuals, and return to our general history. The Jungfrau was detained a fortnight at Amsterdam, and then received the dispatches of the States General, and those of Ramsey, with which Van Slyperken returned to Portsmouth. On his arrival he went through his usual routine at the Admirals and the Jews, received his douceur, and hastened to his mother's house, when he found the old woman, as she constantly prophesied, not dead yet. "'Well, child, what have you brought? More gold?' "'Yes,' replied Van Slyperken, laying down the one hundred and fifty guineas which he had received. "'Bless thee, my son, bless thee,' said the old woman, laying her palsied hand upon Van Slyperken's head. "'It is not often I bless. I never did bless as I can recollect. I like cursing better. My blessing must be worth something, if it's only for its scarcity. And do you know why I bless thee, my Cornelius?' because, <laughs> because you are a murderer and a traitor, and you love gold. Even Van Slyperken shuddered at the hag's address. What do you ever gain by doing good in this world? Nothing but laughter and contempt. I began the world like a fool, but I shall go out of it like a wise woman, hating, despising everything but gold. And I have had my revenge in my time. Yes, yes. The world, my son, is divided into only two parts, those who cheat and those who are cheated, those who master and those who are mastered, those who are shackled by superstitions and priests, and those who, like me, fear neither God nor devil. We must all die, yes, but I shan't die yet, no, no. And Van Slyperken almost wished that he could gain the unbelief of the decrepit woman whom he called mother, and who, on the verge of eternity, held fast to such a creed. Well, mother, perhaps it may be you are right. I never gained anything by a good action yet. Query, had he ever done a good action? You're my own child, I see, after all. You have my blessing, Cornelius, my son. Go and prosper. Get gold, get gold, replied the old hag, taking up the money and locking it up in the oak chest. Van Slyperken then narrated to his mother the unexpected interview with Smallbones, and his surmise that the lad was supernaturally gifted. Ah, well, replied she, those who are born to be hung will die by no other death but still it does not follow that they will not die. You shall have your revenge, my child. The lad shall die. Try again. Water, you say, rejects him. Fire will not harm him. There is that which is of the earth and of the air left. Try again, my son. Revenge is sweet, next to gold. After two hours' conversation it grew dark, and Van Slyperken departed revolving in his mind as he walked away the sublime principles of religion and piety in the excellent advice given by his aged mother. "'I wish I could only think as she does,' muttered Van Slyperken at last, and as he concluded this devout wish, his arm was touched by a neatly dressed little girl who curtsied and asked if he was not Lieutenant Van Slyperken, belonging to the cutter. Van Slyperken replied in the affirmative, and the little girl then said that a lady, her mistress, wished to speak to him. "'Your mistress, my little girl?' said Van Slyperken suspiciously. "'And pray, who is your mistress?' "'She is a lady, sir,' replied the latter. "'She was married to Major Williams, but he is dead.' "'Ha! Huh, a widow. Well, what does she want? I don't know her.' "'No, sir, and she don't know you. "'But she told me, if you did not come at once, "'to give you this paper to read.' "'Van Slyperken took the paper, "'and walking to the window of a shop in which there was a light, "'contrived to decipher as follows. "'Sir, the lady who lived in Castle Street has sent me a letter "'and a parcel to deliver up into your hands as the parcel is of value.' The bearer of this will bring you to my house. 
Your very obedient, Jane Williams. Two o'clock. Where does your mistress live, little girl? inquired Van Slyperken, who immediately anticipated the portrait of the fair widow, set in diamonds. She lives in one of the publics on the hard, sir, on the first floor, while she is furnishing her lodgings. One of the publics on the hard? Well, my little girl, I will go with you. I have been looking for you everywhere, sir, said the little girl, walking, or rather trotting, by the side of Van Slyperken, who strided along. Did your mistress know the lady who lived in Castle Street? Oh, yes, sir. My mistress then lived next door to her in Castle Street. But her lease was out, and now she has a much larger house in William Street. But she is painting and furnishing also handsome, sir, and now she has taken the first floor of the wheat sheaf till she can get in again. And Mr. Van Slyperken thought it would be worth his while to reconnoiter this widow before he closed with a Frau Vandersloosh. How selfish men are! In a quarter of an hour Mr. Van Slyperken and the little girl had arrived at the public house in question. Mr. Van Slyperken did not much admire the exterior of the building, but it was too dark to enable him to take an accurate survey. It was, however, evident that it was a pothouse, and nothing more, and Mr. Van Slyperken thought that lodgings must be very scarce in Portsmouth. He entered the first and inner door, and the little girl said she would go upstairs and let her mistress know that he was come. She ran up, leaving Mr. Van Slyperken alone in the dark passage. He waited for some time, when his naturally suspicious temper made him think he had been deceived, and he determined to wait outside of the house, which appeared very disreputable. He therefore retreated to the inner door to open it, but found it fast. He tried it again and again, but in vain, and he became alarmed and indignant. Perceiving a light through another keyhole, he tried the door, and it was open. A screen was close to the door as he entered, and he could not see its occupants. Mr. Van Slyperken walked round, and as he did so he heard the door closed and locked. He looked on the other side of the screen, and to his horror found himself in company with Moggy Salisbury and about twenty other females. Van Slyperken made a precipitate retreat to the door, but he was met by three or four women who held him fast by the arms. Van Slyperken would have disgraced himself by drawing his cutlass, but they were prepared for this, and while two of them pinioned his arms, one of them drew his cutlass from its sheath and walked away with it. Two of the women contrived to hold his arms while another pushed him in the rear, until he was brought from behind the screen into the middle of the room, facing his incarnate enemy, Moggy Salisbury. "'Good evening to you, Mr. Van Slyperken,' cried Moggy, not rising from her chair. "'It's very kind of you to come and see me in this friendly way. Come, take a chair, and give us all the news.' "'Mistress Salisbury, you had better mind what you are about with a king's officer,' cried Van Slyperken, turning more pale at this mockery than if he had met with abuse." There are constables and stocks and jails and whipping posts on shore, as well as the cat on board. I know all that, Mr. Van Slyperken, replied Moggy calmly. But that has nothing to do with the present affair. You have come of your own accord to this house to see somebody. That is plain, and you have found me. So now do as you're bid, like a polite man. Sit down and treat the ladies. Ladies? Mr. Van Slyperken stands treat, and please the pigs will make a night of it. What shall it be? I mean to take my share of a bottle of Oporto. What will you have, Mrs. Slamco? I'll take a bowl of burnt brandy with your leave, Mrs. Salisbury, not being very well in my inside. And you, my dear? Oh, punch for me, punch to the mast, cried another. I'll drink enough to float a jolly boat. It's very kind of Mr. Van Slyperken. 
all the ladies expressed their several wishes, and Vanslyperken knew not what to do. He thought he might as well make an effort, for the demand on his purse, he perceived, would be excessive, and he loved his money. "'You may all call for what you please,' said Vanslyperken, "'but you'll pay for what you call for. "'If you think that I am to be swindled in this way out of my money, you're mistaken. "'Every soul of you shall be whipped at the cart's tail to-morrow.' "'Do you mean to insinuate that I am not a respectable person, sir?' said a fierce-looking virago, rubbing her fist against Vanslyperken's nose. "'Smell that!' It was not a nosegay at all to the fancy of Mr. Van Slyperken. He threw himself back, and his chair fell with him. The ladies laughed, and Mr. Van Slyperken rose in great wrath. "'By all the devils in hell!' he exclaimed, whirling the chair round his head. "'But I'll do you a mischief!' But he was soon pinioned from behind. "'This is very unpolite conduct,' said one. "'You call yourself a gentleman?' "'What shall we do, ladies?' "'Do,' replied another. "'Let's strip him and pawn his clothes, then turn him adrift.' "'Well, that's not a bad notion,' replied the others, and they forthwith proceeded to take off Mr. Van Slyperken's coat and waistcoat. How much further they would have gone it is impossible to say for Mr. Van Slyperken had made up his mind to buy himself off as cheap as he could. Be it observed that Moggy never interfered, nor took any part in this violence. On the contrary, she continued sitting in her chair, and said, Indeed, ladies, I request you will not be so violent. Mr. Van Slyperken is my friend. I am sorry that he will not treat you, but if he will not, I beg you will allow him to go away. There, you hear? cried Mr. Van Slyperken. Mrs. Salisbury, am I at liberty to depart? Most certainly, Mr. Van Slyperken. You have my full permission. Ladies, I beg that you will let him go. No, by the living jingo, not till he treats us, cried one of the women. Why did he come into this shop? But for nothing else? I'll have my punch afore he starts. And I my burnt brandy. So cried they all, and Mr. Van Slyperken, whose coat and waistcoat were already off, and finding many fingers very busy about the rest of his person, perceived that Moggy's neutrality was all a sham. So he begged to be heard. Ladies, I'll do anything in reason, as far as five shillings. Five shillings, exclaimed the woman. No, no, why, a foremast man would come down with more than that. And you, a lieutenant? Five guineas now would be saying something. Five guineas? Why, I have not so much money. Upon my soul, I haven't. Let us see, said one of the party, diving like an adept into Van Slyperken's trousers pocket and pulling out his purse. The money was poured out onto the table and twelve guineas counted out. "'Then whose money is this?' cried the woman. "'Not yours on your soul? "'Have you been taking a purse to-night? "'I vote we send for a constable.' "'I quite forgot that I had put more money in my purse,' muttered Van Slyperken, who never expected to see it again. "'I'll treat you, ladies, treat you all, to whatever you please.' "'Bravo! "'That's spoken like a man!' cried the virago giving Van Slyperken a slap on the back, which knocked the breath out of his body. "'Bravo!' exclaimed another. "'That's what I call handsome. Let's all kiss him, ladies.' Van Slyperken was forced to go through this ordeal, and then the door was unlocked, but carefully guarded while the several orders were given. "'Who is to pay for all this?' exclaimed the landlady. "'This gentleman treats us all,' replied the woman. Oh, very well. Is it all right, sir? Van Slyperken dared not say no. He was in their power, and every eye watched him as he gave his answer. So he stammered out, Yes, and, in a fit of despair at the loss of his money, he threw himself into his chair and meditated revenge. Give Mr. Van Slyperken his purse, Susan, 
said the prudent Moggy to the young woman who had taken it out of his pocket. The purse was returned, and in a few minutes the various liquors and mixtures demanded made their appearance, and the jollification commenced. Every one was soon quite happy, with the exception of Mr. Van Slyperken, who, like Pistol, ate his leek, swearing in his own mind he would be horribly revenged. "'Mr. Van Slyperken, you must drink my health in some of this punch.' Van Slyperken compressed his lips and shook his head. "'I say yes, Mr. Van Slyperken,' cried the virago, looking daggers. "'If you don't, we quarrel, that's all.' But Van Slyperken argued in his mind that his grounds of complaint would be weakened if he partook of the refreshment which he had been forced to pay for, so he resolutely denied. "'Won't you listen to my arguments, Mr. Van Slyperken?' continued the woman. "'Well, then, I must resort to the last, which I never knew fail yet.' The woman went to the fire and pulled out the poker, which was red-hot, from between the bars. "'Now that my beauty, you must kiss this or drink some punch.' and she advanced it toward his nose, while three or four others held him fast on his chair behind. The poker, throwing out a glow of heat, was within an inch of the poor lieutenant's nose. He could stand it no more. His face and eyes were scorched. "'Yes, yes!' cried he at last. "'If I must drink, then I will.' "'We must settle this matter by and by,' cried Van Slyperken pouring down with indignation the proffered glass. "'Now, Susan, don't ill-treat Mr. Van Slyperken. I protest against all ill-treatment.' "'Ill-treat, Mrs. Salisbury? I am only giving him a lesson in perliteness.' "'Now, Mr. What's-the-devil your name? You must drink off a glass of my burnt brandy, or I shall be jealous,' cried another. "'And when I am jealous, I always takes to red-hot pokers.' Resistance was in vain. The poker was again taken from between the bars, and the burnt brandy went down. Again and again was Mr. Van Slyperken forced to pour down his throat all that was offered to him, or take the chance of having his nose burnt off. "'Is it not wrong to mix your liquors in this way, Mr. Van Slyperken?' said Moggy, in bitter mockery. The first allowance brought in was now dispatched, and the bell rung, and double as much was ordered, to Van Slyperken's great annoyance. But he was in the hands of the Philistines. What made the matter worse was that the company grew every moment more uproarious, and there was no saying when they would stop. "'A song! A song! A song from Mr. Van Slyperken!' cried one of the party. "'Hurrah! Yes, a song from the jolly lieutenant!' "'I can't sing,' replied Van Slyperken. "'You shall sing by the piper who played before Moses,' said the virago. "'If not, you shall sing out to some purpose.' And the red-hot poker was again brandished in her masculine fist. And she advanced to him, saying, "'Suppose we hide you the point.' "'Would you murder me, woman?' "'No, singing's no murder. But we ax a song, and a song we must have.' "'I don't know one. Upon my honor, I don't,' cried Van Slyperken. "'Then we'll learn you. And now you repeat after me.' Paul put her arms akimbo. "'Sing. Come, out with it.' And the poker was again advanced. "'Oh, God!' cried Van Slyperken. "'Sing, or by heavens I'll shorten your nose.' "'Sing, I say,' repeated the woman, advancing the poker so as to actually singe the skin. "'Take it away, and I will,' cried Van Slyperken, breathless. "'Well, then, Pa'll put her arms akimbo.' "'Pa'll put her arms akimbo,' repeated Van Slyperken. "'That's sing, not singing,' cried the woman. "'Now again. At the Admiral's house look she.' "'At the Admiral's house, look she,' replied Van Slyperken, in a whining tone. 
thus with the poker staring him in the face was vanslyperken made to repeat the very song for singing which he would have flogged jemmy ducks there was however a desperate attempt to avoid the last stanza i'll give you a bit of my mind old boy port admiral you be damned nothing but the tip of his nose actually burnt would have produced these last words but fear overcame him and at last they were repeated upon which all the women shouted and shrieked with laughter except moggy who continued sipping her port wine your good health mr vanslyperken said moggy drinking to him vanslyperken wiped the perspiration off his forehead and made no reply you call yourself a gentleman and not drink the health of the lady of the house cried virago mrs slamco i'll argue this point with you again the same never-failing argument was used and mr vanslyperken drank mrs salisbury's health in a glass of the port wine which he was to have the pleasure of paying for i must say mr vanslyperken said moggy it was very hard for to wish to flog my poor jemmy for singing a song which you have just now been singing yourself did he want to flog your jemmy for that yes he did indeed ladies then as sure as i stand here and may this punch be my poison if he shan't beg your pardon on his knees shan't he girls cried mrs slamco yes yes that he shall or we'll poke him with the poker this was a dreadful threat but the indignity was so great that vanslyperken attempted to resist it was however in vain he was forced to go on his knees and ask mrs salisbury's pardon indeed ladies i do not wish it said moggy no pray don't well mr vanslyperken pardon granted so now kiss and make friends mr vanslyperken surrounded now by furies rather than bacchanalians kissed mrs salisbury what in the world would you have me do you she-devils cried he at last driven to desperation that is language for a gentleman said mrs slamco they shall make you do nothing more replied moggy i must retire ladies your freak's up you know i never keep late hours ladies i wish you all very good night perhaps mr vanslyperken you would wish to go i'll send for the woman of the house that you may settle the bill i think you offer to treat the company vanslyperken grinned ghastly the bell was rung and while mr vanslyperken was pulling out the sum demanded by the landlady the ladies all disappeared vanslyperken put up his diminished purse there is your sword mr vanslyperken said moggy who during the whole of the scene had kept up a retinue very different from her usual manners vanslyperken took his sword and appeared to feel his courage return why not he was armed and in company with only one woman and he sought revenge he rang the bell and the landlady appeared landlady replied vanslyperken you'll send for a constable directly obey me or i'll put you down as a party to the robbery which has been committed i say a constable immediately refuse on your peril woman a king's officer has been robbed and ill-treated lock a mercy a constable sir i'm sure you've had a very pleasant jollification silence woman send for a constable immediately do you hear mrs wilcox said moggy very quietly mr vanslyperken wants a constable send for one by all means oh certainly ma'am if you wish it said the landlady quitting the room yes you infamous woman i'll teach you to rob and ill-treat people in this way mercy on me mr vanslyperken why i never interfered ay ay that's all very well but you'll tell another story when you're all before the authorities perhaps i shall replied moggy carelessly 
But I shall now wish you a good evening, Mr. Vanslyperken. Thereupon Mr. Vanslyperken very valorously drew his sword and flourished it over his head. You don't pass here, Mrs. Salisbury. No, no, it's my turn now. Your turn now, you beast, retorted Moggy. Why, if I wished to pass, this poker would soon clear the way. But I can pass without that, and I will give you the countersign. Hark, a word in your ear, you wretch. You are in my power. You have sent for a constable, and I swear by my own Jimmy's little finger, which is worth your old shriveled carcass, that I shall give you in charge of the constable. Me? exclaimed Vanslyperken. Yes, you, you wretch, you scum. Now I am going. Stop me if you dare. Walls have ears, so I'll whisper. If you wish to send a constable after me, you'll find me at the house of the Jew Lazarus. Do you understand? Vanslyperken started back as if an adder had come before him. His sword dropped out of his hand, and he stood transfixed. May I go now, Mr. Vanslyperken, or am I to wait for the constable? Silence gives consent, continued Moggy, making a mock curtsy and walking out of the room. For a minute Vanslyperken remained in the same position. At last, bursting with his feelings, he snatched up his sword, put it into the sheath, and was about to quit the room when in came the landlady with the constable. "'You vants me, sir?' said the man. "'I did,' stammered Van Slyperken. "'But she is gone.' "'I must be paid for my trouble, sir, if you please.' Van Slyperken had again to pull out his purse, but this time he hardly felt the annoyance, for in his mind's eye his neck was already in the halter. He put the money into the man's hand without speaking, and then left the room, the landlady curtsying very low, and hoping that she soon should again have the pleasure of his company at the wheat sheaf. End of chapter 30 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter Thirty One of Snarleyow by Frederick Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In which Snarleyow again triumphs over his enemies. But we must return to the cabin and state what took place during this long absence of the commander, who had gone on shore about three o'clock and had given directions for his boat to be at the point at sunset. There had been a council of war held on the forecastle, in which Corporal Van Spitter and Smallbones were the most prominent, and the meeting was held to debate whether they should or should not make one more attempt to destroy the dog. Singular! that the arguments and observations very nearly coincided with those made use of by Van Slyperken and his mother when they debated how to get rid of Smallbones. "'Water won't touch him, I sees that,' observed Smallbones. "'No, my God, that was to throw time and to trouble away,' replied the corporal. "'Hanging's just as natural a death for a cur observed Spurry. Yes, observed Short. I'm afraid that the rope's not laid that's to hang that animal, observed Cobble, shaking his head. If water won't do, I'm persuaded nothing will, for did not they use in former days to lay all spirits in the Red Sea? Yes, quoth Short. But he bain't a spirit yet, replied Smallbones, he be flesh and blood of some sort. If I gets fairly rid of his body, damn his soul, I say, he may keep that in welcome. But then, you know, he'll just haunt us just as much as ever. We shall see him here just the same. A spirit is only a spirit, observed Smallbones. He may live in the cabin all day and night afore I care. But, do you see, 
there's a great difference between the ghost of a dog and the dog himself. Why, if the beast aren't natural, I can't see much odds, observed Spurry. But I can feel him, replied Smallbones. This here dog has a bitten me all to bits, but a ghost of a dog can't bite anyhow. No, replied Short. And now do you see, as Obadiah Cobble has said, as how spirits must be laid, I think if we were to come for to go for to lay this here animal in the cold hearth, he may perhaps not be able to get up again. That's only a perhaps, observed Cobble. Well, a perhaps is better than nothing at all, said the lad. Yes, observed Short. That depends upon circumstances, observed Spurry. What sort of a breakfast would you make upon a perhaps? A good one, perhaps, replied Smallbones, grinning at the jingling of the words. Twenty dozen tyfels, Smallbones, is in de right, observed Jansen, who had taken no part in the previous conversation. Suppose you bury de dog, de dog's body not get up again. Suppose he will come, his soul come. Leave him body behind him. That's exactly my notion of the thing, observed Smallbones. Do you mean for to bury him alive? inquired Spurry. Alive? Got in him, oh no. I knocked the brains out first, parry afterwards. There's some sense in that, Corporal. And the dog can't have much left anyhow, dog or devil, when his brains are all out. No, quoth Short. But who is to do it? Corporal and I, replied Smallbones. We be agreed, paint we, Corporal? Mein Gott, yes. And now I votes that we tries it offhand. What's the use of shilly-shally? I made a mortal vow that ere long that that ere dog and I won't live together. There bain't room enough for us two. It's a wide world nevertheless, observed Cobble, hitching up his trousers. Howsomever, I have nothing to say, but I wish you luck. But if you kill that dog, I'm a bishop, that's all. And if I don't try for to do so, I am a harch bishop, that's all, replied the gallant Smallbones. Come along, Corporal. And here was to be beheld a novel scene. Smallbones, followed in obedience by his former persecutor and his superior officer. A bag of bones, a reed, a lath, a scarecrow, like a pilot cutter ahead of an Indiaman, followed in his wake by Corporal Van Spitter, weighing twenty stone. How could this be? It was human nature. Smallbones took the lead because he was the more courageous of the two, and the corporal following proved he tacitly admitted it. He be a real bit of stuff, that air Peter Smallbones, said one of the men. I think he be a supernatural himself, for my part, rejoined Spurry. At all events, he aren't afraid of him, said another. We shall see, replied Cobble, squirting out his tobacco juice under the gun. Come on, men, we must go to work now. Shall we, Mr. Short? Yes, replied the commanding officer, and the conference broke up. In the meantime, the consultation was continued between Smallbones and the corporal. The latter had received instruction to take on shore Mr. Van Slyperkin's dirty linen to the washerwoman, and, of course, as a corporal, he was not obliged to carry it and would take Smallbones for that purpose. Then he could easily excuse taking the dog on shore upon the plea of taking care of it. It was therefore so arranged. The dog would follow the corporal in the absence of his master, but no one else. In a few minutes the corporal, Smallbones, Snarleyow, and a very small bundle of linen were in the boat and shoved off with as many good wishes and as much anxiety for their success 
as probably Jason and his followers received when they departed in search of the Golden Fleece. The three parties kept in company and passed through the town of Portsmouth. The washerwoman lived outside the lines, and there they proceeded, Snarleyow very much in spirits at being able to eat the grass, which his health very much required. They walked on until they arrived at a large elm tree on the side of the road, which lay between two hedges and ditches. "'This will do,' observed the corporal solemnly. "'My God, I wish it was over,' continued he, wiping the perspiration from his bull forehead. "'How shall we kill him, corporal?' inquired Smallbones. "'My God, knock him head against a tree, I suppose.' "'Yes, and bury him in the ditch. "'Here, dog, snarly owl, here, dog,' said Smallbones. "'Come, a poor doggy, come here.' "'But snarly owl was not to be coaxed by Smallbones. "'He suspected treachery. "'He won't have come to me, corporal, "'or I'd soon settle his hash,' observed Smallbones. "'The corporal had now got over a little panic which had seized him. He called Snarleyow, who came immediately. Oh, had he imagined what the corporal was about to do, he might have died like Caesar, exclaiming, Et tu, Brute, which in plain English means, And you, you brute! The corporal, with a sort of desperation, laid hold of the dog by the tail, drawing him back till he could swing him round. In a second or two Snarleyow was whirling round the corporal, who turned with him, gradually approaching the trunk of the elm tree, till at last his head came in contact with it with a resounding blow, and the dog fell senseless. "'Try it again, corporal. Let's finish him.' The corporal again swung round the inanimate body of the dog, again and again and again did the head come in contact with the hard wood and then the corporal quite out of breath with the exertion dropped the body on the grass neither of them spoke a word for some time but watched the body as it lay motionless doubled up with the fore and hind feet meeting each other and the one eye closed well i've a notion that he's done for anyhow said smallbones at last. My God, yes, replied the corporal. He never get on his legs again, be he tog or be he tyfel. Now for to come for to go for to bury him, said Smallbones, swinging the dog by the tail and dragging him towards the ditch. I wonder if we could get a spade anywhere, corporal. My God, if we ask for a spade, they will ask what for and Van Slyperken may find it all out. Then I'll bury him and cover him up anyhow. He'll not come to life again. If he does, may I be knocked on the head like him, that's all. Smallbones dragged the body into the ditch, and collecting out of the other parts of the ditch great quantity of wet leaves, covered the body a foot deep. There, they won't find him now, because they won't know where to look for him. I say, Corporal, I've a notion we had better not be seen here too long. No, said the Corporal, wiping his forehead, putting his handkerchief in his cap, and his cap on his head. We must go now. They went to the washerwoman's, delivered the bundle, and then returned on board, when the whole crew were informed of the success of the expedition, and appeared quite satisfied that there was an end of the detested cur all but Cobble, who shook his head. "'We shall see,' says he. "'But I'm blessed if I don't expect the cur back to-morrow morning.' We must now return to Van Slyperken, who left the public house in a state of consternation. "'How could she possibly know anything about it?' exclaimed he. "'My life and the power of that she-devil!' And Van Slyperken walked on, turning over the affair in his mind. I have gone too far to retreat now. What a fool have I been! But then Van Slyperken thought of the money. No, no, not a fool, but I am very unfortunate. 
Vanslyperken continued his route until it at last occurred to him that he would go to the Jew, Lazarus, and speak with him. For, thought Vanslyperken, if all is discovered, they may think that I have informed, and then my life will be sought by both parties. Vanslyperken arrived at the Jew's abode, knocked softly, but received no answer. He knocked again, louder. A bustle and confusion was heard inside, and at last the door, with the chain fixed, was opened a couple of inches, and the Jew stammered out, "'What was there at this late hour of the night?' "'It is me, the lieutenant of the cutter,' replied Vanslyperken. "'I must speak with you directly.' The door was opened, several figures, and the clatter of arms were heard in the dark passage, and as soon as Van Slyperken had entered, it was relocked, and he was left in the dark. In a minute the Jew, in a woolen wrapper, made his appearance with a light, and led Van Slyperken into the room where he had been shown before. "'Now then, Mr. Lieutenant, what was the matter?' "'We are discovered, I am afraid,' exclaimed Van Slyperken. "'Holy Father Abraham!' exclaimed the Jew, starting back. "'But tell me why you say so.' "'A woman told me this night that she knew why I came to your house, that I was in her power.' "'What woman?' "'A hellcat who hates me as she does the devil.' "'A hellcat would not hate the devil?' slowly observed the Jew. Well, perhaps not, but she will ruin me if she can. That was her name, said Lazarus. Moggy Salisbury. Ha! Is that all? Why, my good friend, she is one of us. There, you may go, Fay. You may go to bed, Mr. Van Slyperken. What do you mean? I mean that she laughed at you and frightened you, that she is one of us. And so is her husband, who vas in your chip. That you hang, she and I will all hang together. Now you comprehend? Yes, replied Van Slyperken. I do now. But how could you trust such people? Trust such people, Mr. Van Slyperken? If you prove as true as those people, why, all the better. Now go away. Go to bed. You have waked up all the peoples here. "'Good night, Mr. Lieutenant.' And the Jew led the way to the door, and let Van Slyperken out. "'So then,' thought Van Slyperken, as he pursued his way down to the point, "'that woman and her husband are damnation, but I've a great mind to discover all, if it's only to hang them.' But on second thoughts Van Slyperken thought that it was not worth while to be hanged himself just for the pleasure of hanging others. It was a great relief to his mind to know that there was no fear of discovery. The tip of his nose itched, and he rubbed it mechanically. The rubbing brought away all the skin. He remembered the hot poker, the money he had been forced to pay, his being made to sing and to beg pardon on his knees, and he cursed Moggy in his heart the more so as he felt that he dared not take any steps against her. When he came to the point, he stood on the shingle, looking for his boat. But the men had waited till twelve o'clock, and then, presuming that their commander did not intend to come at all that night, had pulled on board again. He was looking round for a waterman to pull him off, when something cold touched his hand. Van Slyperken started and almost screamed with fear. He looked, and it was the cold nose of Snarleyow, who now leaped upon his master. Snarleyow, my poor dog, how came you on shore? But the dog, not being able to speak, made no answer. While Van Slyperken was wondering how the dog could possibly have come on shore, and what Corporal Van Spitter could be about to have allowed it, the small casement of a garret window near him was opened, and a head was thrust out. "'Do you want to go on board, sir?' said a tremulous voice. "'Yes,' replied Van Slyperken. "'I will be down directly, sir,' 
replied the old boatman, who in a minute or two appeared with his skulls on his shoulder. "'Not easy to find a boat at this time of the morning, sir,' said the man. "'But I heard you speaking, for I had such a toothache these two nights that I can't shut my eyes.' The old man unlocked the chain which fastened his worry, and in a few minutes Vanslyperken was on the deck of the cutter. But he found there was no one to receive him, no watch kept. "'Very well,' thought he. "'We'll talk about this tomorrow morning. Short or cobble, I wonder which of the two. Pretty neglect of duty, indeed. Report to the Admiral, by heavens!' So saying, Mr. Van Slyperken, with Snarleyow at his heels, went down into the cabin, undressed in the dark, for he would not let anyone know that he was on board. It being about three o'clock in the morning, and Mr. Van Slyperken being well tired with the events of the day, he was soon in a sound sleep. There will be no difficulty in accounting for the return of the dog, which had a skull much thicker than even the corporal's. He had been stunned with the heavy blows, but not killed. After a certain time he came to himself in his bed of leaves, first scratched with one paw, and then with another, till his senses returned. He rose, worked his way out, and lay down to sleep. After he had taken a long nap, he rose recovered, shook himself, and trotted down to the beach. But the boat had shoved off, and the cur had remained there, waiting for an opportunity to get on board, when his master came down with the same object in view. But as every soul is fast asleep, we shall now finish the chapter. End of chapter 31 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 32 of Snarleyow by Frederick Marriott this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Listeners never hear any good of themselves. Van Slyperken was awakened three hours after he had fallen asleep by the noise of the buckets washing the decks. He heard the men talking on deck, and, aware that no one knew that he was on board, he rose from his bed and opened one of the sliding sashes of the skylight that he might overhear the conversation. The first words he heard were from Bill Spurry. I say, Cobble, I wonder what the skipper will say when he comes on board and finds that the dog is gone. Ho oh, ho, thought Van Slyperken. I aren't convinced that he is gone yet, replied Cobble. "'Smallbones swears that he's settled this time,' replied Spurry. "'So he did before,' replied Cobble. "'Smallbones again,' thought Van Slyperken. "'I'll smallbones him if I hang for it.' "'Why, he says he buried him two feet deep.' "'Aye, aye. But what's the use of burying an animal who's not a human creature?' For my part I say this, that the imp belongs to his master, and is bound to serve him as long as his master lives. When he dies the dog may be killed, and then— Then what? Why, with the blessing of God, they'll both go to hell together, and I don't care how soon. Kill me, you old villain, muttered Van Slyperken, grinding his teeth. Well, anyhow— if the dog be not made away with, no more be small bones. He aren't afeard of the devil himself. No, not he. I'm of opinion small bones weren't sent here for nothing. He's escaped him twice, at all events. Then they know it, thought Van Slyperken, turning pale. Aye, and I will take you any bet you please. That the skipper never takes that boy's life. He's charmed, or I am a gudgeon. Van Slyperken felt that it was his own suspicion, and he trembled at the idea of the lad being supernatural. 
"'Out of the way, Cobble, or I'll fill your shoes,' cried out one of the men, sloshing a bucket of water. "'That's not quite so easy, cause I've got boots on,' replied Cobble. "'However, I'll take up another berth.' The men walked away, and Van Slyperken could hear no more, but he had heard quite enough. The life of the dog had been attempted by Smallbones, it was evident. Mr. Van Slyperken, after a little agitation, rang the bell. "'By all that's blue, the skipper's on board!' exclaimed the men on deck. "'When the devil did he come?' "'Not in my watch, at all events,' replied Cobble. "'Did he come in yours, Short?' "'No,' replied Short. "'Then it must have been in the corporal's.' "'The corporal never called me, nor was he on deck,' replied Cobble. "'I have a notion he never kept his watch.' The ring at the bell particularly concerned two people, the two culprits, Smallbones and Corporal Van Spitter. The latter made his appearance, but previous to his answering the bell, Mr. Van Slyperken had time to reflect. "'So they think my dog is supernatural,' said he. "'So much the better. I'll make them believe it still more.' Mr. Van Slyperken called the dog and pointed to his bed. The dog, who was fond of a warm berth, and but seldom allowed to get on the bed, immediately jumped up into it when invited and Mr. Van Slyperken patted him and covered him up with the bedclothes. He then drew the curtains of the bed and waited to see who would answer the bell. Corporal Van Spitter made his appearance. "'Corporal, I came on board very late. Where have you put the dog? Bring him into the cabin.' Here the corporal, who was prepared, shook his head, smoothed down the hair of his forehead, and made a very melancholy face. "'It was all my fault, mynheer Van Slyperken. It I do for the best, but the tog be lost.' "'How is that, corporal?' The corporal then stated that he had taken the precaution to take the dog on shore, as he was afraid to leave it on board when he went to the washerwoman's, and that he was not long there, but while he was, the dog disappeared.' He had looked everywhere, but could not find it. "'You took Smallbones with you?' said Van Slyperken. "'Yes, mynheer, to carry de linen.' "'And where was he when you were at the washerwoman's?' "'He was here and there.' "'I know that it was he who killed and buried the dog, Corporal.' Corporal Van Spitter started. He thought he was discovered." "'Killed and buried, mein God,' said the corporal, obliged to say something. "'Yes, I overheard the men say so on deck, corporal. He must have taken the opportunity when you were in the house counting the linen.' Now the corporal had time to recover himself, and he argued that anything was better than that he should be suspected. Smallbones was already known to have attempted the life of the dog, so he would leave the lieutenant in his error. "'Mein God, he is von damp chill dog feller,' observed the corporal. "'I look everywhere, but I no find de tog. Then de dog is dead?' "'Yes,' replied Van Slyperken. "'But I'll punish this scoundrel, depend upon it. That will do, corporal. You may go.' As Snarleyow remained perfectly quiet during this conversation, we must give Van Slyperken great credit for his maneuver. The corporal went to Smallbones and repeated what had passed. Smallbones snapped his fingers. "'He may keelhaul or hang me, for all I care. The dog is dead. Never fear, corporal, I won't peach upon you. I'm game, and I'll die so, if so be I must.' Van Slyperken sent for Smallbones. Smallbones, who was worked up to the highest state of excitement, came in boldly. "'So, you villain, you've killed my dog and buried it.' "'No, I aren't,' replied Smallbones. "'I knows nothing about your dog, sir.' "'Why, the men on deck said so, you scoundrel. I heard them.' 
I don't care what the men say. I never killed your dog, sir. You rascal, I'll have your life, exclaimed Vanslyperken. Smallbones grinned diabolically, and Vanslyperken, who remembered all that the men had said in confirmation of his own opinion relative to Smallbones, turned pale. Smallbones, on his part, aware from Corporal Van Spitter that the lieutenant had such an idea, immediately took advantage of the signs of the lieutenant's countenance, and drawled out, "'That's not so easy.' Van Slyperken turned away. "'You may go now, sir, but depend upon it, you shall feel my vengeance.' And Smallbones quitted the cabin. Van Slyperken finished his toilet, and then turned the dog out of the bed. He went on deck, and after he had walked a little while, sent for Corporal Van Spitter to consult as to the best method of ascertaining what had become of Snarleyow. Having entered apparently very earnestly into the corporal's arrangements, who was to go on shore immediately, he desired the corporal to see his breakfast got ready in the cabin. It so happened that the corporal went into the cabin, followed by Smallbones. The first object that met his view was Snarleyow, sitting upon the chest, scratching his ragged ear as if nothing had happened. "'Got in himmel!' roared the corporal, turning back and running out of the cabin, upsetting Smallbones, whom he met in the passage, and trotting like an elephant right over him. Nor was Smallbones the only one who suffered. Two marines and three seamen were successively floored by the corporal, who, blinded with fear, never stopped till he ran his head butt against the lining in the forepeak of the cutter, which, with the timbers of the vessel, brought him up, not all standing, in one sense of the word, for in his mad career his head was dashed so violently against them that the poor corporal fell down, stunned to insensibility. In the meantime Smallbones had gained his feet and was rubbing his ribs to ascertain if they were all whole. "'Well, I'm sure,' said he, "'if I aren't flattened for all the world like a pancake, with that ere corporal's weight. One may as well have a broad-wheel wagon at once go over one's body. But what could make him come for to go for to run away bellowing in that ere manner? He must have seen the devil.' Or perhaps, thought Smallbones, that imp of the devil Snarleyow. I'll go and see what it was, anyhow. Smallbones, rubbing his abdomen, where the corporal had trod hardest, walked into the cabin, where he beheld the dog. He stood with his mouth wide open. I defy the devil in all his works, exclaimed he at last, and you be one of his, that's certain. I fear God, and I honor the king, and the parish taught me to read the Bible. There you be resurrectioned up again. Well, it's no use, I suppose. Satan, I defy you, anyhow. But it's very hard that a good Christian should have to get the breakfast ready, of which you'll eat one half. I don't see why I'm to wait upon the devil or his imps. Then Smallbone stopped and thought a little. I wonder whether he be dead, as I thought. Master came on board last night without no one knowing nothing about it, and he might have brought the dog with him. If so be, he came to again. I won't believe that he's hauled together not to be made away with, for how come his eye out? Well, I don't care. I'm a good Christian, and may I be swamped if I don't try what he's made of yet. First times we cut up beef, I'll try and chop your tail, anyhow, that I will, if I am hung for it. Smallbones regained his determination. He set about laying the things for breakfast, and when they were ready, he went up to the quarter-deck, reporting the same to Mr. Van Slyperken, who had expected to see him frightened out of his wits, and concluding his speech by saying, If you please, sir, the dog be in the cabin, all right. I said as how I never killed your dog, nor buried him neither. The dog in the cabin? exclaimed Mr. Van Slyperken, 
with apparent astonishment. "'Why, how the devil could he have come there?' "'He comed off, I suppose, sir, same way as you did, without nobody knowing nothing about it,' drawled out Smallbones, who then walked away. In the meantime the corporal had been picked up, and the men were attempting to recover him. Smallbones went forward to see what had become of him, and learnt how it was that he was insensible. "'Well, then,' thought Smallbones, "'it may have been all the same with the dog, and I believe there's humbug in it, for if the dog had made his appearance, as the master pretends he did, all of a sudden, he'd have been more frightened than me.' So reasoned Smallbones, and he reasoned well. In the meantime the corporal opened his eyes and gradually returned to his senses, and then for the first time the ship's company, who were all down at their breakfast, demanded of Smallbones the reason of the corporal's conduct. "'Why,' replied Smallbones, "'because that ere beast, Snarleyow, be come back again, all alive, at her being dead and buried.' He's in the cabin now, that's all. That's all, exclaimed one. All, cried another. The devil, said a third. I said as how it would be, said Obadiah Cobble. That dog is no dog, sure as I sit here. The return of the dog certainly had a strong effect upon the whole of the ship's company. The corporal swore that he was not in the cabin and that Mr. Vanslyperken had arranged for his going on shore to look for him, when all of a sudden the dog made his appearance. No one knew how. Smallbones found himself so much in the minority that he said nothing. It was perfect heresy not to believe that the dog was sent from the lower regions, and as for any further attempts to destroy it, it was considered as perfect insanity. But this renewed attempt on the part of Smallbones, for Van Slyperken was convinced that an attempt had been made, although it had not been successful, again excited the feelings of Mr. Van Slyperken against the lad, and he resolved, somehow or another, to retaliate. His anger overcame his awe, and he was reckless in his desire of vengeance. There was not the least suspicion of treachery on the part of Corporal Van Spitter in the heart of Mr. Van Slyperken, and the corporal played his double part so well that, if possible, he was now higher in favor than ever. After a day or two, during which Mr. Van Slyperken remained on board, he sent for the corporal, determining to sound him as to whether he would make any attempts upon smallbones for to such a height had Van Slyperken's enmity arrived that he now resolved to part with some of his darling money to tempt the corporal, rather than not get rid of the lad. After many hints thrown out, but not taken by the wily corporal, who was resolved that Van Slyperken should speak plainly, the deed and the reward of ten guineas were openly proclaimed, and Van Slyperken waited for the corporal's reply. Mein Gott, mein Herr Van Slyperken, suppose it was possible, I not take your money, I do it with pleasure, but, sir, it is not possible. Not possible? exclaimed Van Slyperken. No, mein Herr, replied the corporal, I not tell you all, thousand tyfel, I not tell you all. And here the corporal put his hand to his forehead and was silent, much to Van Slyperken's amazement. But the fact was that Corporal Van Spitter was thinking what he possibly could say. At last a brilliant thought struck him. He narrated to the lieutenant how he had seen the ghost of Smallbones, as he thought, when he was floating about, adrift on the Zyder Z. Described with great force his horror at the time of the appearance of the supernatural object, and tailed on to what he believed to be true, that which he knew to be false, to wit, that the apparition had cried out to him that he was not to be hurt by mortal man. "'Got in himmel,' finished the corporal. "'I never was so frightened in my life. I see him now as plain as I see you, mynheer. 
twenty thousand tyfels but the voice was like de thunder and his eye like de lightning i fell back in one swoon ah my god my god so well did the corporal play his part that van slyperken became quite terrified the candle appeared to burn dim and he dared not move to snuff it he could not but credit the corporal for there was an earnestness of description and a vividness of colouring which could not have been invented besides was not the corporal his earnest and only friend corporal said vanslyperken perhaps you like a glass of sheetum there's sun in the cupboard this was very kind of mr vanslyperken but he wanted one himself much more than the corporal the corporal produced the bottle and the glass poured it out made his military salute and tossed it off give me another glass corporal said van slyperken in a tremulous tone the lieutenant took one two three glasses one after another to recover himself the corporal had really frightened him he was convinced that smallbones had a charmed life did he not float to the nab buoy and back again did not a pistol ball pass through him without injury van slyperken shuddered he took a fresh glass and then handed the bottle to the corporal who helped himself saluted and the liquor again disappeared in a moment dutch courage is proverbial although a libel upon one of the bravest of nations van slyperken now felt it and again he commenced with the corporal what were the words inquired he dat he was not to be hurt by mortal man mynheer i can take my bible oath of it replied the corporal damnation cried van slyperken but stop mortal man perhaps he may be hurt by a woman dat is quite another thing mynheer he shan't escape if i can help it retorted van slyperken i must think about it van slyperken poured out another glass of sheetum and pushed the stone bottle to the corporal who helped himself without ceremony mr van slyperken was now about two-thirds drunk for he was not used to such a quantity of spirits now if i had only been friends with that that hellfire moggy salisbury thought van slyperken speaking aloud to himself mein gott yes mynheer replied the corporal van slyperken took another glass spilling a great deal on the table as he poured it out he then covered his eyes with his hand as if in thought whereupon the corporal filled without being asked and as he perceived that his superior remained in the same position and did not observe him he helped himself to a second glass and then waited till van slyperken should speak again but the liquor had overpowered him and he spoke no more the corporal after a few minutes went up to his superior he touched him on the shoulder saying mynheer but he obtained no reply on the contrary the slight touch made mr van slyperken fall forward on the table he was quite insensible so the corporal took him up in his arms laid him in his bed then taking possession of the lieutenant's chair for he was tired of standing so long he set to work to empty the bottle which being large and full at the time that it was produced from the cupboard took some time and before it was accomplished the corporal van spitter had fallen fast asleep in the chair shortly afterwards the candle burnt out and the cabin was in darkness it was about three o'clock in the morning when mr van slyperken began to recover his senses and as his recollection returned so were his ears met with a stupendous roaring and unusual noise it was to his imagination unearthly for he had been troubled with wild dreams about smallbones and his appearance to the corporal it sounded like thunder and mr van slyperken thought that he could plainly make out mortal man mortal man 
and at times the other words of the supernatural intimation to the corporal. The mortal man was drawn out in lengthened cadence, and in a manner truly horrible. Van Slyperken called out. Mortal man, was the reply. Again Van Slyperken almost shrieked in a perspiration of fear. The sound now ceased, but it was followed up by a noise like the rattling of glasses tumbling about of the chairs and table, and Van Slyperken buried his face under the clothes. Then the door, which had been shut, was heard by him to slam like thunder, and then Snarleyow barked loud and deep. "'Oh, God, forgive me!' cried the terrified lieutenant. "'Our Father, which art in heaven, save me! Save me!' Shortly afterwards the corporal made his appearance with a light, and inquired if Mr. Van Slyperken had called. He found him reeking with perspiration and half dead with fear. In broken words he stated how he had been visited, and how the same intimation that no mortal man could hurt small bones had been wrung into his ears. "'It was only one dream, mynheer Van Slyperken,' observed the corporal. "'No, it was no dream,' replied Van Slyperken. "'Stay in the cabin, good corporal.' "'Yes, mynheer,' replied the corporal, drawing the curtains of the bed, and then quietly picking up the various articles on the floor, the table and chairs which had been overturned. Alas, fear is the mate of guilt. All this horrid visitation was simply that Mr. Van Slyperken had heard the corporal's tremendous snoring as he slept in the chair, and which his imagination had turned into the words, Mortal man! The first exclamation of Mr. Van Slyperken had awoke the corporal, who, aware of the impropriety of his situation, had attempted to retreat. In so doing he had overturned the table and chairs, with the bottle and glasses upon them. Fearful of discovery upon this unexpected noise, he had hastened out of the cabin, slammed the door, and waked up Snarleyow but he knew from the exclamations of Van Slyperken that the lieutenant was frightened out of his wits, so he very boldly returned with a candle to ascertain the result of the disturbance, and was delighted to find that the lieutenant was still under the delusion. So soon as he had replaced everything, the corporal took a chair, and finding that he had fortunately put the cork into the stone bottle before he fell asleep, and that there were still one or two glasses in it, he drank them off, and waited patiently for daylight. By this time Van Slyperken was again asleep and snoring, so the corporal took away all the broken fragments, put the things in order, and left the cabin. When Van Slyperken awoke and rang his bell, Smallbones entered. Van Slyperken got up, and finding the cabin as it was left the night before, was more than ever persuaded that he had been supernaturally visited. Fear made him quite civil to the lad, whose life he now considered, as the ship's company did that of the dog. It was quite useless for him at least to attempt. And thus ends this chapter of horrors. End of chapter 32 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter Thirty Three of Snarleyow by Frederick Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In which there is nothing very particular or very interesting. We must now change the scene for a short time and introduce to our readers a company assembled in the best inn which, at that time, was to be found in the town of Cherbourg. The room in which they were assembled was large in dimensions, but with a low ceiling. The windows were diminutive, and gave but a subdued light, on account of the vicinity of the houses opposite. The window frames were small and cut diamond-wise, 
and in the center of each of the panes was a round of coarsely painted glass. A narrow table ran nearly the length of the room, and at each end of it there was a large chimney, in both of which logs of wood were burning cheerfully. What are now termed chaise longs were drawn to the sides of the table, or leaning against the walls of the room, which were without ornament, and neatly colored with yellow ochre. The company assembled might have been about thirty in number, of whom half a dozen, perhaps, were in the ecclesiastical dress of the time, while the others wore the habiliments then appropriated to cavaliers, or gentlemen, with very little difference from those as worn in the times of the Charleses in England, except that the cloak had been discarded, and the more substantial roquelure substituted in its place. Most of the party were men, who had not yet arrived to middle age, if we accept the clericals, who were much more advanced in life, and any one who had ever fallen in with the smuggling lugger and its crew would have had no difficulty in recognizing many of them in the well-attired and evidently high-born and well-educated young men who were seated or standing in the room. Among them Sir Robert Barclay was eminently conspicuous. He was standing by the fire conversing with two of the ecclesiastics. Gentlemen, said he at last, our worthy father Lovell has just arrived from St. Germain, and, as the most rapid communication is now necessary, he is empowered to open here and before us every dispatch which we bring over, before it is transmitted to headquarters, with permission to act as may seem best to the friends of his majesty here assembled. The fact was that King James had lately completely given himself up to religious exercises and mortification, and any communication to him was attended with so much delay that it had been considered advisable to act without consulting him, and to avoid the delay consequent on the transmission of communications to Paris, the most active parties had determined that they would, for the present, take up their residence at Cherbourg, and merely transmit to their friends at St. Germain an account of their proceedings, gaining at least a week by this arrangement. The party assembled had many names of some note. Among the ecclesiastics were Lovell, Collier, Snat, and Cook. Among the cavaliers were those of Musgrave, Friend, and Perkins, whose relatives had suffered in the cause. Smith, Clancy, Herbert, Cunningham, Leslie, and many others. When Sir Robert Barclay approached the table, the others took their seats in silence. "'Gentlemen,' said Sir Robert, laying down the dispatches, which had been opened, "'you must be aware that our affairs now wear a very prosperous appearance. Supported as we are by many in the government of England, and by more in the House of Commons, with so many adherents here to our cause, we have every rational prospect of success. During the first three months of this year much has been done, and at the same time it must be confessed that the usurper and the heretics have taken every step in their power to assail and to crush us. By this dispatch, now in my hand, it appears that a bill has passed the commons, by which it is enacted that, no person born after the twenty-fifth March next, being a papist, shall be capable of inheriting any title of honor or estate within the kingdom of England, dominion of Wales, or town of Berwick-on-the-Tweed. Here some of the ecclesiastics lifted up their eyes, others struck their clenched hands on the table, and the cavaliers, as if simultaneously, made the room ring by seizing hold of the handles of their swords. And further, gentlemen, that no papist shall be capable of purchasing any lands, tenements, or hereditaments, either in his own name or in the name of any other person in trust for him. The reader must be reminded that in those days there was no Times or Morning Herald laid upon the breakfast table with the debates of the house, that communication was anything but rapid, there being no regular post, 
so that what had taken place two months back was very often news. It appears then, gentlemen, that our only chance is to win our properties with our own good swords. We will, was the unanimous reply of the laity present. In Scotland our adherents increase daily. The interests of so many have been betrayed by the usurper that thousands of swords will start from their scabbards so soon as we can support the cause with the promised assistance of the court of Versailles and we have here intelligence that the parliament are in a state of actual hostility to the usurper and that the national ferment is so great as to be almost on the verge of rebellion i have also gained from a private communication from our friend ramsay who is now at amsterdam and in a position to be most useful to us that the usurper has intimated to his own countrymen although it is not yet known in england that he will return to the hague in july such gentlemen is the intelligence i have to impart as respects our own prospects in our own country to which i have to add that the secret partition treaty which is inimical to the interests of the french king has been signed both in london and the hague as well as by the french envoy there a more favorable occurrence for us perhaps never occurred as it will only increase the already well-known ill-will of his catholic majesty against the usurper of his own father-in-law's crown i have now gentlemen laid before you our present position and further prospects and as we are met to consult upon the propriety of further measures i shall be most happy to hear the suggestions of others sir robert barclay then sat down lovell the jesuit first rose i have said he no opinion to offer relative to warlike arrangements those not being suitable to my profession i leave them to men like sir robert whose swords are always ready and whose talents are so well able to direct their swords still it is well known that the sources of war must be obtained if war is to be carried on and i have great pleasure in announcing to those assembled that from our friends in england i have received advice of the two several sums of ninety three thousand pounds and twenty nine thousand pounds sterling money having been actually collected and now held in trust for the support of the good cause and further that the collections are still going on with rapidity and success from his most catholic majesty we have received an order upon the minister for the sum of four thousand louis which has been duly honoured and from our blessed father the pope an order for five hundred thousand paoles amounting to about thirteen thousand pounds in sterling money together with an entire absolution for all sins already committed and about to be committed and a secure promise of paradise to those who fall in the maintenance of the true faith and the legitimate king i have further great expectations from ireland and many promises from other quarters in support of the cause which with the blessing of god i trust will yet triumph as soon as lovell sat down collier the ecclesiastic rose that we shall find plenty of willing swords and a sufficient supply of money for our purposes there can be no doubt but i wish to propose one question to the company here assembled it is an undoubted article of the true faith that we are bound to uphold it by any and by every means all human attempts are justifiable in the service of god many have already been made to get rid of the usurper but they have not been crowned with success as we too well know and the blood of our friends many of whom were not accessories to the act has been lavishly spilt by the insatiate heretic but they have before this received immortal crowns in suffering as martyrs in the cause of religion and justice i still hold that our attempts to cut off the usurper should be continued some hand more fortunate may succeed but not only is his life to be taken, if possible, but the succession must be cut off root and branch. 
you all know that of the many children born to the heretic william all but one have been taken away from him in judgment for his manifold crimes one only remains the present duke of gloucester and i do consider that this branch of heresy should be removed even in preference to his parent whose conduct is such as to assist our cause and whose death may weaken the animosity of his catholic majesty whose hostility is well known to be personal i have neither men nor money to offer you but i have means i trust soon to accomplish this point and i dedicate my useless life to the attempt it would occupy too much of our pages if we were to narrate all that was said and done at this conference which we have been obliged to report as intimately connected with our history many others addressed the meeting proposals were made rejected and acceded to lists of adherents were produced and of those who might be gained over resolutions were entered into and recorded and questions debated before the breaking up the accounts of the sums expended and the money still on hand were brought forward and in the former items the name of van slyperken appeared rather prominent as soon as the accounts were audited the conference broke up we have said that among those who were at the conference might be observed some persons who might be recognized as part of the crew of the lugger such was the case sir robert barclay and many others were men of good family and stout jacobites these young men served in the boat with the other men who were no more than common seamen but this was considered necessary in those times of treachery the lugger pulled eighteen oars was clinker built and very swift even with a full cargo the after oars were pulled by the adherents of sir robert and the arm chest was stowed in the stern sheets so that these young men being always armed no attempt to betray them or to rise against them on the part of the smugglers had they been so inclined could have succeeded ramsay's trust as steersman had been appropriated to jemmy salisbury but no other alteration had taken place we have entered into this detail to prove the activity of the jacobite party about an hour after the conference sir robert and his cavaliers had resumed their seamen's attire for they were to go over that night and two hours before dusk those who had been at a conference in which the fate of kingdoms and crowned heads was at stake were to be seen laboring at the oar in company with common seamen and urging the fast boat through the yielding waters towards her haven at the cove End of chapter 33 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 34 of Snarleyow by Frederick Marriott This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Besides Other Matter Containing an Argument we left Ramsay domiciliated in the house of the syndic Van Kraus, on excellent terms with his host, who looked upon him as the mirror of information, and not a little in the good graces of the syndic's daughter, Wilhelmina. There could not be a more favorable opportunity, perhaps, for a handsome and well-informed young man to prosecute his addresses, and to gain the affections of the latter were he so inclined. Wilhelmina had been brought up in every luxury, but isolated from the world. She was now just at the age at which it was her father's intention to introduce her, but, romantic in her disposition, she cared little for the formal introduction which it was intended should take place. Neither had she seen, in any of the young Dutch aristocracy, most of whom were well known to her by sight, as pointed out to her by her father when riding with him, that form and personal appearance which her mind's eye had embodied in her visions of her future lover. Her mind was naturally refined, and she looked for that elegance and grace of deportment which she sought for in vain among her countrymen, 
but which had suddenly been presented to her in the person of Edward Ramsay. In the few meetings of her father's friends at their house, the conversation was uninteresting, if not disgusting, for it was about goods and merchandise, money and speculation, occasionally interrupted by politics, which were to her as of little interest. How different were the demeanor, the address, and the conversation of the young Englishman, who had been bred in courts, and at the same time had traveled much. There was an interest in all he said, so much information blended with novelty and amusement, so much wit and pleasantry crowning all, that Wilhelmina was fascinated without her being aware of it and before the terms of intimacy had warranted her receiving his hand on meeting, she had already unconsciously given her heart. The opportunities arising from her father's close attention to his commercial affairs, and the mutual attraction which brought them together during the major part of the day, she anxious to be amused, and he attracted by her youth and beauty, were taken advantage of by them both and the consequence was that before ten days they were inseparable. The syndic either did not perceive the danger to which his child was exposed, provided that there was any objection to the intimacy, or else, equally pleased with Ramsay, he had no objection to matters taking their course. As for Ramsay, that he had at first cultivated the intimacy with Wilhelmina more perhaps from distraction than with any definite purpose is certain, but he soon found that her attractions were too great to permit him to continue it if he had not serious intentions. When he had entered his own room, before he had been a week in the house, he had taxed himself severely as to the nature of his feelings and he was then convinced that he must avoid her company, which was impossible if he remained in the house, or, as a man of honor, make a timely retreat. For Ramsay was too honorable to trifle with the feelings of an innocent girl. Having well weighed this point, he then calculated the probability of his being discovered, and the propriety of his continuing his attentions to the daughter of one whom he was deceiving and whose political opinions were at such variance with his own. But this was a point on which he could come to no decision. His duty to the cause he supported would not allow him to quit the house. To remain in the house without falling in love was impossible. Why should his political opinions ever be known? And why should not Wilhelmina be of the same opinion as he was? And why... Ramsay fell asleep, putting these questions to himself, and the next morning he resolved that things should take their chance. It was about a fortnight since the cutter had left for England. Ramsay was rather impatient for intelligence, but the cutter had not yet returned. Breakfast had been over some time, Mynheer van Kraus had descended to his warehouses, and Ramsay and Wilhelmina were sitting together upon one of the sofas in the saloon, both reclining and free from that restraint of which nothing but extreme intimacy will divest you. And so, my Wilhelmina, said Ramsay, taking up her hand which lay listless at her side, and playing with her taper fingers, you really think William of Nassau is a good man? And do not you, Ramsay? replied Wilhelmina, surprised. However, I may rejoice at his being on the throne of England. I doubt whether I can justify his conduct to the unfortunate King James in leaguing against his own father-in-law and dispossessing him of his kingdom. Suppose now, Wilhelmina, that any fortunate man should become one day your husband. What a cruel, what a diabolical conduct it would be on his part at least so it appears to me, if in return for your father putting him in possession of perhaps his greatest treasure on earth, he were to seize upon all your father's property, and leave him a beggar, because other people were to invite him to do so. I never heard it placed in that light before, Ramsay. 
that the alliance between King William and his father-in-law should have made him very scrupulous, I grant. But when the happiness of a nation depended upon it, ought not a person in William's situation to waive all minor considerations? The happiness of a nation, Wilhelmina? In what way would you prove that so much was at stake? Was not the Protestant religion at stake? Is not King James a bigoted Catholic? I grant that, and therefore ought not to reign over a Protestant nation. But if you imagine that the happiness of any nation depends upon his religion, I am afraid you are deceived. Religion has been made the excuse for interfering with the happiness of a nation whenever no better excuse could be brought forward. But depend upon it, the mass of the people will never quarrel about religion if they are left alone and their interests not interfered with. Had King James not committed himself in other points, he might have worshipped his creator in any form he thought proper. That a Protestant king was all that was necessary to quiet the nation is fully disproved by the present state of the country, now that the scepter has been for some years swayed by King William, it being at this moment in a state very nearly approaching to rebellion. But is not that occasioned by the machinations of the Jacobite party, who are promoting dissension in every quarter? replied Wilhelmina. I grant that they are not idle, replied Ramsay, but observe the state of bitter variance between William and the House of Commons, which represents the people of England. What can religion have to do with that? No, Wilhelmina, although in this country there are few who do not rejoice at their king being called to the throne of England, there are many, and those the most wise, in that country, who lament it quite as much. But why so? Because mankind are governed by interest, and patriotism is little more than a cloak. The benefits to this country, by the alliance with England, are very great, especially in a commercial point of view, and therefore you will find no want of patriots. But to England the case is different. It is not her interest to be involved and mixed up in continental wars and dissensions, which must now inevitably be the case. Depend upon it that posterity will find that England will have paid very dear for a Protestant king. Religion is what every one is willing to admit the propriety and necessity of, until they are taxed to pay for it, and then it is astonishing how very indifferent, if not disgusted, they become to it. Why, Ramsay! One would never imagine you to be such a warm partisan of the present government, as I believe you really are, to hear you talk this morning, replied Wilhelmina. My public conduct, as belonging to a party, does not prevent my having my private opinions. To my party I am, and ever will be, steadfast, but knowing the world and the secret springs of most people's actions, as I do, you must not be surprised at my being so candid with you, Wilhelmina. Our conversation, I believe, commenced upon the character of King William, and I will confess to you that, estimating the two characters in moral worth, I would infinitely prefer being the exiled and Catholic James than the unnatural and crowned King William. You will say next that you would just as soon be a Catholic as a Protestant and if I had been brought up in the tenets of the one instead of the other, what difference would it have made, except that I should have adhered to the creed of my forefathers, and have worshipped the Almighty after their fashion, form, and ceremonies? Are not all religions good if they be sincere? Do not they all tend to the same object, and have the same goal in view, that of gaining heaven? Would you not prefer a good, honest, conscientious man, were he a Catholic, to a mean, intriguing, and unworthy person, who professed himself a Protestant? Most certainly, but I should prefer to the just Catholic a man who was a just Protestant. That is but natural, but recollect, Wilhelmina, you have seen and heard as yet but one side of the question. 
and if I speak freely to you, it is only to give you the advantage of my experience from having mixed with the world. I am true to my party, and as a man I must belong to a party, or I become a non-entity. But were I in a condition so unshackled that I might take up or lay down my opinions as I pleased, without loss of character, as a woman may, for instance, so little do I care for party, so well balanced do I know the right and the wrong to be on both sides, that I would, to please one I loved, at once yield up my opinions, to agree with her, if she would not yield up hers to agree with mine. Then you think a woman might do so. That is no compliment to the sex, Ramsay, for it is as much as to assert that we have not only no weight or influence in the world, but also that we have no character or stability. Far from it. I only mean to say that women do not generally enter sufficiently into politics to care much for them. They generally imbibe the politics of those they live with, without further examination, and that it is no disgrace to them if they change them. Besides, there is one feeling in women so powerful as to conquer all others, and when once that enters the breast, the remainder are absorbed or become obedient to it. And that feeling is? Love, Wilhelmina, and if a woman happens to have been brought up in one way of thinking by her parents, when she transfers her affections to her husband, should his politics be adverse, she will soon come round to his opinion, if she really loves him. I am not quite so sure of that, Ramsay. I am quite sure she ought. Politics and party are ever a subject of dispute, and therefore should be avoided by a wife. Besides, if a woman selects one as her husband, her guide and counsellor through life, one whom she swears to love, honour, cherish, and obey, she gives but a poor proof of it if she does not yield up her judgment in all matters more peculiarly his province. You really put things in such a new light, Ramsay, that I hardly know how to answer you, even when I am not convinced. Because you have not had sufficient time for reflection, Wilhelmina, but weigh well and dwell upon what I have said, and then you will either acknowledge that I am right, or find arguments to prove that I am wrong. But you promised me some singing. Let me lead you into the music room." We have introduced this conversation between Wilhelmina and Ramsay to show not only what influence he had already gained over the artless yet intelligent girl, but also the way by which he considerately prepared her for the acknowledgment which he resolved to make to her on some future opportunity. For although Ramsay cared little for deceiving the father, he would not have married the daughter without her being fully aware of who he was. These conversations were constantly renewed, as if accidentally, by Ramsay, and long before he had talked in direct terms of love, he had fully prepared her for it, so that he felt she would not receive a very severe shock when he threw off the mask, even when she discovered that he was a Catholic, and opposed to her father in religion as well as in politics. The fact was that Ramsay, at first, was as much attracted by her wealth as by her personal charms. But like many other men, as his love increased, so did he gradually become indifferent to her wealth, and he was determined to win her for his wife in spite of all obstacles, and even, if he were obliged, to secure her hand by carrying her off without the paternal consent. Had it been requisite, it is not certain whether Ramsay might not have been persuaded to have abandoned his party, so infatuated had he at last become with a really fascinating Wilhelmina. But Ramsay was interrupted in the middle of one of his most favorite songs by old Coops, who informed him that the lieutenant of the cutter was waiting for him in his room. Apologizing for the necessary absence, Ramsay quitted the music-room and hastened to meet Van Slyperken. 
Mr. Vanslyperken had received his orders to return to The Hague a few days after the fright he had received from the nasal organ of the corporal. In pursuance of his instructions from Ramsay, he had not failed to open all the government dispatches and extract their contents. He had also brought over letters from Ramsay's adherents. "'You are sure these extracts are quite correct?' said Ramsay, after he had read them over. "'Quite so, sir,' replied Vanslyperken. "'And you have been careful to seal the letters again, so as to avoid suspicion?' "'Does not my life depend upon it, Mr. Ramsay?' "'Very true, and also upon your fidelity to us. "'Here's your money. "'Let me know when you sail, and come for orders.' Vanslyperken then took his bag of money, made his bow, and departed, and Ramsay commenced reading over the letters received from his friends. Mynheer Van Krause observed Vanslyperken as he was leaving the house, and immediately hastened to Ramsay's room to inquire the news. A portion of the contents of the dispatches was made known to him, and the syndic was very soon afterwards seen to walk out, leaving his people to mark and tally the bales which were hoisting out from a vessel in the canal. The fact was that Mynheer Van Kraus was so anxious to get rid of his secret that he could not contain himself any longer, and had set off to communicate to one of the authorities what he had obtained. "'But from whence did you receive this intelligence, Mynheer Kraus?' demanded the other. The dispatches have not yet been opened. We are waiting for Mynheer Van Wezen. I suppose we shall learn something there. You knew all before we did, when the cutter arrived last time. You must have some important friends at the English court, Mynheer Van Kraus. Here Mynheer Kraus nodded his head, and looked very knowing, and shortly afterwards took his leave. But this particular friend of Mynheer Kraus was also his particular enemy. Kraus had lately imparted secrets which were supposed to be known and entrusted to none but those in the entire confidence of the government. How could he have obtained them, unless by the treachery of someone at home? And why should Mynheer Kraus, who was not trusted by the government there, notwithstanding his high civil office, because he was known to be unsafe, be trusted by some one at home, unless it were for treacherous purposes. So argued Mr. Krause's most particular friend, who thought it proper to make known his opinions on the subject, and to submit to the other authorities whether this was not a fair subject for representation in their next dispatches to England. And in consequence of his suggestion, the representation was duly made. Mynheer Kraus was not the first person whose tongue had got him into difficulties. So soon as Van Slyperken had delivered his dispatches to Ramsay, he proceeded to the widow Vandersloosh, when, as usual, he was received with every apparent mark of cordial welcome, was again installed on the little sofa, and again drank the beer of the widow's own brewing, and was permitted to take her fat hand. Babette inquired after the corporal, and when rallied by the lieutenant, appeared to blush, and turned her head away. The widow also assisted in the play, and declared that it should be a match, and that Babette and herself should be married on the same day. As the evening drew nigh, Van Slyperken took his leave, and went on board, giving permission to the corporal to go on shore, and very soon the corporal was installed in his place. This is a sad world of treachery and deceit. End of chapter 34 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 35 of Snarleyow by Frederick Marriott This LibriVox recording is in the public domain in which the agency of a red herring is again introduced into our wonderful history. We are somewhat inclined to moralize. We did not intend to write this day. On the contrary, 
we had arranged for a party of pleasure and relaxation, in which the heels and every other portion of the body upwards, except the brain, were to be employed, and that was to have a respite. The morning was fair, and we promised ourselves amusement, but we were deceived, and we returned to our task, as the rain poured down in torrents, washing the dirty face of Mother Earth. Yes, deceived, and here we cannot help observing that this history of ours is a very true picture of human life. For what a complication of treachery does it not involve? Smallbones is deceiving his master, Mr. Van Slyperken. The corporal is deceiving Mr. Van Slyperken. The widow is deceiving Mr. Van Slyperken. So is Babette, and the whole crew of the Jungfrau. Ramsay is deceiving his host and his mistress. All the Jacobites, in a mass, are plotting against and deceiving the government. And, as for Mr. Van Slyperken, as it will soon appear, he is deceiving everybody, and will ultimately deceive himself. The only honest party in the whole history is the one most hated, as generally is the case in this world. I mean Snarleyow. There is no deceit about him, and therefore, par excellence, he is fairly entitled to be the hero of, and to give his name to, the work. The next most honest party in the book is Wilhelmina. All the other women, except little Lily, are cheats and impostors, and Lily is too young. Our readers may, therefore, be pleased to consider Snarleyow and Wilhelmina as the hero and the heroine of the tale. And then it will have one curious feature in it. The principles will not only be united, but the tale will wind up without their ever seeing each other. Allons en avant! But of all the treachery practiced by all the parties, it certainly appears to us that the treachery of the widow was the most odious and diabolical. She was like a bloated spider, slowly entwining those threads for her victim which were to entrap him to his destruction, for she had vowed that she never would again be led to the hymeneal altar until Mr. Van Slyperken was hanged. Perhaps the widow van der Sloosh was in a hurry to be married, at least by her activity it would so appear, but let us not anticipate. The little sofa was fortunately, like its build, strong as a cob, or it never could have borne the weight of two such lovers as the widow van der Sloosh and the corporal van Spitter. There they sat, she radiant with love and beer, he with ditto. Their sides met, for the sofa exactly took them both in without an inch to spare. Their hands met, their eyes met, and whenever one raised the glass, the other was on the alert, and their glasses met and jingled. A more practical specimen of hob and knob was never witnessed. There was but one thing wanting to complete their happiness, which, unlike other people's, did not hang upon a thread, but something much stronger. It hung upon a cord the cord which was to hang Mr. Van Slyperken. And now the widow, like the three fates rolled into one, is weaving the woof, and, in good Dutch, is pouring into the attentive ear of the corporal her hopes and fears, her surmises, her wishes, her anticipations, and her desires, and he imbibes them all greedily, washing them down with the beer of the widow's own brewing. He has not been to the house opposite these two last arrivals, said the widow. That is certain, for Babette and I have been on the watch. There was hanging matter there. Now I won't believe but that he must go somewhere. He carries his letters and takes his gold, as before. Depend upon it. Yes, and I will find it out. Yes, yes, Mr. Vanslyperken. We will see who is the cutest. You or the widow Vandersloosh? Mein Gott, yes, replied the corporal. 
now he landed a passenger last time whom he called the king's messenger and i am as sure as i sit here that he was no king's messenger unless he was one of king james as was for look you corporal van spitter do you suppose that king william would employ an englishman as you say he was for a messenger when a dutchman was to be had for lover money no no we must find out where he goes to i will have some one on the lookout when you come again and then set babette on the watch she shall track him up to the den of his treachery yes yes mr vanslyperken we will see who gains the day you are the widow vandersloosh mein gott yes replied the corporal and now corporal i've been thinking over all this ever since your absence and all you have told me about his cowardly attempts upon that poor boy's life and his still greater cowardice in believing such stuff as you have made him believe about the lad not being injured by mortal man stuff and nonsense the lad is but a lad mein god yes said the corporal and now corporal i'll tell you something else which is that you and the jungfraus are just as great fools as mine here van slyperken in believing all that stuff and nonsense about the dog the dog is but a dog this was rather a trial to the corporal's politeness to deny what the widow said might displease and as he firmly believed otherwise he was put to a nonplus but the widow looked him full in the face expecting assent so at last the corporal drawled out my god yes a tog is but a tog the widow was satisfied and not perceiving the nice distinction continued well then corporal as a lad is but a lad and a dog is but a dog i have been setting my wits to work about getting the rascally traitor in my power i mean to pretend to take every interest in him and to get all his secrets and then when he tells me that smallbones cannot be hurt by mortal man i shall say he can by woman at all events and then i shall make a proposition which he'll accept fast enough and then i'll have more hanging matter for him besides getting rid of the cur yes yes mr vanslyperken match a woman if you can we'll see if your dog is to take possession of my bedroom again my god yes replied the corporal again and now i'll tell you what i'll do mr corporal i will prepare it myself and then mr vanslyperken shall have it grilled for his breakfast and then he shall not eat it but leave it for smallbones and then smallbones shall pretend to eat it but put it in his pocket and then for it won't do to do it on board or he'll find out that the lad has given it to the dog he shall bring it on shore and give it to the dog here in the yard so that he shall kill the dog himself by wishing to kill others do you understand corporal mein gott yes i understand what you say but what is it that you are to prepare what why a red herring to be sure but how will a red herring kill a boy or a dog lord corporal how stupid you are i'm to put arsenic in yes but you left that out till now did i well that was an oversight but now corporal you understand it all my god yes but if the lad does not die what will he think think that he can take poison like pea soup without injury and that neither man nor woman can take his life be afraid of the lad and leave him alone my god yes replied the rather obtuse corporal who now understood the whole plot such was the snare laid for mr vanslyperken by the treacherous widow and before the cutter sailed it was put in execution she received the lieutenant now as an accepted lover allowed him to talk of the day wormed out of him all his secrets except that of his treason abused smallbones and acknowledged that she had been too hasty about the dog which she would be very happy to see on shore vanslyperken could hardly believe his senses 
The widow forgives, Snorleo, and all for his sake? He was delighted, enchanted, threw himself at her feet, and vowed eternal gratitude with his lips, but vengeance in his heart. Oh, Mr. Vanslyperken, you deserve to be deceived. The dislike expressed by the widow against Smallbones was also very agreeable to the lieutenant, and he made her his confidant, stating what the corporal had told him relative to the appearance of Smallbones when he was adrift. "'Well, then, lieutenant,' said the widow, "'if mortal man can't hurt him, mortal woman may. "'And for my love of you, I will prepare what will rid you of him. "'But, Van Slyperken, recollect there's nothing I would not do for you. "'But if it were found out, oh, dear, oh, dear!' The widow then informed him that she would prepare a red herring with arsenic, which he should take on board, and order Smallbones to grill for his breakfast, that he was to pretend not to be well, and to allow it to be taken away by the lad, who would, of course, eat it fast enough. "'Excellent!' replied Van Slyperken, who felt not only that he should get rid of Smallbones, but have the widow in his power." "'Dearest widow, how can I be sufficiently grateful? "'Oh, how kind, how amiable you are,' continued Vanslyperken, "'mumbling her fat fingers, which the widow abandoned to him without reserve. "'Who would have believed that, between these two, there existed a deadly hatred? "'We might imagine such a thing to take place in the refinement and artificial air of a court.' but not in a Dutch Lusthaus in Amsterdam. That evening, before his departure, did the widow present her swain with a fatal herring, and the swain received it with as many marks of gratitude and respect as some knight in ancient times would have shown when presented with some magical gift by his favoring genius. The red herring itself was but a red herring, but the charm consisted in the two pennyworth of arsenic. The next morning Vanslyperken did not fail to order the red herring for his breakfast, but took good care not to eat it. Smallbones, who had been duly apprised of the whole plan, asked his master, as he cleared away, whether he should keep the red herring for the next day. But Mr. Vanslyperken very graciously informed him that he might eat it himself. About an hour afterwards Mr. Van Slyperken went on shore, taking with him for the first time Snarleyow, and desiring Smallbones to come with him with a bag of biscuit for the widow. This plan had been proposed by the widow, as Smallbones might be supposed to have eaten something on shore. Smallbones took as good care as his master not to eat the herring, but put it in his pocket as a bon bouche for Snarleyow. Mr. Van Slyperken, as they pulled on shore, thought that the lad smelt very strong of herring, and this satisfied him that he had eaten it. But to make more sure, he exclaimed, "'Confound it! How you smell of red herring!' "'That's all along of having eaten one, sir,' replied Smallbones, grinning. "'You'll grin in another way before an hour is over,' thought his master." The lieutenant, the dog, and the biscuit were all graciously received. "'Has he eaten it?' inquired the widow. "'Yes,' replied Van Slyperken, with a nod. "'Empty the bag, and I will send him on board again.' "'Not yet. Give him half an hour to saunter. It will be better. That poor dog of yours must want a little grass,' said the widow. "'Always being on board. Let him run a little in the yard.' He will find plenty there. The obedient lieutenant opened the back door, and Snarleyow, who had not forgotten either the widow or Babette, went out of his own accord. Mr. Van Slyperken looked to ascertain if the yard door, which led to the street, was fast, and then returned, shutting the back door after him. Smallbones was waiting at the porch as usual. Babette! cried the widow. Mind you, don't open the yard door and let Mr. Van Slyperken's dog out. Do you hear? 
Smallbones, who understood this as the signal, immediately slipped round, opened the yard door, took the herring out of his pocket, and threw it to Snarleyow. The dog came to it, smelt it, seized it, and walked off, with his ears and tail up, to the sunny side of the yard, intending to have a good meal. And Smallbones, who was afraid of Mr. Van Slyperken catching him in the act, came out of the yard and hastened to his former post at the porch. He caught Babette's eye coming downstairs and winked and smiled. Babette walked into the room, caught the eye of the mistress, and winked and smiled, upon which the widow ordered Babette to empty the bread bag and give it to Smallbones to take on board, an order repeated by Van Slyperken. Before he returned to the boat, Smallbones again passed round to the yard door. Snarleyow was there, but no signs of the red herring. "'He's a-eatin' it all by gum,' said Smallbones, grinning, and walking away to the boat, with the bread-bag over his shoulder. As soon as he had arrived on board, the lad communicated the fact to the crew of the Jungfrau, whose spirits were raised by the intelligence, with the exception still of old Cobble, who shook his head, and declared, "'It was a tuppence and a red herring thrown away.' Mr. Vanslyperken returned on board in the afternoon, fully expecting to hear of Smallbones being very ill. He was surprised that the men in the boat did not tell him, and he asked them, carelessly, if there was anything new on board, but received a reply in the negative. When he came on board, followed by Snarleyow, the eyes of the crew were directed towards the dog to see how he looked but he appeared just as lively and as cross-grained as ever, and they all shook their heads. Van Slyperken sent for Smallbones, and looked him hard in the face. "'Aren't you well?' inquired he. "'Well, sir,' replied Smallbones, "'I had a bit of a twinge in my stomach this morning, but it's all gone off now.' Mr. Van Slyperken waited the whole day for Smallbones to die, but he did not. The crew of the vessel waited the whole day for the cur to die, but he did not. What inference could be drawn? The crew made up their minds that the dog was supernatural, and old Cobble told them that he told them so. Mr. Van Slyperken made up his mind that Smallbones was supernatural, and the corporal shook his head and told him that he told him so. The reason why Snarleyow did not die was simply this, that he did not eat the red herring. He had just laid it between his paws and was about to commence, when, Smallbones having left the yard door open in his hurry, the dog was perceived by a dog bigger than he, who happened to pass that way, and who pounced upon Snarleyow, trampling him over and over, and walked off with the red herring which he had better have left alone, as he was found dead the next morning. The widow heard, both from the corporal and Van Slyperken, the failure of both their projects. That Smallbones was not poisoned she was not surprised to hear, but she took care to agree with Van Slyperken that all attempts upon him were useless, but that the dog still lived was indeed a matter of surprise and the widow became a convert to the corporal's opinion that the dog was not to be destroyed. A whole two penny worth of arsenic! Babette, only think what a cur it must be! And Babette, as well as her mistress, lifted up her hands in amazement, exclaiming, What a cur indeed! End of chapter 35 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter thirty six of Snarleyow by Frederick Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In which Mr. Van Slyperken, although at fault, comes in for the brush. Van Slyperken, having obtained his dispatches from the States General, called at the house of Mynheer Kraus and received the letters of Ramsay 
Then, once more, the cutter's head was turned towards England. It may be as well to remind the reader that it was in the month of January, 1699, that we first introduced Mr. Van Slyperken and his contemporaries to his notice, and that all the important events which we have recorded have taken place between that date and the month of May, which is now arrived. We think, indeed, that the peculiar merit of this work is its remarkable unity of time and place, for, be it observed, we intend to finish it long before the year is out, and our whole scene is, it may be said, laid in the channel, or between the channel and the texel, which, considering it is an historical novel, is remarkable. Examine other productions of this nature, founded upon historical facts like our own, and observe the difference. Read Scott, Bulwer, James, or Grattan, read their historical novels, and observe how they fly about from country to country, and from clime to clime. As the Scythians said to Alexander, their right arm extends to the east, and their left to the west, and the world can hardly contain them. And over how many years do they extend their pages, while our bantling is produced in the regular nine months, being the exact period of time which is required for my book. It must therefore be allowed that in unity of time and place and design and adherence to facts, our historical novel is unique. We said that it was the month of May, not May coming in as she does sometimes in her caprice, pouting and out of humor, but May all in smiles. The weather was warm, and the sea was smooth, and the men of the cutter had stowed away their pea-jackets, and had pulled off their fishermen's boots, and had substituted shoes. Mr. Van Slyperken did not often appear on deck during the passage. He was very busy down below, and spread a piece of bunting across the skylight, so that no one could look down and see what he was about, and the cabin door was almost always locked. What could Mr. Van Slyperken be about? No one knew but Snarleyow, and Snarleyow could not or would not tell. The cutter anchored in her old berth, and Van Slyperken, as usual, went on shore, with his double set of dispatches, which were duly delivered. And then Mr. Van Slyperken went up the main street, and turned into a jeweler's shop. What could Mr. Van Slyperken do there? Surely it was to purchase something for the widow Vandersloosh, a necklace or a pair of earrings? No, it was not with that intention. But nevertheless, Mr. Van Slyperken remained there for a long while, and then was seen to depart. Seen by whom? By Moggy Salisbury, who had observed his entering, and who could not imagine why. She, however, said nothing, but she marked the shop and walked away. The next day Mr. Van Slyperken went on shore to put into his mother's charge the money which he had received from Ramsay, and narrated all that had passed. How Smallbones had swallowed two pennyworth of arsenic, with no more effect upon him than one twinge in his stomach. How he now fully believed that nothing could kill the boy. "'Pshaw, child! What nonsense! Nothing kill him!' Had he been in my hands, old as they are, and shaking as they do, he would not have lived. No, no, nobody escapes me when I am determined. We'll talk about that, but not now, Cornelius. The weather has turned warm at last, and there is no need of fire. Go, child, the money is locked up safe, and I have my mood upon me. I may even do you a mischief." Van Slyperken, who knew that it was useless to remain after this hint, walked off and returned on board. As he pulled off, he passed a boat, apparently coming from the cutter, with Moggy Salisbury sitting in the stern sheets. She waved her hand at him and laughed ironically. Impudent hussy, thought Van Slyperken as she passed, but he dared not say a word. 
He turned pale with rage and turned his head away, but little did he imagine at the time what great cause he had of indignation. Moggy had been three hours on board of the cutter, talking with the men, but more particularly with Smallbones and the corporal, with which, too, she had been in earnest conference for the first hour that she was on board. Moggy's animosity to Van Slyperken is well known, and she ridiculed the idea of Snarleyow being anything more than an uncommon lucky dog in escaping so often. Smallbones was of her opinion, and again declared his intention of doing the dog a mischief as soon as he could. Moggy, after her conference with these two, mixed with the ship's company, with whom she had always been a favorite, and the corporal proceeded to superintend the cutting up and the distribution of the fresh beef which had that morning come on board. The beef block was on the forecastle, where the major part of the crew, with Moggy, were assembled. Snarleyow had always attended the corporal on these occasions, and was still the best of friends with him, for somehow or another the dog had not seemed to consider the corporal a party to his brains being knocked out, but had put it all down to his natural enemy, Smallbones. The dog was, as usual, standing by the block, close to the corporal, and picking up the fragments of beef which dropped from the chopper. "'I vowed, by gum, that I'd have that ere dog's tail off,' observed Smallbones, "'and if no one will peach, off it shall go now. And who cares? If I can't kill him dead, I'll get rid of him by bits. There's one eye out already, and now I've a mind for his tail. Corporal, lend me the cleaver.' "'Bravo, small bones. We won't peach, not one of us.' "'I'm not sure of that,' replied Moggy. "'Some won't, I know. But there are others who may, and then small bones will be keel-hauled, sure as fate, and Van Slyperkin will have right on his side. No, no, small bones, you must not do it. Give me the cleaver, corporal, I'll do it, and any one may tell him who pleases when he comes on board.' I don't care for him, and he knows it, Corporal. Hand me the cleaver. That's right. Let Moggy do it, said the seaman. The Corporal turned the dog round, so as to leave his tail on the block, and fed him with small pieces of meat to keep him in the same position. Are you ready, Moggy? said Smallbones. Back him a little more on the block, Corporal, for I won't leave him an inch if I can help it said Moggy, and stand further back, all of you. Moggy raised the cleaver, took good aim, down it came upon the dog's tail, which was separated within an inch of its insertion, and was left bleeding on the block, while the dog sprang away aft, howling most terribly, and leaving a dotted line of blood to mark his course upon the deck. There's a nice skewer piece for anyone who fancies it, observed Moggy looking at the dog's tail, and throwing down the cleaver. "'I think Mr. Van Slyperkin has had enough now for trying to flog my Jemmy, my own duck of a husband.' "'Well,' observed Cobble, "'seeing's believing, but otherwise I should never have thought it possible to have divided that ere dog's tail in that way.' "'He can't be much of a devil now,' observed Bill Spurry, "'for what's a devil without a tail?' A devil is like a sarpent, whose sting is in his tail. Yes, replied Short, who had looked on in silence. But I say, Moggy, perhaps it's as well for him not to find you on board. What do I care? replied Moggy. He is more afraid of me than I of him. But howsomever, it's just as well not to be here, as it may get others in trouble. Mind you, say at once it was me. I defy him. Moggy then wished them good-bye and quitted the cutter, when she was met, as we have already observed, by Van Slyperken. Mein Gott, what must be done now? observed the corporal to those about him, looking at the mangy tail which still remained on the beef-block. Done, corporal, replied Smallbones. 
why you must come for to go for to complain on it as he comes on board you must take the tale and tell the tale and pretend to be as angry and as sorry as himself and damn her up in heaps that's what must be done this was not bad advice on the part of smallbones the ship's company agreed to it and the corporal perceived the propriety of it in the meantime the dog had retreated to the cabin and his howlings had gradually ceased but he had left a track of blood along the deck and down the ladder which dick short perceiving pointed to it and cried out swabs the men brought swabs aft and had cleaned the deck and the ladder down to the cabin door when mr van slyperken came on board has that woman been here inquired mr van slyperken as he came on deck yes replied dick short did not i give positive orders that she should not cried van slyperken no replied dick short then i do now continued the lieutenant too late observed short shrugging up his shoulders and walking forward too late what does he mean said van slyperken turning to cobble i knows nothing about it sir replied cobble she came for some of her husband's things that were left on board van slyperken turned round to look for the corporal for explanation there stood corporal van spitter perfectly erect with a very melancholy face one hand raised as usual to his cap and the other occupied with the tail of snarleyow what is it what is the matter corporal mynheer van slyperken replied the corporal retaining his respectful attitude here is de tail tail what tail exclaimed van slyperken casting his eyes upon the contents of the corporal's left hand de dog's tail mynheer replied the corporal gravely which de damned dog's wife moggy van slyperken stared he could scarcely credit his eyesight but there it was for a time he could not speak for agitation at last with a tremendous oath he darted into the cabin what were his feelings when he beheld snarleyow lying in a corner tailless with a puddle of blood behind him my poor poor dog exclaimed van slyperken covering up his face his sorrow soon changed to rage he invoked all the curses he could imagine upon moggy's head he vowed revenge he stamped with rage and then he patted snarleyow and as the beast looked wistfully in his face, Van Slyperken shed tears. My poor, poor dog! First your eye, and now your tail. What will your persecutors require next? Perdition seize them. May perdition be my portion if I am not revenged. Smallbones is at the bottom of all this. I can, I will be revenged on him. Van Slyperken rang the bell, and the corporal made his appearance, with the dog's tail still in his hand. "'Lay it down on the table, corporal,' said Van Slyperken, mournfully, "'and tell me how this happened.' The corporal then entered into a long detail of the way in which the dog had been detailed. How he had been cutting up beef— and how, while his back was turned, and Snarleyow, as usual, was at the block, picking up the bits, Moggy Salisbury, who had been allowed to come on board by Mr. Short, had caught up the cleaver and chopped off the dog's tail. "'Was Smallbones at the block?' inquired Van Slyperken. "'He was, mynheer,' replied the corporal. "'Who held the dog while his tail was chopped off?' inquired van slyperken someone must have held him this was a home question but the corporal replied yes mynheer someone must have held the dog you did not hear who it was or if it were smallbones i did not mynheer replied the corporal but added he with a significant look i think i could say 
Yes, yes, corporal, I know who you mean. It was him, I am sure. And as soon as I sit here, I'll be revenged. Bring a swab, corporal, and wipe up all this blood. Do you think the poor animal will recover? Yes, mynheer, there be togs with tail, and togs without tail. But the loss of blood, what must be done to stop the bleeding? That damn woman Moggy, when I say to tog die, tog bleed to death, she say, Tell mine air van Slyperkin that de best thing for cure de cur be de red hot poker. Here van Slyperkin stamped his feet and swore horribly. She say, mine air, it stop all de bleeding. I wish she had a hot poker down her body, exclaimed van Slyperkin bitterly. Go for the swab, corporal, and send Smallbones here. Smallbones made his appearance. Did you come for it to want me, sir? Yes, sir. I understand from the corporal that you held the dog while that woman cut off his tail? If so be as how the corporal says that, ere, cried Smallbones, striking the palm of his left hand with his right fist, why, I am jiggered if he don't tell a lie as big as himself, that's all. That ere man is my mortal enemy. And if that ere dog gets into trouble, I am as certain to be in trouble too. What should I cut the dog's tail off for, I should like for to know? I aren't so hungry as all that, anyhow. The idea of eating his dog's tail increased the collar of Mr. Van Slyperkin. With looks of malignant vengeance, he ordered Smallbones out of the cabin. "'Shall I shy this here overboard, sir?' said Smallbones, taking up the dog's tail, which lay on the table. "'Drop it, sir!' roared Van Slyperkin. Smallbones walked away, grinning with delight, but his face was turned from Mr. Van Slyperkin. The corporal returned, swabbed up the blood, and reported that the bleeding had stopped. Mr. Van Slyperkin had no further orders for him. He wished to be left alone. He leaned his head upon his hand, and remained for some time in a melancholy reverie, with his eyes fixed upon the tail which lay before him. That tail now, a bleeding piece of earth, which never was to welcome him with a wag again. What passed in Van Slyperkin's mind during this time it would be too difficult and too long to repeat. For the mind flies over time and space with the rapidity of the lightning's flash. At last he rose, took up the dog's tail, put it into his pocket, went on deck, ordered his boat, and pulled on shore. End of chapter 36 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 37 of Snarleyow by Frederick Marriott This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In which Mr. Van Slyperkin drives a very hard bargain. We will be just and candid in our opinion relative to the historical facts which we are now narrating. Party spirit and various other feelings, independent of misrepresentation, do at the time induce people to form their judgment, to say the best, harshly, and, but too often, incorrectly. It is for posterity to calmly weigh the evidence handed down, and to examine into the merits of a case divested of party bias. Actuated by these feelings, we do not hesitate to assert that, in the point at question, Mr. Van Slyperkin had great cause for being displeased, and that the conduct of Moggy Salisbury in cutting off the tail of Snarleyow was, in our opinion, not justifiable. There is a respect for property inculcated and protected by the laws, which should never be departed from, and whatever may have been the aggressions on the part of Mr. Van Slyperkin or of the dog, Still, a tail is a tail, and whether mangy or not, is bona fide a part of the living body. 
and this aggression must inevitably come under the head of the cutting and maiming act which act however it must with the same candor which will ever guide our pen be acknowledged was not passed until a much later period than that to the history of which our narrative refers having thus with all deference offered our humble opinion we shall revert to facts mr vanslyperken went on shore with the dog's tail in his pocket he walked with rapid strides towards the halfway houses in one of which was the room tenanted by his aged mother for to whom else could he apply for consolation in this case of severe distress that it was moggy salisbury who gave the cruel blow was a fact completely substantiated by evidence but that it was smallbones who held the dog and who thereby became an active participator and therefore equally culpable was a surmise to which the insinuations of the corporal had given all the authority of direct evidence and as mr vanslyperken felt that moggy was not only out of his power but even if in his power that he dare not retaliate upon her for reasons which we have already explained to our readers it was therefore clear to him that smallbones was the party upon whom his indignation could be the most safely vented and moreover that in so doing he was only paying off a long accumulating debt of hatred and ill-will but at the same time mr vanslyperken had made up his mind that a lad who could be floated out to the nab buoy and back again without sinking who could have a bullet through his head without a mark remaining and who could swallow a whole two pennyworth of arsenic without feeling more than a twinge in his stomach was not so very easy to be made away with that the corporal's vision was no fiction was evident the lad was not to be hurt by mortal man but although the widow's arsenic had failed mr vanslyperken in his superstition accounted for it on the grounds that the woman was not the active agent on the occasion having only prepared the herring it not having been received from her hands by smallbones the reader may recollect that in the last interview between vanslyperken and his mother the latter had thrown out hints that if she took smallbones in hand he would not have such miraculous escapes as he had had as in all she undertook she did her business thoroughly bearing this in mind mr vanslyperken went to pour forth his sorrows and to obtain the assistance of his much to be respected and venerable mother well child what is it is it money you bring cried the old woman when vanslyperken entered the room no mother replied vanslyperken throwing himself on the only chair in the room except the one with the legs cut off halfway up upon which his mother was accustomed to rock herself before the grate no mother but i have brought something and i come to you for advice and assistance brought no money yet brought something well child what have you brought this exclaimed vanslyperken throwing the dog's tail down upon the table this repeated the old beldame lifting up the tail and examining it as well as she could as the vibration of her palsied members was communicated to the article then pray child what is this are you blind old woman replied vanslyperken in wrath not to perceive that it is my poor dog's tail blind old woman and dog's tail eh blind old woman eh mr cornelius you dare to call me a blind old woman and to bring here the mangy tail of a dog and to lay it on my table is this your duty sirrah how dare you take such liberties there sir cried the hag in a rage catching hold of the tail and sending it flying out of the casement which was open there sir and now you may follow your tail do you hear leave the room instantly or i'll cleave your craven skull blind old woman forsooth 
Undutiful child! Van Slyperken, in spite of his mother's indignation, could not prevent his eyes from following the tail of his dog as it sailed through the ambient air surrounding the halfway houses, and was glad to observe it landed among some cabbage leaves thrown into the road without attracting notice. Satisfied that he should regain his treasure when he quitted the house, he now turned round to deprecate his mother's wrath who had not yet completed the sentence which we have quoted above. "'I supplicate your pardon, my dear mother,' said Van Slyperken, who felt that in her present humour he was not likely to gain the point with her that he had in contemplation. "'I was so vexed, so irritated, that I knew not what I was saying.' "'Blind old woman, indeed,' repeated the beldame. I again beg you to forgive me, dearest mother, continued Van Slyperken. All about a dog's tail cut off. Better off than on, so much the less mange on the snarling cur. This was touching up Van Slyperken on the raw. But he had a great object in view, and he restrained his feelings. I was wrong, mother, very wrong. But I have done all I can. I have begged your pardon. I came here for your advice and assistance. What advice or assistance can you expect from a blind old woman? retorted the old hag. And what advice or assistance does so undutiful a child deserve? It was some time before the ruffled temper of the beldame could be appeased. At last Van Slyperken succeeded. He then entered into a detail of all that had passed, and concluded by observing— that as Smallbones was not to be injured by mortal man, he had come to her for assistance. That is to say, you have come to me to ask me to knock the lad's brains out, to take away his life, to murder him, in fact. Say, Cornelius, is it not so? It is exactly so, my dearest mother. I know your courage, your... Yes, yes, I understand all that. But now hear me, child. There are deeds which are done, and which I have done, but those deeds are only done upon strong impulses. Murder is one, but people murder for two reasons only, for revenge and for gold. People don't do such acts as are to torture their minds here, and perhaps be punished hereafter, that is, if there be one child. I say, people don't do such deeds as these merely because a graceless son comes to them and says, If you please, mother. Do you understand that, child? I've blood enough on my hands already. Good blood, too. They are not defiled with the scum of a parish boy, nor shall they be without. Without what, mother? Have I not told you, Cornelius, that there are but two great excitements? revenge and gold i have no revenge against the lad if you have if you consider that a dog's tail demands a human victim well and good do the deed yourself i would cried van slyperken but i have tried in vain it must be done by woman then hear me cornelius if it must be done by woman you must find a woman to do it and you must pay her for the deed. Murder is at a high price. You apply to me. I am content to do the deed. But I must have gold, and plenty, too. Van Slyperken paused before he replied. The old woman had charge of all his money. She was on the verge of the grave. For what could she require his gold? Could she be so foolish? It was all insanity. Van Slyperken was right. It was insanity, for avarice is no better. Do you mean, mother, replied Van Slyperken, that you want gold from me? From whom else? demanded the old woman sharply. Take it then, mother. Take as many pieces as you please. I must have all that there is in that chest, Cornelius. All, mother? Yes, all. And what is it, after all? What price is too high for blood, which calls for retribution? Besides, Cornelius, it must be all yours again when I die. 
but I shall not die yet. No, no. Well, mother, replied Van Slyperken, if it must be so, it shall all be yours. Not that I can see what difference it makes, whether it is called yours or mine. Then why not give it freely? Why do you hesitate to give it to your poor old mother? What may be again yours before the leaf again falls? Ask yourself why, Cornelius, and then you have my answer. The gold is here in my charge, but it is not my gold. It is yours. You little think how often I've laid in bed and longed that it was all mine. Then I would count it, count it again and again. Watch over it, not as I do now as a mere deposit in my charge, but as a mother would watch and smile upon her first-born child. There is a talisman in that word, mine, that not approaching death can wean from life. It is our nature's child. Say then, is all that gold mine? Van Slyperken paused. He also felt the magic of the word, and although it was but a nominal and temporary divestment of the property, even that gave him a severe struggle. But his avarice was overcome by his feelings of revenge, and he answered solemnly, As I hope for revenge, mother, all that gold is yours, provided that you do the deed. Here the old hag burst into a sort of shrieking laugh. Send him here, child. And the almost unearthly cachination was continued. Send him here, child. I can't go to seek him, and it is done. Only bring him here. So soon as this compact had been completed, Van Slyperken and his mother had a consultation, and it was agreed that it would be advisable not to attempt the deed until the day before the cutter sailed, as it would remove all suspicion and be supposed that the boy had deserted. This arrangement having been made, Van Slyperken made rather a hasty retreat. The fact was that he was anxious to recover the fragment of Snarleyow which his mother had so contemptuously thrown out of the casement. End of chapter 37 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 38 of Snarleyow by Frederick Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In which Mr. Van Slyperken is taken for a witch. Mr. Van Slyperken hastened into the street and walked towards the heap of cabbage leaves in which he observed the object of his wishes to have fallen. But there was someone there before him, an old sow very busy groping among the refuse. Although Van Slyperken came on shore without even a stick in his hand, he had no fear of a pig, and walked up boldly to drive her away, fully convinced that, although she might like cabbage, not being exactly carnivorous, he should find the tail in statu quo. But it appeared that the sow not only would not stand being interfered with, but, moreover, was carnivorously inclined, for she was at that very moment routing the tail about with her nose, and received Van Slyperken's advance with a very irascible grunt, throwing her head up at him with a savage ah, and then again busied herself with the fragment of Snarleyow. Van Slyperken, who had started back, perceived that the sow was engaged with a very article in question, and finding it was a service of more danger than he had expected, picked up one or two large stones and threw them at the animal to drive her away. This mode of attack had the effect desired in one respect. The sow made a retreat, but at the same time she would not retreat without the bon bouche which she carried away in her mouth. Van Slyperken followed, but the sow proved that she could fight as well as run, every minute turning round to bay and chumping and grumbling in a very formidable manner. 
At last, after Vanslyperken had chased for a quarter of a mile, he received unexpected assistance from a large dog, who bounded from the side of the road where he lay in the sun, and seizing the sow by the ear, made her drop the tail to save her own bacon. Vanslyperken was delighted. He hastened up as fast as he could to regain his treasure, when, to his mortification, the great dog who had left the sow arrived at the spot before him, and after smelling at the not one bone but many bones of contention, he took it in his mouth and trotted off to his former berth in the sunshine, laid himself down and the tail before him. "'Surely one dog won't eat another dog's tail,' thought Van Slyperken, as he walked up to the animal. But an eye like fire, a deep growl, and exposure of a range of teeth equal to a hyena's, convinced Mr. Van Slyperken that it would be wise to retreat, which he did to a respectable distance, and attempted to coax the dog. "'Poor doggie!' "'There's a dog!' cried Van Slyperken, snapping his fingers and approaching gradually. To his horror the dog did the same thing exactly. He rose and approached Mr. Van Slyperken gradually, and snapped his fingers. Not content with that, he flew at him and tore the skirt of his greatcoat clean off, and also the hinder part of his trousers, for Mr. Van Slyperken immediately turned tail, and the dog appeared resolved to have his tail as well as that of his darling cur. Satisfied with about half a yard of broadcloth as a trophy, the dog returned to his former situation, and remained with the tail of the coat and the tail of the cur before him, with his fierce eyes fixed upon Mr. Van Slyperken who had now retreated to a greater distance. But this transaction was not unobserved by several of the people who inhabited the street of cottages. Many eyes were directed to where Mr. Van Slyperken and the sow and dog had been at issue, and many were the conjectures thereon. When the dog retreated with the skirt of the greatcoat, many came out to ascertain what was the cause of the dispute and among others the man to whom the dog belonged, and who lived at the cottage opposite to where the dog had lain down. He observed Van Slyperken looking very much like a vessel whose sails have been split in a gale, and very rueful at the same time, standing at a certain distance, quite undecided how to act. And he called out to him, "'What is it you may want with my dog, man?' Man! Van Slyperken thought this designation an affront, whereas in our opinion Van Slyperken was an affront to the name of man. Man! exclaimed Van Slyperken. Why, your dog has taken my property! Then take your property, replied the other, tossing to him the skirt of his coat, which he had taken from the dog. By this time there was a crowd collected from out of the various surrounding tenements. "'That's not all!' exclaimed Van Slyperken. "'He has got my dog's tail there!' "'Your dog's tail?' exclaimed the man. "'What do you mean? Is it this ragged mangy thing you would have?' And the man took the tail of Snarleyow and held it up to the view of the assembled crowd. "'Yes!' replied Van Slyperken, coming toward the man with eagerness. That is what I want, and he held out his hand to receive it. And pray may I ask, replied the other, looking very suspiciously at Van Slyperken, what can you want with this piece of carrion? To make soup of, replied another, laughing. He can't afford oxtail. Van Slyperken made an eager snatch at his treasure, but the man lifted it up on the other side, out of his reach. "'Let us have a look at this chap,' said the first, examining Van Slyperken, whose peaked nose and chin, small ferret eyes, and downcast look were certainly not in his favor. Neither were his old and now tattered habiliments. 
Certainly no one would have taken Van Slyperken for a king's officer. Unfortunately, they took him for something else. Now tell me, fellow, what were you going to do with this? inquired the man in a severe tone. I shan't tell you, replied Van Slyperken. Why, that's the chap that I sees go in and out of the room where that old hellfire witch lives, who curses all day long. I thought as much, observed the man, who still held up the cur's tail. Now I appeal to you all. What can a fellow want with such a thing as this? I, my good people, and want it so much, too, as to risk being torn to pieces for it, if he aren't inclined to evil practices. That's certain sure, replied another. A witch, a witch, cried the whole crowd. Let's duck him, tie his thumbs, away with him, come along, my lads, away with him. Although there were not at this time we write about regular witch-finders, as in the time of James I, yet the feeling against witches and the belief that they practiced still existed. They were no longer handed over to summary and capital punishment, but whenever suspected they were sure to meet with very rough treatment. Such was the fate of Mr. Van Slyperken, who was now seized by the crowd, buffeted and spit upon, and dragged to the parish pump, there being, fortunately for him, no horse-pond near. After having been well beaten, pelted with mud, his clothes torn off his back, his hat taken away and stamped upon, he was held under the pump and drenched for nearly half an hour, until he lay beneath the spout in a state of complete exhaustion. The crowd were then satisfied, and he was left to get away how he could, which he did, after a time, in a most deplorable plight, bareheaded in his shirt and torn trousers. He contrived to walk as far as to the house where his mother resided, was admitted to her room when he fell exhausted on the bed. The old woman was astonished, and having some gin in her cupboard, revived him by administering a small quantity, and in the course of half an hour Van Slyperken could tell his story. But all the consolation he received from the old beldame was— "'Serve you right, too, for being such an ass. "'I suppose you'll be bringing the stupid people about my ears soon. "'They've hooted me before now. "'Ah, well, I'll not be pumped upon for nothing. "'My knife is a sharp one.' "'Van Slyperken had clothes under his mother's charge, "'and he dressed himself in another suit and then hastened away, "'much mortified and confounded with the latter events of the day.' The result of his arrangements with his mother was, however, a balm to his wounded spirit, and he looked upon Smallbones as already dead. He hastened down into his cabin as soon as he arrived on board to ascertain the condition of Snarleyow, whom he found as well as could be expected, and occasionally making unavailing attempts to lick the stump of his tail. "'My poor dog!' exclaimed Van Slyperken. What have you suffered, and what have I suffered for you? Alas, if I am to suffer as I have today for only your tail, what shall I go through for your whole body? And as Van Slyperken recalled his misfortunes, so did his love increase for the animal who was the cause of them. Why so, we cannot tell, except that it has been so from the beginning, is so now, and always will be the case, for the best of all possible reasons, that it is human nature. End of chapter 38 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 39 of Snarleyow by Frederick Marriott this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In which is recorded a most barbarous and bloody murder. We observed in a previous chapter that Mr. Van Slyperken was observed by Moggy Salisbury to go into a jeweler's shop and remain there some time, 
and that Moggy was very inquisitive to know what it was that could induce Mr. Vanslyperken to go into so unusual a resort for him. The next day she went into the shop, upon a pretense of looking at some earrings, and attempted to enter into conversation with a jeweler. But the jeweler, not perhaps admiring Moggy's appearance, and not thinking her likely to be a customer, dismissed her with very short answers. Failing in her attempt, Moggy determined to wait till Nancy Corbett should come over, for she knew that Nancy could dress and assume the fine lady, and be more likely to succeed than herself. But although Moggy could not penetrate into the mystery, it is necessary the reader should be informed of the proceedings of Mr. Van Slyperken. When Ramsay had shown him how to open the government dispatches, and had provided him with the false seals for the re-impressions, he forgot that he also was pointing out to Van Slyperken the means of also opening his own, and discovering his secrets, as well as those of the government. But Van Slyperken, who hated Ramsay on account of his behavior toward him, and would with pleasure have seen the whole of his party, as well as himself, on the gibbet, thought that it might be just as well to have two strings to his bow, and he argued that if he could open the letters of the conspirators and obtain their secrets, they would prove valuable to him, and perhaps save his neck if he were betrayed to the government. On his passage, therefore, to Amsterdam, he had carefully examined the seal of Ramsay, and also that on the letters forwarded to him, and having made a drawing and taken the impression in wax as a further security, he had applied to the jeweler in question to get him seals cut out with these impressions, and of the exact form and size. The jeweler, who cared little what he did, provided that he was well paid, asked no questions, but a very high price, and Van Slyperken, knowing that they would be cheap to him at any price, closed with him on his own terms, provided that they were immediately forthcoming. In the week, according to this agreement, the seals were prepared. Mr. Van Slyperken paid his money, and now was waiting for orders to sail. The dog stump was much better. On the ninth day, a summons to the admiral's house was sent, and Van Slyperken was ordered to hold himself in readiness to sail the next morning at daylight. He immediately repaired to the Jews to give intimation, and from thence to his mother's to prepare her for the arrival of Smallbones that evening a little before dusk. Van Slyperken had arranged that, as soon as the murder had been committed, he would go to the Jews for letters, and then hasten on board, sailing the next morning at daylight, so that if there was any discovery, the whole onus might be on his mother, who, for all he cared, might be hung. It is a true saying that a good mother makes a good son. When Van Slyperken intimated to Smallbones that he was going on shore in the evening, and should take him with him, the lad did not forget the last walk that he had in company with his master, and, apprehensive that some mischief was intended, he said, "'I hope it aren't for to fetch another walk in the country, sir.' "'No, no,' replied Van Slyperken. "'It's to take some biscuit up to a poor old woman close by. I don't want to be robbed any more than you do, Smallbones.' But the very quick reply of his master only increased the apprehension of Smallbones, who left the cabin and hastened to Corporal Van Spitter to consult with him. Corporal Van Spitter was of the same opinion as Smallbones, that mischief was intended him, and offered to provide him with a pistol. But Smallbones, who knew little about firearms, requested that he might have a bayonet instead, which he could use better. He was supplied with this, which he concealed within his shirt, and when ordered, he went into the boat with Van Slyperken. 
They landed, and it was dark before they arrived at the halfway houses. Van Slyperken ascended the stairs and ordered Smallbones to follow him. As soon as they were in the room, Mr. Van Slyperken said, "'Here's the biscuit, good woman, and much good may it do you.' "'It's very kind of you, sir, and many thanks. It's not often that people are charitable nowadays, and this has been a hard winter for poor folk. Put the bag down there, my good little fellow,' continued the old hypocrite, addressing Smallbones. "'And now, good woman, I shall leave my lad with you till I come back. I have to call at a friend's, and I need not take him. Smallbones, stay here till I return. Get the biscuit out of the bag, as we must take that on board again.' Smallbones had no objection to remain with a withered, palsied old woman. He could have no fear of her, and he really began to think that his master had been guilty of charity. Mr. Van Slyperken departed, leaving Smallbones in company with his mother. "'Come now, my lad, come to the chair and sit down by the fire,' for a fire had been lighted by the old woman expressly. "'Sit down, and I'll see if I can find you something in my cupboard. "'I have, I know, a drop of cordial left somewhere. "'Sit down, child. "'You have had the kindness to bring the bread up for me, and I am grateful.' "'The tones of the old beldame's voice were very different from those she usually indulged in. "'There was almost a sweetness about them, "'which proved what she might have effected at the period when she was fair and young.' Smallbones felt not the least disquietude. He sat down in the chair by the fire, while the old woman looked in the cupboard behind him for the cordial, of which she poured him a good allowance in a teacup. Smallbones sipped and sipped. He was not in a hurry to get rid of it, as it was good. The old woman went again to the cupboard, rattled the things about a little, and then, on a sudden, taking out a large hammer, as Smallbones unconsciously sipped, she raised it with both her hands, and down came the blow on his devoted head. The poor lad dropped the cup, sprang up convulsively, staggered, and then fell. Once he rolled over, his leg quivered, and he then moved no more. The bell dame watched him with a hammer in her hand, ready to repeat the blow if necessary, Indeed, she would have repeated it had not it been that after he fell, in turning over, Smallbone's head had rolled under the low bedstead where she slept. "'My work is sure,' muttered she, "'and all the gold is mine.' Again she watched, but there was no motion. A stream of blood appeared from under the bed and ran in a little rivulet toward the fireplace. "'I wish I could pull him out.' said the old woman, lugging at the lad's legs. Another blow or two would make more sure. But the effort was above her strength, and she abandoned it. It's no matter, muttered she. He'll never tell tales again. But here the old hag was mistaken. Smallbones had been stunned, but not killed. The blow of the hammer had fortunately started off, divided the flesh of the skull for three inches with a gash which descended to his ear. At the very time that she uttered her last expressions, Smallbones was recovering his senses, but he was still confused as if in a dream. "'Yes, yes,' said the old woman, after some minutes' pause. "'All the gold is mine!' The lad heard this sentence, and he now remembered where he was and what had taken place. He was about to rise when there was a knocking at the door, and he lay still. It was Van Slyperken. The door was opened by the old beldame. "'Is it done?' said he, in a loud whisper. "'Done!' cried the hag. "'Yes, and well done. Don't tell me I've charmed life. My blows are sure. See there.' "'Are you sure that he is dead?' "'Quite sure, child.' and all the gold is mine. Van Slyperken looked with horror at the stream of blood still flowing. 
and absorbed by the ashes in the grate. "'It was you did it, mother. Recollect, it was not I,' cried he. "'I did it, and you paid for it, and all the gold is mine.' "'But are you quite sure that he is dead?' "'Sure, yes, and in judgment now, if there is any.' Vanslyperken surveyed the body of Smallbones, who, although he had heard every word, lay without motion, for he knew his life depended on it. After a minute or two the lieutenant was satisfied. "'I must go on board now, mother. But what will you do with the body?' "'Leave that to me, whoever comes in here. Leave that to me, Craven, and as you say, go on board.' Vanslyperken opened the door and went out of the room. The old hag made the door fast, and then sat down on the chair, which she replaced by the side of the fire, with her back to Smallbones. The lad felt very faint from loss of blood, and was sick at the stomach, but his senses were at their full vigor. He now was assured that Vanslyperken was gone, and that he had only the old woman opposed to him. His courage was unsubdued, and he resolved to act in self-defense if required, and he softly drew the bayonet out of his breast, and then watched the murderous old hag, who was rocking herself in the chair. "'Yes, yes, the goal is mine,' muttered she. "'I've won it, and I'll count it. I won it dearly. Another murder? Well, tis but one more. Let me see.' what shall I do with the body? I must burn it, by bits and bits, and I'll count the gold. It's all mine, for he's dead. Here the old woman turned round to look at the body, and her keen eyes immediately perceived that there was a slight change of position. Ha! cried she. Not quite dead yet. We must have the hammer again. And she rose from her chair and walked with an unsteady pace to pick up the hammer, which was at the other side of the fireplace. Smallbones, who felt that now was his time, immediately rose, but before he could recover his feet she had turned round to him. With a sort of low yell she darted at him with an agility not to be imagined in one of her years and decrepit appearance, and struck at him. Smallbones raised his left hand and received the blow, and with his right plunged the bayonet deep into the wrinkled throat of the old woman. She grappled with him, and the struggle was dreadful. She caught his throat in one of her bony hands, and the nails pierced into it like the talons of a bird of prey. The fingers of the other she inserted into the jagged and gaping wound on his head, and forced the flesh still more asunder, exerting all her strength to force him on his back but the bayonet was still in her throat, and with a point descending toward the body, and Smallbones forced and forced it down till it was buried to the hilt. In a few seconds the old hag loosed her hold, quivered, and fell back dead. And the lad was so exhausted with the struggle and his previous loss of blood that he fell into a swoon at the side of the corpse. When Smallbones recovered, the candle was flickering in the socket, he rose up in a sitting position, and tried to recollect all that had passed. The alternating light of the candle flashed upon the body of the old woman, and he remembered all. After a few minutes he was able to rise, and he sat down upon the bed giddy and faint. It occurred to him that he would soon be in the dark, and he would require the light to follow up his intended movements, so he rose and went to the cupboard to find one. He found a candle, and he also found the bottle of cordial, of which he drank all that was left, and felt himself revived and capable of acting. Having put the other candle into the candlestick, he looked for water, washed himself, and bound up his head with his handkerchief. He then wiped up the blood from the floor, threw some sand over the part, and burnt the towel in the grate. His next task was one of more difficulty, to lift up the body of the old woman, put it into the bed, and cover it up with the clothes, previously drawing out the bayonet. No blood issued from the wound, 
The hemorrhage was all internal. He covered up the face, took the key of the door, and tried it in the lock, put the candle under the grate to burn out safely, took possession of the hammer. Then, having examined the door, he went out, locked it from the outside, slid the key in beneath the door, and hastened away as fast as he could. He was not met by anybody, and was soon safe in the street with the bayonet, which he again concealed in his vest. These precautions taken by Smallbones proved that the lad had conduct as well as courage. He argued that it was not advisable that it should be known that this fatal affray had taken place between the old woman and himself. Satisfied with having preserved his life, he was unwilling to be embroiled in a case of murder, as he wished to prosecute his designs with his companions on board. He knew that Van Slyperken was capable of swearing anything against him, and that his best safety lay in the affair not being found out, which it could not be until the cutter had sailed, and no one had seen him either enter or go out. There was another reason which induced Smallbones to act as he did, without appealing to the authorities, which was that if he returned on board it would create such a shock to Mr. Van Slyperken, who had, as he supposed, seen him lying dead upon the floor. But there was one person to whom he determined to apply for advice before he decided how to proceed, and that was Moggy Salisbury, who had given her address to him when she had gone on board the Jungfrau. To her house he therefore repaired, and found her at home. It was then about nine o'clock in the evening. Moggy was much surprised to see Smallbones enter in such a condition, but Smallbones' story was soon told, and Moggy sent for a surgeon, the services of whom the lad seriously required. While his wound was dressing, which was asserted by them to have been received in a fray, Moggy considered what would be the best method to proceed. The surgeon stated his intention of seeing Smallbones the next day, but he was requested to leave him sufficient dressing, as it was necessary that he should repair on board, as the vessel which he belonged to sailed on the following morning. The surgeon received his fee, recommended quiet and repose, and retired. A consultation then took place. Smallbones expressed his determination to go on board. He did not fear Mr. Van Slyperken, as the crew of the cutter would support him, and moreover it would frighten Mr. Van Slyperken out of his wits. To this Moggy agreed, but she proposed that, instead of making his appearance on the following morning, he should not appear to Mr. Van Slyperken until the vessel was in the blue water if possible, not till she was over on the other side. And Moggy determined to go on board, see the corporal, and make the arrangements with him and the crew, who were now unanimous. For the six marines were at the beck of the corporal, so that Mr. Van Slyperken should be frightened out of his wits. Desiring Smallbones to lie down on her bed, and take the rest he so much needed, she put on her bonnet and cloak, and taking a boat pulled gently alongside the cutter. Van Slyperken had been on board for two hours, and was in his cabin. The lights, however, were still burning. The corporal was still up, anxiously waiting for the return of Smallbones, and he was very much alarmed when he heard Moggy coming alongside. Moggy soon detailed to the corporal, Dick Short, and Cobble all that had taken place, and what it was proposed should be done. They assented willingly to the proposal, declaring that if Van Slyperken attempted to hurt the lad, they would rise and throw Mr. Van Slyperken overboard. And everything being arranged, Moggy was about to depart, when Van Slyperken, who was in a state of miserable anxiety and torture, and who had been drowning his conscience in Sheetham, came on deck not a little the worse for what he had been imbibing. "'Who is that woman?' cried Van Slyperken. "'That woman is Moggy Salisbury,' cried Moggy, walking up to Van Slyperken, 
while the corporal skulked forward without being detected. "'Have I not given positive orders that this woman does not come on board?' cried Van Slyperken, holding on by the skylight. "'Who is that? Mr. Short?' "'Yes,' replied Short. "'Why did you allow her to come on board?' "'I came without leave,' said Moggy. "'I brought a message on board.' "'A message? What message? To whom?' "'To you,' replied Moggy. "'To me? From whom, you cockatrice?' "'I'll tell you,' replied Moggy, walking up close to him. "'From Lazarus the Jew. Will you hear it, or shall I leave it with Dick Short?' "'Silence! Silence! Not a word. Come down into the cabin, good Moggy. Come down. I'll hear it then.' with all my heart, Mr. Vanslyperken, but none of your attacks on my virtue. Recollect, I am an honest woman. Don't be afraid, my good Moggy. I never hurt a child. I don't think you ever did, retorted Moggy, following Vanslyperken, who could hardly keep his feet. Well, there's abracadabra there, anyhow, observed Cobble to Short as they went down. Why well, she turns him round her finger. Yes, quoth Short. I can't comprehend this no-how. No, quoth Short. As soon as they were in the cabin, Moggy observed the bottle of Sheetham on the table. Come, Mr. Vanslyperken, you'll treat me to-night and drink my health again, won't you? Yes, Moggy, yes, we're friends now, you know. For Vanslyperken, like all others suffering under the stings of conscience, was glad to make friends with his bitterest enemy. "'Come, then, help me, Mr. Vanslyperken, and then I'll give my message.' As soon as Moggy had taken her glass of Sheetham, she began to think what she should say, for she had no message ready prepared. At last a thought struck her. "'I am desired to tell you—' that when a passenger or a person disguised as a sailor either asks for a passage or volunteers for the vessel, you are to take him on board immediately, even if you should know them in their disguise not to be what they pretend to be. Do you understand? Yes, replied Van Slyperken, who was quite muddled. Whether they apply from here or from the other side of the channel, no consequence you must take them. If not... If not, what? replied Vanslyperken. You'll swing. That's all, my buck. Good night to you, replied Moggy, leaving the cabin. I'll swing, muttered Vanslyperken, rolling against the bulkhead. Well, if I do, others shall swing, too. Who cares? Damn the faggot. Here Mr. Vanslyperken poured out another glass of Sheetham, the contents of which overthrew the small remnant of his reasoning faculties. He then tumbled into his bed with his clothes on, saying, as he turned on his side, Smallbones is dead and gone at all events. Moggy took leave of her friends on deck and pushed on shore. She permitted Smallbones, whom she found fast asleep, to remain undisturbed until nearly three o'clock in the morning, during which time she watched by the bedside. She then roused him, and they sallied forth, took a boat, and dropped alongside of the cutter. Smallbone's hammock had been prepared for him by the corporal. He was put into it, and Moggy then left the vessel. Mr. Van Slyperken was in a state of torpor during this proceeding, and was with great difficulty awoke by the corporal, according to orders given, when it was daylight, and the cutter was to weigh anchor. "'Smallbones has not come off, sir, last night,' reported the corporal. "'I suppose the scoundrel has deserted,' replied Van Slyperken. "'I fully expected that he would. However, he is no loss, for he was a useless, idle, lying rascal.' and Mr. Van Slyperken turned out. Having all his clothes on, he had no occasion to dress. He went on deck, followed by the tailless Snarleyow, and in half an hour the cutter was standing out toward St. Helens. 
End of chapter 39. Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina. Chapter 40 of Snarleyow by Frederick Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In which a most horrid specter disturbs the equanimity of Mr. Van Slyperken. Two days was the cutter striving with light winds for the texel, during which Mr. Van Slyperken kept himself altogether in his cabin. He was occasionally haunted with the memory of the scene in his mother's room, small bones dead, and the stream of blood running along the floor, and his mother's diabolical countenance, with the hammer raised in her palsied hands. But he had an instigator to his vengeance beside him, which appeared to relieve his mind whenever it was oppressed. It was the stump of Snarleyow, and when he looked at that he no longer regretted, but congratulated himself on the deed being done. His time was fully occupied during the day, for with locked doors he was transcribing the letters sent to Ramsay and confided to him. He was not content with taking extracts, as he did of the government dispatches for Ramsay. He copied every word, and he replaced the seals with great dexterity. At night his mind was troubled, and he dared not lay himself down to rest until he had fortified himself with several glasses of Sheetham. Even then his dreams frightened him, but he was to be more frightened yet. Corporal Van Spitter came into the cabin on the third morning with a very anxious face. My God, my dear Van Slyperken, de whole crew be in de mutinies. Mutiny? exclaimed Van Slyperken. What's the matter? They say, sir, that they see de ghost of Smallbones last night on de bowsprit, with one great cut on his head, and de blood all over de face. Saw what? Who saw him? My God, my dear, it all true. I really think I see it myself at the taffrail. He sit there and have great wound from here down to here, said the corporal, pointing to his own head and describing the wound exactly. The people say he must have been murdered, and they kick up the mutiny. I did not do it, corporal, at all events, replied Van Slyperken pale and trembling. So Smallbones tell Dick Short when he speak to him on bowsprit. Did it speak to Short? inquired Van Slyperken, catching the corporal's arm. Yes, mynheer, mynheer Short speak first, and den de ghost say dat you not do it, but dat you give gold to old woman to do it, and she knock him brain out vid de hammer. To portray Van Slyperken's dismay at this intelligence would be impossible. He could not but be certain that there had been a supernatural communication. His knees knocked and trembled, and he turned sick and faint. "'Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, Corporal, I am a great sinner,' cried he at last, quite unaware of what he was saying. "'Some water, Corporal.' Corporal Van Spitter handed some water, and Van Slyperken waved his hand to be left alone. And Mr. Van Slyperken attempted to pray, but it ended in blaspheming. "'It's a lie, all a lie!' exclaimed he at last, pouring out a tumbler of Sheetham. "'They have frightened the corporal. But, no, he must have seen him, or how could they know how he was murdered?' he must have told them. And him I saw dead and stiff with these own eyes. Well, I did not do the deed, continued Van Slyperken, attempting to palliate his crime to himself. But it would not do, and Mr. Van Slyperken paced the little cabin racked by fear and guilt. Remorse he felt none, for there was before his eyes the unhealed stump of Snarleyow. In the evening Mr. Van Slyperken went on deck. The weather was now very warm, for it was the beginning of July, and Mr. Van Slyperken, 
followed by Snarleyow, was in a deep reverie, and he turned and turned again. The sun had set, and Mr. Van Slyperken still continued his walk, but his steps were agitated and uneven, and his face was haggard. It was rather the rapid and angry pacing of a tiger in his den, who has just been captured, than that of a person in deep contemplation. Still, Mr. Van Slyperken continued to tread the deck, and it was quite light with a bright and pale moon. The men were standing here and there about the forecastle, and near the booms in silence, and speaking in low whispers, and Van Slyperken's eye was often directed towards them, for he had not forgotten the report of the corporal that they were in a state of mutiny. Of a sudden, Mr. Van Slyperken was roused by a loud cry from forward, and a rush of all the men aft. He thought that the crew had risen, and that they were about to seize him, but, on the contrary, they passed him and hastened to the taffrail with exclamations of horror. "'What? What is it?' exclaimed Van Slyperken, fully prepared for the reply by his own fears. "'O oh, Lord, have mercy upon us!' cried Bill Spurry. "'Good God, deliver us!' exclaimed another. "'Ah, my God!' screamed Jansen, rushing against Van Slyperken and knocking him down on the deck. "'Well, well, murder will out, that's certain,' said Cobble who stood by Van Slyperken when he had recovered his legs. "'What? What?' exclaimed Van Slyperken, breathless. "'There, sir, look there,' said Cobble, breathless, pointing to the figure of Smallbones, who now appeared from the shade in the broad moonshine. His head was not bound up, and his face appeared pale and streaked with blood. He was in the same clothes in which he had gone on shore, and in his hand he held the hammer which had done the deed. The figure slowly advanced to the quarter-deck. Van Slyperken attempted to retreat, but his legs failed him. He dropped down on his knees, uttered a loud yell of despair, and then threw himself flat on the deck, face downwards. Certainly the pantomime was inimitably got up, but it had all been arranged by Moggy, the corporal, and the others. There was not one man of the crew who had not been sworn to secrecy, and whose life would have been endangered if, by undeceiving Van Slyperken, they had been deprived of such just and legitimate revenges. Smallbones disappeared as soon as Van Slyperken had fallen down. He was allowed to remain there for some time, to ascertain if he would say anything, but as he still continued silent, they raised him up and found that he was insensible. He was consequently taken down into the cabin and put into his bed. The effect produced by this trial of Mr. Van Slyperken's nerves was most serious. Already too much heated with the use of ardent spirits, it brought on convulsions, in which he continued during the major part of the night. Towards the morning he sank into a perturbed slumber. It was not till eleven o'clock in the forenoon that he awoke and perceived his faithful corporal standing by the side of the bed. "'Have I not been ill, corporal?' said Mr. Van Slyperken, whose memory was impaired for the time. "'Mein Gott, yes, mein Herr. "'There was something happened, was not there?' "'My God, yes, my dear. "'I've had a fit, have I not?' "'My God, yes, my dear. "'My head swims now. "'What was it, Corporal?' "'It was the ghost of the boy,' replied the Corporal. "'Yes, yes,' replied Van Slyperken, falling back on his pillow. "'It had been intended by the conspirators "'that Smallbones should make his appearance in the cabin "'as the bell struck one o'clock. "'But the effect had already been so serious "'that it was thought advisable to defer any further attempts. "'As for Smallbones being concealed in the vessel "'for any length of time, there was no difficulty in that. "'For allowing that Van Slyperken should go forward "'on the lower deck of the vessel, which he never did, 
Smallbones had only to retreat into the eyes of her, and it was there so dark that he could not be seen. They therefore regulated their conduct much in the same way as the members of the Inquisition used to do in former days. They allowed their patient to recover, that he might be subjected to more torture. It was not until the fourth day that the cutter arrived at the port of Amsterdam, and Mr. Van Slyperken had kept his bed ever since he had been put into it. But this he could do no longer. He rose weak and emaciated, dressed himself, and went on shore with the dispatches, which he first delivered, and then bent his steps to the syndic's house, where he delivered his letters to Ramsay. The arrival of the cutter had been duly notified to the widow Vandersloosh before she had dropped her anchor, and in pursuance with her resolution she immediately dispatched Babette to track Mr. Vanslyperken and watch his motions. Babette took care not to be seen by Mr. Vanslyperken, but shrouding herself close in her cotton print cloak she followed him to the Stadt House and from the Stadt House to the mansion of Mynheer Van Krause, at a short distance from the gates of which she remained till he came out. Wishing to ascertain whether he went to any other place, she did not discover herself until she perceived that he was proceeding to the widow's. She then quickened her pace so as to come up with him. "'Oh, Mynheer Van Slyperken, is this you? I heard you had come in, and so did my mistress.' and she has been expecting you this last half hour. I have made all haste I can, Babette, but I was obliged to deliver my dispatches first, replied Van Slyperken. But I thought you always took your dispatches to the Stadt House. Well, so I do, Babette. I have just come from thence. This was enough for Babette. It proved that his visit to the syndics was intended to be concealed. She was too prudent to let him know that she had traced him. "'Why, Mr. Van Slyperken, you look very ill. What has been the matter with you? My mistress will be quite frightened.' "'I have not been well, Babette,' replied Van Slyperken. "'I really must run home as fast as I can. I will tell my mistress you have been unwell, for otherwise she will be in such a quandary.' and Babette hastened ahead of Mr. Van Slyperken, who was in too weak a state to walk fast. "'The syndic's house, eh?' said the widow. "'Mynheer Van Krause. "'Why, he is thorough king's man, by all report,' continued she. "'I don't understand it. "'But there's no trusting any man nowadays. "'Babette, you must go there by and by, "'and see if you can find out whether that person he brought over—' and he called a king's messenger, is living at the syndic's house. I think he must be, or why would Van Slyperken go there? And if he is, there's treason going on, that's all. And I'll find it out, or my name's not Vandersloosh. Shortly after, Mr. Van Slyperken arrived at the house, and was received with the usual treacherous cordiality. But he had remained more than an hour, when Cobble came to him, having been dispatched by short, to inform Mr. Vanslyperken that a frigate was coming in with a royal standard at the main, indicating that King William was on board of her. This intelligence obliged Mr. Vanslyperken to hasten on board, as it was necessary to salute, and also to pay his respects on board the frigate. The frigate was within a mile when Mr. Van Slyperken arrived on board of the cutter, and when the battery saluted, the cutter did the same. Shortly afterwards, the frigate dropped her anchor and returned the salute. Mr. Van Slyperken, attired in his full uniform, ordered his boat to be manned and pulled on board. On his arrival on the quarter-deck, Van Slyperken was received by the captain of the frigate, and then presented to King William of Nassau, who was standing on the other side of the deck, attended by the Duke of Portland, Lord Albemarle, and several others of his courtiers, not all of them quite so faithful as the two whom we have named. 
when Mr. Vanslyperken was brought forward to the presence of His Majesty, he trembled almost as much as when he had beheld the supposed spirit of Smallbones. And well he might, for his conscience told him, as he bowed his knee, that he was a traitor. His agitation was, however, ascribed to his being daunted by the unusual presence of royalty. And Albemarle, as Van Slyperken retreated with a cold sweat on his forehead, observed to the king with a smile, "'That worthy lieutenant would show a little more courage, I doubt not, your majesty, if he were in the presence of your enemies.' "'It is to be hoped so,' replied the king with a smile. "'I agree with you, Keppel.' But his majesty and Lord Albemarle did not know Mr. Van Slyperken, as the reader will acknowledge. End of chapter 40 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 41 of Snarleyow by Frederick Marriott This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In which is shown how dangerous it is to tell a secret. Mr. Van Slyperken received orders to attend with his boat upon His Majesty's landing, which took place in about a quarter of an hour afterwards, amidst another war of cannon. King William was received by the authorities at the landing stairs, and from thence he stepped into the carriage awaiting him, and drove off to his palace at The Hague, much to the relief of Mr. Van Slyperken, who felt ill at ease in the presence of his sovereign. When His Majesty put his foot on shore, the foremost to receive him, in virtue of his office, was the syndic, Mynheer Van Kraus, who, in full costume of gown, chains, and periwig, bowed low as His Majesty advanced, expecting as usual the gracious smile and friendly nod of his sovereign. But to his mortification his reverence was returned with a grave, if not stern, air, and the king passed him without further notice. All the courtiers also, who had been accustomed to salute and to exchange a few words with him, to his astonishment, turned their heads another way. At first Mynheer Van Kraus could hardly believe his senses, he who had always been so graciously received, who had been considered most truly as such a staunch supporter of his king, to be neglected, mortified in this way, and without cause. Instead of following His Majesty to his carriage with the rest of the authorities, he stood still and transfixed. The carriage drove off, and the syndic, hardly replying to some questions put to him, hurried back to his own house in a state of confusion and vexation almost indescribable. He hastened upstairs and entered the room of Ramsay, who was very busy with the dispatches which he had received. "'Well, Mynheer Van Kraus, how is His Majesty looking?' inquired Ramsay, who knew that the syndic had been down to receive him on his landing. Mynheer Kraus threw himself down in a chair, threw open his gown, and uttered a deep sigh. "'What is the matter, my dear sir? You appear ruffled,' continued Ramsay, who, from the extracts made by Van Slyperken from the dispatches, was aware that suspicions had been lodged against his host. "'Such treatment to one of his most devoted followers!' exclaimed Kraus at last who then entered into a detail of what had occurred. Such is the sweet aspect, the smile, we would aspire to of kings, Mynheer Kraus. But there must be some occasion for all this, observed the syndic. No doubt of it, replied Ramsay, some reason, but not a just one. That is certain, replied the syndic, Someone must have maligned me to his majesty. It may be, replied Ramsay, but there may be other causes. Kings are suspicious, and subjects may be too rich and too powerful. 
There are many paupers among the favorites of his majesty who would be very glad to see your property confiscated and you cast into prison. But, my dear sir, you forget also that the Jacobites are plotting and have been plotting for years, that conspiracy is formed upon conspiracy, and that when so surrounded and opposed, kings will be suspicious. But his majesty, King William, firmly attached and loyal as I am to my sovereign, Mynheer Krause, I do not think that King William is more to be relied upon than King James. Kings are but kings. They will repay the most important services by smiles and the least doubtful act with the gibbet. I agree with you that someone must have maligned you, but allow me to make a remark that if one suspicion or dislike enters into a royal breast, there is no effacing it. A complete verdict of innocence will not do it. It is like the sapping of one of the dams of this country, Mynheer Krause. The admission of water is but small at first, but it increases and increases till it ends in a general inundation. But I must demand an audience of His Majesty and explain. Explain? The very attempt will be considered as a proof of your guilt. No, no, as a sincere friend I should advise you to be quiet, and to take such steps as the case requires. That frown, that treatment of you in public, is sufficient to tell me that you must prepare for the event. Can you expect a king to publicly retract? Retract? No, I do not require a public apology from my sovereign. But if, having frowned upon you publicly, he again smiles upon you publicly, he does retract. He acknowledges that he was in error, and it becomes a public apology. God in heaven, that I am lost, replied the syndic, throwing himself back in his chair. Do you really think so, Mynheer Ramsay? I do not say that you are lost. At present you have only lost the favor of the king. But you can do without that, Mynheer Kraus. Do without that? But you do not know that without that I am lost. Am I not syndic of this town of Amsterdam? And can I expect to hold such an important situation if I am out of favor? Very true, Mynheer Kraus. But what can be done? You are assailed in the dark. You do not know the charges brought against you, and therefore cannot refute or parry them. But what charges can they bring against me? There can be but one charge against a person in your high situation, that of disaffection. Disaffection? I who am and have always been so devoted? The most disaffected generally appear the most devoted, Mynheer Kraus. That will not help you. My God, then, exclaimed Kraus with animation, what will, if loyalty is to be construed into a sign of disaffection? Nothing, replied Ramsay coolly. Suspicion in the heart of a king is never to be effaced, and disaffection may soon be magnified into high treason. Bless me, exclaimed Van Krause, crossing his hands on his heart in utter despair. My dear Mynheer Ramsay, will you give me your opinion how I should act? There is no saying how far you may be right in your conjectures, Mynheer Kraus, replied Ramsay. You may have been mistaken. No, no, he frowned. Look cross. I see his face now. Yes, but a little thing will sour the face of royalty. His corn may have pinched him. At the time he might have had a twinge in the bowels. His voyage may have affected him. He smiled upon others upon my friend Engelback very graciously. This was the very party who had prepared the charges against Kraus, his own very particular friend. Did he, replied Ramsay, then depend upon it, that's the very man who has belied you. What? Engelback? My particular friend? Yes, I should imagine so. Tell me, mynheer Kraus, 
I trust you have never entrusted to him the important secrets which I have made you acquainted with. For if you have, your knowledge of them would be quite sufficient. My knowledge of them? I really cannot understand that. How could my knowledge of what is going on among the king's friends and counsellors be a cause of suspicion? Why, Mynheer Krause, because the king is surrounded by many who are retained from policy and fear of them. If these secrets are made known, contrary to oath, is it not clear that the parties so revealing them must be no sincere friends of his majesty's? And will it not be naturally concluded that those who have possession of them are equally his own or secret enemies? But then, mynheer Ramsay, by that rule, you must be his majesty's enemy. That does not follow, mynheer Krause. I may obtain the secrets from those who are not so partial to his majesty as they are to me. But that does not disprove my loyalty. To expose them would, of course, render me liable to suspicion. But I guard them carefully. I have not told a word to a soul, but to you my dear mynheer Krause, and I have felt assured that you were much too loyal to make known to any one what it was your duty to your king to keep secret. Surely, mynheer Krause, you have not trusted that man? I may have given a hint or so. I'm afraid that I did. But he is my most particular friend. If that is the case, replied Ramsay, I am not at all surprised at the king's frowning on you. Engelback, having intelligence from you, supposed to be known only to the highest authorities, has thought it his duty to communicate it to government, and you are now suspected. God in heaven! I wish I never had your secrets, mynheer Ramsay. It appears then that I have committed treason without knowing it. At all events you have incurred suspicion. It is a pity that you mentioned what I confided to you, but what's done cannot be helped, and you must now be active. What must I, my dear friend? Expect the worst, and be prepared for it. You are wealthy, Mr. Van Krause, and that will not be in your favor. It will only hasten the explosion, which sooner or later will take place. Remit as much of your money as you can to where it will be secure from the spoilers. Convert all that you can into gold, that you may take advantage of the first opportunity, if necessary, of flying from their vengeance. Do all this very quietly. Go on as usual, as if nothing had occurred. Talk with your friend Engelback. Perform your duties as syndic. It may blow over, although I am afraid not. At all events, you will have, in all probability, some warning as they will displace you as syndic before they proceed further. I have only one thing to add. I am your guest, and depend upon it shall share your fortune, whatever it may be. If you are thrown into prison, I am certain to be sent there also. You may therefore command me as you please. I will not desert you, you may depend upon it. My dear young man, you are indeed a friend and your advice is good. My poor Wilhelmina, what would become of her? Yes, indeed, used to luxury, her father in prison, perhaps his head at the gates, his whole property confiscated, and all because he had the earliest intelligence. Such is the reward of loyalty. Yes, indeed, repeated the syndic. Put not your trust in princes, says the psalmist if such is to be the return for my loyalty. But there is no time to lose. I must send this post to Hamburg and Frankfurt. Many thanks, my dear friend, for your kind counsel, which I shall follow. So saying, Mynheer Krause went to his room, threw off his gown and chains in a passion, and hastened to his counting-house to write his important letters. We may now take this opportunity of informing the reader of what had occurred in the house of the syndic. Ramsay had, as may be supposed, gained the affections of Wilhelmina, had told his love, and received her acknowledgment in return. He had also gained such a power over her 
that she had agreed to conceal their attachment from her father. As Ramsay wished first, he asserted to be possessed of a certain property which he daily expected would fall to him, and until that he did not think that he had any right to aspire to the hand of Wilhelmina. That Ramsay was most seriously in love there was no doubt. He would have wedded Wilhelmina even if she had not a sixpence, but at the same time he was too well aware of the advantages of wealth not to fully appreciate it, and he felt the necessity and the justice to Wilhelmina that she should not be deprived by his means of those luxuries to which he had been brought up. But here there was a difficulty arising from his espousing the very opposite cause to that espoused by Mynheer Krauss, for the difference of religion he very rightly considered as a mere trifle compared with the difference in political feelings. He had already weaned Wilhelmina from the political bias imbibed from her father and his connections, without acquainting her with his belonging to the opposite party for the present. It had been his intention, as soon as his services were required elsewhere, to have demanded Wilhelmina's hand from her father, still leaving him in error as to his politics, and by taking her with him, after the marriage, to the court of St. Germain, to have allowed Mynheer Krauss to think what he pleased, but not to enter into any explanation. But as Ramsay truly observed, Mynheer Krauss had by his not retaining the secrets confided to him, rendered himself suspected, and once suspected with King William, his disgrace, if not ruin, was sure to follow. This fact, so important to Ramsay's plans, had been communicated in the extracts made by Vanslyperken from the last dispatches, and Ramsay had been calculating the consequences when Mynheer Krauss returned discomfited from the presence of the king. That Ramsay played a very diplomatic game in the conversation which we have repeated is true. But still it was the best game for Krauss as well as for his own interests, as the events will show. We must, however, remind the reader that Ramsay had no idea whatever of the double treachery on the part of Van Slyperken in copying all the letters sent by and to him, as well as extracting from the government dispatches. "'My dearest Edward, what has detained you so long from me this morning?' inquired Wilhelmina, when he entered the music-room, about an hour after his conversation with the syndic. Ramsay then entered into the detail of what had occurred, and wove in such remarks of his own as were calculated to disgust Wilhelmina with the conduct of King William, and to make her consider her father as an injured man. He informed her of the advice he had given him, and then pointed out to her the propriety of her enforcing his following it with all the arguments of persuasion in her power. Wilhelmina's indignation was roused, and she did not fail, when speaking with her father, to rail in no measured tones against the king, and to press him to quit a country where he had been so ill-used. Mynheer Krauss felt the same. His pride had been severely wounded, and it may be truly said that one of the staunchest adherents of the Protestant king was lost by a combination of circumstances as peculiar as they were unexpected. In the meantime, the corporal had gone on shore as usual, and made the widow acquainted with the last attempt upon Smallbones, and the revenge of the ship's company. Babette had also done her part. She had found out that Ramsay lived in the house of the syndic, and that he was the passenger brought over by Van Slyperken in the cutter. The widow, who had now almost arranged her plans, received Van Slyperken more amicably than ever, anathematized the supposed defunct smallbones, shed tears over the stump of Snarleyow, and asked Van Slyperken when he intended to give up the nasty cutter and live quietly on shore. End of chapter 41 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina
Chapter Forty Two of Snarleyow by Frederick Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In which is shown the imprudence of sleeping in the open air, even in a summer's night. The young Frau was not permitted to remain more than two days at her anchorage. On the third morning, Mr. Van Slyperken's signal was made to prepare to weigh. He immediately answered it, and giving his orders to Short, hastened as fast as he could up to the syndic's house to inform Ramsay, stating that he must immediately return on board again, and that the letters must be sent to him. Ramsay perceived the necessity of this, and consented. On his return to the boat, Mr. Van Slyperken found that his signal to repair on board the frigate had been hoisted, and he hastened on board to put on his uniform and obey this order. He received his dispatches from the captain of the frigate with orders to proceed to sea immediately. Mr. Van Slyperken, under the eye of his superior officer, could not dally or delay. He hove short, hoisted his mainsail, and fired a gun as a signal for sailing, anxiously looking out for Ramsay's boat with his letters, and afraid to go without them. But no boat made its appearance, and Mr. Van Slyperken was forced to heave up his anchor. Still, he did not like to make sail, and he remained a few minutes more, when he at last perceived a small boat coming off. At the same time he observed a boat coming from the frigate, and they arrived alongside the cutter about the same time, fortunately Ramsay's boat the first, and Mr. Van Slyperken had time to carry the letters down below. "'The Commandant wishes to know why you do not proceed to sea, sir, in obedience to your orders,' said the officer. "'I only waited for that boat to come on board, sir,' replied Van Slyperken to the lieutenant." "'And pray, sir, from whom does that boat come?' inquired the officer. "'From the syndic, Mynheer Van Krause,' replied Van Slyperken, not knowing what else to say, and thinking that the name of the syndic would be sufficient. "'And what did the boat bring off, to occasion the delay, sir?' "'A letter or two for England,' replied Van Slyperken. "'Very well, sir.' I wish you a good morning, said the lieutenant, who then went into his boat, and Van Slyperken made sail. The delay of the cutter to receive the syndic's letters was fully reported that same evening to the commandant, who, knowing that the syndic was suspected, reported the same to the authorities, and this trifling circumstance only increased the suspicions against the unfortunate Mynheer Van Kraus but we must follow the cutter and those on board of her. Smallbones had remained concealed on board, his wounds had been nearly healed, and it was now again proposed that he should, as soon as they were out at sea, make his appearance to frighten Van Slyperken, and that, immediately they arrived at Portsmouth, he should go on shore and desert from the cutter, as Mr. Van Slyperken would, of course, find out that his mother was killed, and the consequences to Smallbones must be dangerous, as he had no evidence if Van Slyperken swore that he had murdered his mother. But this arrangement was overthrown by events which we shall now narrate. It was on the third morning after they sailed that Van Slyperken walked the deck. There was no one but the man at the helm abaft. The weather was extremely sultry, for the cutter had run with a fair wind for the first eight and forty hours, and had then been becalmed for the last twenty-four, and had drifted to the back of the Isle of Wight, when she was not three leagues from St. Helens. The consequence was that the ebb tide had now drifted her down very nearly opposite to that part of the island where the cave was situated, of which we have made mention. Van Slyperken heard the people talking below, and, as usual, anxious to overhear what was said, had stopped to listen. He heard the name of Smallbones repeated several times, but could not make out what was said. 
Anxious to know, he went down the ladder, and, instead of going into his cabin, crept softly forward on the lower deck, when he overheard Cobble, Short, and Spurry in consultation. "'We shall be in to-morrow,' said Spurry, "'if a breeze springs up, and then it will be too late. Smallbones must frighten him again to-night.' "'Yes,' replied Short. "'He shall go into his cabin at twelve o'clock. That will be the best way.' "'But the corporal!' "'Hush! There is someone there,' said Spurry, who, attracted by a slight noise made by Van Slyperken's boots, turned short round. Van Slyperken retreated and gained the deck by the ladder. He had hardly been up when he observed a face at the hatchway, who was evidently looking to ascertain if he was on deck. These few words overheard satisfied Van Slyperken that Smallbones was alive and on board the cutter, and he perceived how he had been played with. His rage was excessive, but he did not know how to act. If Smallbones was alive, and that he appeared to be, he must have escaped from his mother, and, of course, the ship's company must know that his life had been attempted. That he did not care much about. He had not done the deed, but how the lad could have come on board? Did he not see him lying dead? It was very strange, and the life of the boy must be charmed. At all events it was a mystery which Mr. Van Slyperken could not solve. At first he thought that he would allow Smallbones to come into the cabin and get a loaded pistol ready for him. The words, but the corporal, which were cut short, proved to him that the corporal was no party to the affair, yet it was strange that the ship's company could have concealed the lad without the corporal's knowledge. Vanslyperken walked and walked and thought and thought. At last he resolved to go down into his cabin, pretend to go to sleep, lock his door, which was not his custom, and see if they would attempt to come in. He did so. The corporal was dismissed, and at twelve o'clock his door was tried and tried again. But being fast, the party retreated. Van Slyperken waited till two bells to ascertain if any more attempts would be made, but none were, so he rose from his bed, where he had thrown himself with his clothes on, and opening the door softly, crept upon deck. The night was very warm, but there was a light and increasing breeze and the cutter was standing in and close to the shore to make a long board upon the next tack. Van Slyperken passed the man at the helm and walked aft to the taffrail. He stood up on the choke to ascertain what way she was making through the water, and he was meditating upon the best method of proceeding. Had he known where Smallbone's hammock was hung, he would have gone down with the view of ascertaining the fact but with a crew so evidently opposed to him, he could not see how even the ascertaining that Smallbones was on board would be productive of any good consequences. The more Van Slyperken thought, the more he was puzzled. The fact is that he was between the horns of a dilemma. But the devil, who always helps his favorites, came to the aid of Mr. Van Slyperken. The small boat was, as usual, hoisted up astern, and Mr. Van Slyperken's eyes were accidentally cast upon it. He perceived a black mass lying on the thwarts, and he examined it more closely. He heard snoring. It was one of the ship's company sleeping there, against orders. He leant over the taffrail, and putting aside the greatcoat which covered the party, he looked attentively on the face. There was no doubt it was Smallbones himself. From a knowledge of the premises, Van Slyperken knew at once that the lad was in his power. The boat, after being hauled up with tackles, was hung by a single rope at each davit. It was very broad in proportion to its length, and was secured from motion by a single gripe, which confined it in its place, bowsing it close to the stern of the cutter, and preventing it from turning over bottom up, 
which, upon the least weight upon one gunwale or the other, would inevitably be the case. Smallbones was lying close to the gunwale next to the stern of the cutter. By letting go the gripe, therefore, the boat would immediately turn bottom up, and Smallbones would be dropped into the sea. Van Slyperken carefully examined the fastenings of the gripe, found that they were to be cast off by one movement, and that his success was certain, but still he was cautious. The man at the helm must hear the boat go over. He might hear Smallbones cry for assistance. So Van Slyperken went forward to the man at the helm, and desired him to go down and to order Corporal Van Spitter to mix a glass of brandy and water, and send it up by him, and that he would steer the vessel till he came up again. The man went down to execute the order, and Van Slyperken steered the cutter for half a minute, during which he looked forward to ascertain if any one was moving. All was safe, the watch was all asleep forward, and Van Slyperken, leaving the cutter to steer itself, hastened aft, cast off the gripe, the boat, as he calculated, immediately turning over, and the sleeping smallbones fell into the sea. Van Slyperken hastened back to the helm and put the cutter's head right. He heard the cry of smallbones, but it was not loud, for the cutter had already left him astern, and it was fainter and fainter, and at last it was heard no more, and that one of the watch had been disturbed. "'If ever you haunt me again,' muttered Van Slyperken, "'may I be hanged!' We particularly call the reader's attention to these words of Mr. Van Slyperken. The man returned with the brandy and water with which Van Slyperken drank Bon Voyage to poor Smallbones. He then ordered the cutter to be put about, and as soon as she was round he went down into his cabin and turned in with greater satisfaction than he had for a long time. "'We shall have got rid of him at last, my poor dog,' said he, patting Snarleyow's head. "'Your enemy is gone for ever.' And Mr. Vanslyperken slept soundly, because, although he had committed a murder, there was no chance of his being found out. We soon get accustomed to crime. Before, he started at the idea of murder. Now, all that he cared for was detection." Good night to you, Mr. Van Slyperken. End of chapter 42 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 43 of Snarleyow by Frederick Marriott This LibriVox recording is in the public domain in which Smallbones changes from a king's man into a smuggler, and also changes his sex. If we adhered to the usual plans of historical novel writers, we should in this instance leave Smallbones to what must appear to have been his inevitable fate, and then bring him on the stage again with a coup de théâtre, when least expected by the reader. But that is not our intention. We consider that the interest of this, our narration of bygone events, is quite sufficient without condescending to what is called claptrap. And there are so many people in our narrative continually laboring under deception of one kind or another that we need not add to it by attempting to mystify our readers, whom, on the contrary, we shall take with us familiarly by the hand, and, like a faithful historian, lead them through the events in the order in which they occurred, and point out to them how they all lead to one common end. With this intention in view, we shall now follow the fortunes of Smallbones, whom we left floundering in about seven fathoms water. The weather was warm, even sultry, as we said before, but notwithstanding which, and notwithstanding he was a very tolerable swimmer, considering that he was so thin, Smallbones did not like it. To be awoke out of a profound sleep, 
and all of a sudden to find yourself floundering out of your depth about half a mile from the nearest land is anything but agreeable. The transition is too rapid. Smallbones descended a few feet before he could divest himself of the folds of the flushing coat which he had wrapped himself up in. It belonged to Cobble. He had purchased it at a sale shop on the point for seventeen shillings and sixpence, and moreover it was as good as new. In consequence of this delay below watermark, Smallbones had very little breath left in his body when he rose to the surface, and he could not inflate his lungs so as to call loud until the cutter had walked away from him at least one hundred yards. For she was slipping fast through the water, and another minute plainly proved to Smallbones that he was left to his own resources. At first the lad had imagined that it was an accident, and that the rope had given way with his weight. But when he found that no attention was paid to his cries, he then was convinced that it was the work of Mr. Van Slyperken. "'By gum! He's a-done for me at last! Well, I don't care. I can die but once, that's certain sure. And he'll go to the devil, that's certain sure!' and Smallbones, with this comfortable assurance, continued to strike out for the land, which, indeed, he had but little prospect of ever making. A shame for to come for to go to murder a poor lad three or four times over, sputtered Smallbones, after a time, feeling his strength fail him. He then turned on his back to ease his arms. I can't do it nohow I sees that, said Smallbones, so I may as well go down like a dipsy lead. But as he muttered this, and was making up his mind to discontinue further exertions, not a very easy thing to do when you are about to go into another world, still floating on his back with his eyes fixed on the starry heavens, thinking, as Smallbones afterwards narrated himself, that there wasn't much to live for in this here world, and considering what there could be in that air, his head struck against something hard. Smallbones immediately turned round in the water to see what it was, and found that it was one of the large corks which supported a heavy net laid out across the tide for the taking of shoal fish. The cork was barely sufficient to support his weight, but it gave him a certain relief, and time to look about him, as the saying is, the lad ran under the net and cork with his hands until he arrived at the nearest shoal, for it was three or four hundred yards long. When he arrived there, he contrived to bring some of the corks together until he had quite sufficient for his support, and then Smallbones voted himself pretty comfortable after all, for the water was very warm and now quite smooth. Smallbones, as the reader may have observed during the narration, was a lad of most indisputable courage and of good principles. Had it been his fortune to have been born among the higher classes, and to have had all the advantages of education, he might have turned out a hero. As it was, he did his duty well in that state of life to which he had been called, and as he said in his speech to the men on the forecastle, he feared God honored the king, and was the natural enemy to the devil. The Chevalier Bayard was nothing more, only he had a wider field for his exertions and his talents. But the armed and accoutred Bayard did not show more courage and conduct when leading armies to victory than did the unarmed smallbones against Van Slyperken and his dog. We consider that, in his way, Smallbones was quite as great a hero as the Chevalier, for no man can do more than his best. Indeed, it is unreasonable to expect it. While Smallbones hung on to the corks, he was calculating his chances of being saved. If be as how they comes to take up the nets in the morning, why then I think I may hold on. But if so be they waits, why they'll find me dead as a fish said Smallbones, who seldom ventured above a monosyllable, and whose language, if not considered as pure English, 
was certainly amazingly Saxon. And then Smallbones began to reflect whether it was not necessary that he should forgive Mr. Van Slyperken before he died. And his pros and cons ended with his thinking he could, for it was his duty. However, he would not be in a hurry about it. He thought that was the last thing that he need do. But as for the dog, he warn't obliged to forgive him, that was certain. As certain as that his tail was off. And Smallbones, up to his chin in the water, grinned so at the remembrance that he took in more salt water than was pleasant. He spit it out again, and then looked up to the stars which were twinkling above him. I wonder what o'clock it is, thought Smallbones, when he thought he heard a distant sound. Smallbones pricked up his ears and listened. Yes, it was in regular cadence, and became louder and louder. It was a boat pulling. Well, I am sure, thought Smallbones, they'll think they have caught a queer fish anyhow. And he waited very patiently for the fisherman to come up. At last he perceived the boat, which was very long and pulled many oars. They be the smugglers, thought Smallbones. I wonder whether they'll pick up a poor lad. Boat ahoy! The boat continued to pass toward the coast, impelled at the speed of seven or eight miles an hour, and was now nearly abreast of Smallbones, and not fifty yards from him. I say, boat ahoy! screamed Smallbones, to the extent of his voice. He was heard this time, and there was a pause in the pulling. The boat still driving through the water with the impulse which had been given her, as if she required no propelling power. I say, you aren't a-going to come for to leave a poor lad here to be drowned, are you? That small bones, I'll swear, cried Jimmy Ducks, who was steering the boat, and who immediately shifted the helm. But Sir Robert Barclay paused. There was too much at stake to run any risk even to save the life of a fellow creature. "'You take your time for to think on it, anyhow,' cried Smallbones. "'You are going for to leave a fellow Christian stuck like a herring in a fishing net, are you? You would not like it yourselves, anyhow.' "'It is Smallbones, sir,' repeated Jemmy Ducks, "'and I'll vouch for him as a lad that's good and true.' Sir Robert no longer hesitated. Give way, my lads, and pick him up. In a few minutes Smallbones was hauled in over the gunwale, and was seated on the stern sheets opposite to Sir Robert. It's a great deal colder out of the water than in, that's certain, observed Smallbones, shivering. Give way, my lads, we've no time to stay, cried Sir Robert. Take this, Smallbones, said Jemmy. "'Why, so it's Jimmy Ducks,' replied Smallbones, with astonishment. "'Why, how did you come here?' "'Circumstances,' replied Jemmy. "'How did you come here?' "'Circumstances, too, Jemmy,' replied Smallbones. "'Keep silence,' said Sir Robert, and nothing more was said until the lugger dashed into the cave. The cargo was landed, and Smallbones, who was very cold, was not sorry to assist. He carried up his load with the rest, and as usual the women came halfway down to receive it. "'Why, who have we here?' said one of the women, to whom Smallbones was delivering his load. "'Why, it's Smallbones!' "'Yes,' replied Smallbones, "'it is me. But how came you here, Nancy?' "'That's tellings. But how came you, my lad?' replied Nancy." I came by water, anyhow. Well, you are one of us now. You know there's no going back. I'm sure I don't want to go back, Nancy. But what is to be done? Nothing unchristian like, I hope. We're all good Christians here, Smallbones. We don't bow down to idols and pay duty to them as other people do. Do you fear God and honor the king? We do the first as much as other people, and, as for the king, we love him and serve him faithfully. Well, then, I suppose that's all right, replied Smallbones. 
but where do you live come with me and take your load up and i will show you for the sooner you are there the better the boat will be off again in half an hour if i mistake not off where to france with a message to the king why the king's in holland we left him there when we sailed pooh nonsense come along when sir robert arrived at the cave he found an old friend anxiously awaiting his arrival it was graham who had been dispatched by the jacobites to the court of st germain with intelligence of great importance which was the death of the young duke of gloucester the only surviving son of king william he had it was said died of a malignant fever but if the reader will call to mind the address of one of the jesuits on the meeting at cherbourg he may have some surmises as to the cause of the duke's decease as this event rendered the succession uncertain the hopes of the jacobites were raised to the highest pitch the more so as the country was in a state of anxiety and confusion and king william was absent at the hague graham had therefore been dispatched to the exile james with the propositions from his friends in england and to press the necessity of an invasion of the country as nancy had supposed sir robert decided upon immediately crossing over to cherbourg the crew were allowed a short time to repose and refresh themselves and once more returned to their laborious employment jemmy duck satisfied sir robert that smallbones might be trusted and be useful and nancy corroborated his assertions he was therefore allowed to remain in the cave with the women and sir robert and his crew long before smallbones garments were dry were again crossing the english channel now it must be observed that smallbones was never well off for clothes and on this occasion when he fell overboard he had nothing on but an old pair of thin linen trousers and a shirt which from dint of long washing from check had turned to a light cerulean blue what with his struggles at the net and the force used to pull him into the boat the shirt had more than one half disappeared that is to say one sleeve and the back were wholly gone and the other sleeve was well prepared to follow its fellow on the first capful of wind his trousers also were in almost as bad a state in hauling him in when his head was over the gunwale one of the men had seized him by the seat of his trousers to lift him into the boat and the consequence was that the seat of his trousers having been too long sat upon was also left in his muscular grip all these items put together the reader may infer that although smallbones might appear merely ragged in front in his rear he could not be considered as decent especially as he was the only one of the masculine sex among a body of females no notice was taken of this by others nor did smallbones observe it himself during the confusion and bustle previous to the departure of the smugglers but now they were gone smallbones perceived his deficiencies and was very much at a loss what to do as he was well aware that daylight would discover them to others as well as to himself so he fixed his back up against one of the rocks and remained idle while the women were busily employed storing away the cargo in the various compartments of the cave nancy who had not forgotten that he was with them came up to him why do you stay there smallbones you must be hungry and cold come in with me and i will find you something to eat i can't mistress nancy i want your advice first has any of the men left any of their duds in this here cavern duds men no they keep them all on the other side we have nothing but petticoats here and shimmies then what must i do exclaimed smallbones oh i see your shirt is torn off your back well never mind i'll lend you a shimmy yes mistress nancy but it be more worse than that i ain't got no behind to my trousers they pulled it out when they pulled me into the boat i sticks to this here rock for decency's sake what must i do 
Nancy burst into a laugh. Do? Why, if you can't have men's clothes, you must put on the women's, and then you'll be in the regular uniform of the cave. I do suppose that I must, but I can't say that I like the idea much anyhow, replied Smallbones. Why, you don't mean to stick to that rock like a limpet all your life, do you? There's plenty of work for you. If so be I must, I must, replied Smallbones. You can't appear before Mistress Alice in that state, replied Nancy. She's a lady bred and born, and very particular, too. And then there's Miss Lily. You will turn her as red as a rose if she sees you. Well, then, I suppose I must, Mistress Nancy, for I shall catch my death of cold here. I'm all wet and shivery from being so long in the water, and my back against the rock feels just as ice. No wonder. I'll run and fetch you something, replied Nancy, who was delighted at the idea of dressing up Smallbones as a woman. Nancy soon returned with a chemise, a short flannel petticoat, and a shawl, which she gave to Smallbones, desiring him to take off his wet clothes and substitute them. She would return to him as soon as he had put them on, and see that they were put tidy and right. Smallbones retired behind one of the rocks, and soon shifted his clothes. He put everything on the hind part before, and Nancy had to alter them when she came. She adjusted the shawl, and then led him into the cave, where he found Mistress Alice and some of the women who were not busy with the cargo. "'Here's the poor lad who was thrown overboard, madam,' said Nancy, retaining her gravity. "'All his clothes were torn off his back, and I have been obliged to give him these to put on.' Lady Ramsay could hardly repress a smile. Smallbone's appearance was that of a tall, gaunt creature, pale enough and smooth enough to be a woman, certainly, but cutting a most ridiculous figure. His long, thin arms were bare, his neck was like a crane's, and the petticoats were so short as to reach almost above his knees. Shoes and stockings he had none. His long hair was plaited and matted with the salt water, and one side of his head was shaved and exhibited a monstrous half-heeled scar. Lady Ramsay asked him a few questions, and then desired Nancy to give him some refreshment, and find him something to lie down upon in the division of the cave which was used as a kitchen. But we must now leave Smallbones to entertain the inhabitants of the cave with the history of his adventures, which he did at intervals during his stay there. He retained his women's clothes, for Nancy would not let him wear any other, and was a source of great amusement, not only to the smugglers' wives, but also to little Lily, who would listen to his conversation and remarks, which were almost as naive and unsophisticated as her own. End of chapter 43 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 44 of Snarleyow by Frederick Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In which Mr. Van Slyperken meets with a double defeat. It was late in the evening of the day after Smallbones had been so satisfactorily disposed of that the cutter arrived at Portsmouth. But from daylight until the time that the cutter anchored, there was no small confusion and bustle on board of the Jungfrau. When Van Slyperken's cabin door was found to be locked, it was determined that Smallbones should not appear as a supernatural visitant that night, but wait till the one following. Consequently, the parties retired to bed, and Smallbones, who found the heat between decks very oppressive, had crept up the ladder and taken a berth in the small boat that he might sleep cool and comfortable, intending to be down below again long before Mr. Van Slyperken was up. But, as the reader knows, Mr. Van Slyperken was up before him, and the consequence was that Smallbones went down into the sea, instead of the lower deck, as he had intended. The next morning it was soon ascertained that Smallbones was not to be found. 
and the ship's company were in a state of dismay. The boat, as soon as Smallbones had been turned out, had resumed her upright position, and one of the men, when busy washing the decks, had made fast the gripe again, which he supposed had been cast off by accident when the ropes had been coiled up for washing, Smallbones not being at that time missed. When, therefore, the decks had been searched everywhere, and the lad was discovered not to be in the ship, the suspicion was very great. No one had seen him go aft to sleep in the boat. The man who was at the wheel stated that Mr. Van Slyperken had sent him down for a glass of grog, and had taken the helm for a time, but this proved nothing. His disappearance was a mystery not to be unraveled. An appeal to Mr. Van Slyperken was, of course, impossible, for he did not know that the lad was on board. The whole day was spent in surmises and suppositions, but things all ended in the simple fact that somehow or another Smallbones had fallen overboard, and there was an end of the poor fellow. So soon as the cutter was at anchor, Mr. Van Slyperken hastened to perform his official duties, and, anxious to learn how Smallbones had contrived to escape the clutches of his mother, bent his steps toward the halfway houses. He arrived at the door of his mother's room, and knocked as usual, but there was no reply. It was now the latter end of July, and although it was past seven o'clock, it was still daylight. Van Slyperken knocked again and again. His mother must be out, he thought and if so she always took the key with her. He had nothing to do but to wait for her return. The passage and staircase were dark, but there was a broad light in the room from the casement, and this light streamed from under the door of the room. A shade crossing the light attracted Van Slyperken's attention, and to while away the tediousness of waiting he was curious to see what it was. He knelt down, looked under the door, and perceived the key which Smallbones had placed there. He inserted his finger and drew it forth, imagining that his mother had slid it beneath till her return. He fitted it to the lock and opened the door, when his olfactory nerves were offended with a dreadful stench, which surprised him the more as the casement was open. Van Slyperken surveyed the room. He perceived that the blood had been washed from the floor and sand strewed over it. Had he not known that Smallbones had been on board of the cutter the day before, he would have thought that it had been the smell of the dead body not yet removed. This thought crossing his imagination immediately made the truth flash upon him, and, as if instinctively, he went up to the bed and pulled down the clothes when he recoiled back with horror at uncovering the face of his mother, now of a livid blue and in the last stage of putrefaction. Overcome with the horrid sight and the dreadful stench which accompanied it, he reeled to the casement and gasped for breath. A sickness came over him, and for some time he was incapable of acting and barely capable of reflection. "'She is gone, then!' thought he at last, and he shuddered when he asked himself, where? She must have fallen by the hands of the lad, continued he, and immediately the whole that had happened appeared to be revealed to him. Yes, he has recovered from the blow, killed her, and locked the door. All is clear now, but I have revenged her death. Van Slyperken, who had now recovered himself, went softly to the door, took out the key, and locked himself in. He had been debating in his mind whether he should call in the neighbors, but on reflection, as no one had seen him enter, he determined that he would not. He would take his gold and leave the door locked and the key under it, as he found it, before her death was discovered. It would be supposed that she died a natural death, for the state of the body would render it impossible to prove the contrary. But there was one act necessary to be performed at which Van Slyperken's heart recoiled. The key of the oak chest was about his mother's person, and he must obtain it. 
he must search for it in corruption and death amongst creeping worms and noisome stench. It was half an hour before he could make up his mind to the task, but what will avarice not accomplish? He covered up the face, and with a trembling hand turned over the bedclothes. But we must not disgust our readers. It will suffice to say that the key was obtained, and the chest opened. Van Slyperken found all his own gold, and much more than he had ever expected belonging to his mother. There were other articles belonging to him, but he thought it prudent not to touch them. He loaded himself with the treasure, and when he felt that it was all secure, for he was obliged to divide it in different parcels, and stow it in various manners about his person, he relocked the chest, placed the key in the cupboard, and quitting the room made fast the door, and, like a dutiful son, left the remains of his mother to be inhumed at the expense of the parish. As he left the house without being observed and gained the town of Portsmouth, never was Mr. Van Slyperken's body so heavily loaded or his heart lighter. He had got rid of Smallbones and of his mother, both in a way perfectly satisfactory to himself. He had recovered his own gold, and had also been enriched beyond his hopes by his mother's savings. He felt not the weight which he carried about his person. He wished it had been heavier. All he felt was very anxious to be on board and have his property secured. His boat waited for him, and one of the men informed him his presence was required at the Admiral's immediately. But Mr. Vanslyperken first went on board, and having safely locked up all his treasures, then complied with the Admiral's wishes. They were to sail immediately, for the intelligence of the Duke of Gloucester's death had just arrived, with the dispatches announcing the same to be taken to King William, who was still at the Hague. Vanslyperken sent the boat on board, with orders to short to heave short and loose sails, and then hastened up to the house of Lazarus the Jew, aware that the cutter would, in all probability, be dispatched immediately to the Hague. The Jew had the letters for Ramsay all prepared. Van Slyperken once more touched his liberal fee, and in an hour he was again under way for the Texel. During the passage, which was very quick, Mr. Van Slyperken amused himself as usual in copying the letters to Ramsay, which contained the most important intelligence of the projects of the Jacobites, and from the various communications between Ramsay and the conspirators, Van Slyperken had also been made acquainted with the circumstance, hitherto unknown to him, of the existence of the caves above the cove, where he had been taken to by the informer, as mentioned in the earlier part of this work, and also of the names of the parties who visited it. Of this intelligence Van Slyperken determined to avail himself by and by. It was evident that there were only women in the cave, and Mr. Van Slyperken counted his gold, patted the head of Snarleyow, and indulged in anticipations of further wealth and the hand of the widow Vandersloosh. All dreams, Mr. Van Slyperken. The cutter arrived, and he landed with his dispatches for the government, and his letters to Ramsay being all delivered, Van Slyperken hastened to the widows, who, as usual, received him all smiles. He now confided to her the death of his mother, and astonished her by representing the amount of his wealth, which he had the precaution to state that the major part of it was left him by his mother. "'Where have you put it all, Mr. Vanslyperken?' inquired the widow. And Vanslyperken replied that he had come to ask her advice on the subject, as it was at present all on board of the cutter. The widow, who was not indifferent to money, was more gracious than ever. She had a scheme in her head of persuading him to leave the money under her charge. But Van Slyperken was anxious to go on board again, for he discovered that the key was not in his pocket, and he was fearful that he might have left it on the cabin table. So he quitted rather abruptly, 
and the widow had not time to bring the battery to bear. As soon as Mr. Vanslyperken arrived on board, Corporal Van Spitter, without asking leave, for he felt it was not necessary, went on shore, and was soon in the arms of his enamored widow Vandersloosh. In the meantime Mr. Vanslyperken discovered the key in the pocket of the waistcoat he had thrown off, and, having locked his door, he again opened his drawer, and delighted himself for an hour or two in rearranging his treasure. After which, feeling himself in want of occupation, it occurred to him that he might as well dedicate a little more time to the widow, so he manned his boat and went on shore again. It is all very well to have a morning and afternoon lover, if ladies are so inclined, just as they have a morning and afternoon dress, but they should be worn separately. Now, as it never entered the head of Mr. Van Slyperken that the corporal was playing him false, so did it never enter the head of the widow that Mr. Van Slyperken would make his appearance in the evening, and leave the cutter and Snarleyow without the corporal being on board to watch over them. But Mr. Van Slyperken did leave the cutter and Snarleyow, did come on shore, did walk to the widow's house, and did most unexpectedly enter it, and what was the consequence? That he was not perceived when he entered it, and the door of the parlor as well as the front door being open to admit air, for the widow and the corporal found that making love in the dog days was rather warm work for people of their caliber. To his mortification and rage, the lieutenant beheld the corporal, seated in his berth on the little fubsy sofa, with one arm round the widow's waist, his other hand joined to hers, and pro pudor sucking at her dewy lips like some huge carp under the water lilies on a midsummer's afternoon. Mr. Van Slyperken was transfixed. The parties were too busy with their amorous interchange to perceive his presence. At last the corporal thought that his lips required moistening with a little of the beer of the widow's own brewing, for the honey of her lips had rather glued them together. He turned toward the table to take up his tumbler, and he beheld Mr. Van Slyperken. The corporal for a moment was equally transfixed but on these occasions people act mechanically because they don't know what to do. The corporal had been well drilled. He rose from the sofa, held himself perfectly upright, and raised the back of his right hand to his forehead. There he stood like a statue, saluting at the presence of his superior officer. The widow had also perceived the presence of Van Slyperken almost as soon as the corporal, but a woman's wits are more at her command on these occasions than a man's. She felt that all concealment was now useless, and she prepared for action. At the same time, although ready to discharge a volley of abuse upon Van Slyperken, she paused to ascertain how she should proceed. Assuming an indifferent air, she said, "'Well, Mr. Van Slyperken?' "'Well?' exclaimed Van Slyperken but he could not speak for passion. "'Eavesdropping as usual, Mr. Van Slyperken?' "'May the roof of this house drop on you, you infernal—' "'No indelicate language, if you please, sir,' interrupted the widow. "'I won't put up with it in my house, I can tell you. "'Ho, ho, Mr. Van Slyperken,' continued the widow, working herself into a rage. "'That won't do here, Mr. Van Slyperken.' "'Why, you audacious, you double-faced!' "'Double-faced? It's a pity you weren't double-faced, as you call it, with that sniveling nose and crooked chin of yours. Double-faced! Ha! <laughs> oh, oh, Mr. Van Slyperken! We shall see. Wait a little. We shall see who's double-faced. Yes, yes, Mr. Van Slyperken. That for you, Mr. Van Slyperken. I can hang you when I please, Mr. Van Slyperken.' "'Corporal, how many guineas did you see counted out to him at that house opposite?' During all this the corporal remained fixed and immovable, with his hand up to the salute. But on being questioned by his mistress, he replied, remaining in the same respectful attitude. Fifty golden guineas, Mistress Vandersloosh!' 
a lie, an infamous lie, cried Vanslyperken, drawing his sword. Traitor that you are, continued he to the corporal, take your reward. This was a very critical moment. The corporal did not attempt the defensive, but remained in the same attitude, and Vanslyperken's rage at the falsehood of the widow and the discovery of his treason was so great that he had lost all command of himself. Had not a third party come in just as Vanslyperken drew his sword, it might have gone hard with the corporal. But fortunately Babette came in from the yard, and perceiving the sword fly out of the scabbard, she put her hand behind the door and snatched two long-handled brooms, one of which she put into the hands of her mistress and retained the other herself. "'Take your reward!' cried Van Slyperken, running furiously to cut down the corporal. But his career was stopped by the two brooms, one of which took him in the face and the other in the chest. The widow and Babette now ranged side by side held their brooms as soldiers do their arms in a charge of bayonets. How did the corporal act? He retained his former respectful position, leaving the defensive or offensive in the hands of the widow and Babette. The check on the part of Van Slyperken only added to his rage. Again he flew with his sword at the corporal, and again was met with the besoms in his face. He caught one with his hand, and he was knocked back with the other. He attempted to cut them in two with his sword, but in vain. "'Out of my house, you villain! You traitor! Out of my house!' cried the widow, pushing at him with such force as to drive him against the wall, and pinning him there while Babette charged him in his face, which was now streaming with blood. The attack was now followed up with such vigor that Van Slyperken was first obliged to retreat to the door, then out of the door into the street. Followed into the street he took to his heels, and the widow and Babette returned victorious into the parlor to the corporal. Mr. Van Slyperken could not accuse him of want of respect to his superior officer. He had saluted him on entering, and he was still saluting him when he made his exit. The widow threw herself on the sofa. Corporal Van Spitter then took his seat beside her. The widow, overcome by her rage and exertion, burst into tears and sobbed in his arms. The corporal poured out a glass of beer and persuaded her to drink it. "'I'll have him hanged to-morrow, at all events. I'll go to the Hague myself,' cried the widow. "'Yes, yes, Mr. Van Slyperken. We shall see who will gain the day.' continued the widow, sobbing. "'You can prove it, Corporal?' "'My God, yes,' replied the Corporal. "'As soon as he's hung, Corporal, we'll marry.' "'My God, yes.' "'Traitorous villain! Sell his king and his country for gold?' "'My God, yes.' "'You're sure it was fifty guineas, Corporal?' "'My God, yes.' Ah, well, Mr. Van Slyperken, we shall see, said the widow, drying her eyes. Yes, yes, Mr. Van Slyperken, you shall be hanged, and your cur with you, or my name's not Vandersloosh. My God, yes, replied the corporal. End of chapter 44 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter forty five of Snarleyow by Frederick Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In which Mr. Van Slyperken proves his loyalty and his fidelity to King William. Mr. Van Slyperken hastened from his inglorious conflict, maddened with rage and disappointment. He returned on board, went down into his cabin, and threw himself on his bed. His hopes and calculations had been so brilliant, rid of his enemy Smallbones, with gold in possession, and more in prospect, to be so cruelly deceived by the widow, the cockatrice. Then, by one to whom he fully confided, and who knew too many of his secrets already, Corporal Van Spitter. He, too. 
and to dare to aspire to the widow? It was madness. And then their knowledge of his treason, the corporal having witnessed his receiving the gold. With such bitter enemies, what could he expect but a halter? He felt it even now round his neck, and Vanslyperken groaned in the bitterness of his spirit. In the meantime there was a consultation between the widow and the corporal as to the best method of proceeding. That the corporal could expect nothing but the most determined hostility from Vanslyperken was certain. But for this the corporal cared little, as he had all the crew of the cutter on his side, and he was in his own person too high in rank to be at the mercy of Van Slyperken. After many pros and cons, and at least a dozen bottles of beer, for the excitement on the part of the corporal and the exertion of the widow had made them both dry, it was resolved that the Frau Vandersloosh should demand an audience at the Hague the next morning, and should communicate the treasonable practices of Mr. Van Slyperken calling upon the corporal as a witness to the receipt of the money from the Jesuit. "'Mein Gott!' exclaimed the corporal, striking his bull forehead, as if a new thought had required being forced out. "'But they will ask me how I came there myself, and what shall I say?' "'Say that the Jesuit father had sent for you to try and seduce you to do his treason, but that you would not consent.' "'Mein Gott, yes, that will do.' The corporal then returned on board, but did not think it worth while to report himself to Mr. Van Slyperken. Mr. Van Slyperken had also been thinking over the matter, and in what way he should be able to escape from the toils prepared for him. That the widow would immediately inform the authorities he was convinced. How was he to get out of his scrape?' Upon mature reflection he decided that it was to be done. He had copies of all Ramsay's letters, and those addressed to Ramsay, and the last delivered were very important. Now his best plan would be to set off for The Hague early the next morning, demand an interview with one of the ministers, or even His Majesty himself, state that he had been offered money from the Jacobite party to carry their letters, and that, with a view to serve his majesty by finding out their secrets, he had consented to do it, and had taken the money to satisfy them that he was sincere. That he had opened the letters and copied them, and that now, as the contents were important, he had thought it right to make them immediately known to the government, and at the same time to bring the money received for the service to be placed at his majesty's disposal. Whether she is before or after me, thought Van Slyperken, it will then be little matter. All I shall have to fear will be from Ramsay and his party, but the government will be bound to protect me. There certainly was much wisdom in this plan of Van Slyperken. It was the only one which could have been attended with success, or with any chance of it. Mr. Van Slyperken was up at daylight and dressed in his best uniform. He put in his pocket all the copies of the Jacobite correspondence, and went on shore, hired a calash, for he did not know how to ride, and set off for the Hague, where he arrived at about ten o'clock. He sent up his name and requested an audience with the Duke of Portland, as an officer commanding one of His Majesty's vessels. He was immediately admitted. "'What is your pleasure, Mr. Van Slyperken?' said the Duke, who was standing at the table in company with Lord Albemarle. Van Slyperken was a little confused. He muttered and stammered about anxiety and loyalty and fidelity and excess of zeal, etc. No wonder he stammered, for he was talking of what he knew nothing about. But these two noblemen, recollecting his confusion when presented to his sovereign on board of the frigate, made allowances. "'I have at last,' cried Van Slyperken with more confidence, "'been able to discover the plots of the Jacobites, Your Grace.' "'Indeed, Mr. Van Slyperken,' replied the Duke, smiling incredulously, 
And pray, what may they be? You must be as expeditious as possible, for His Majesty is waiting for us. These letters will take some time to read, replied Van Slyperken, but their contents are most important. Indeed, letters? How have you possession of their letters? It will be rather a long story, sir, my lord, I mean, replied Van Slyperken, but they will amply repay an hour of your time if you can spare it. At this moment the door opened, and His Majesty entered the room. At the sight of the king, Vanslyperken's confidence was again taking French leave. "'My lords, I am waiting for you,' said the king, with a little asperity of manner. "'May it please your majesty, here is Lieutenant Vanslyperken, commanding one of your majesty's vessels, who states that he has important intelligence, and that he has possession of Jacobite papers.' "'Indeed,' replied King William, who was always alive to Jacobite plotting, from which he had already run so much risk. "'What is it, Mr. Van Slyperken? Speak boldly. What have you to communicate?' "'Your Majesty, I beg your gracious pardon, but here are copies of the correspondence carried on by the traitors in England and this country. If your Majesty will deign to have it read, you will then perceive how important it is. After your Majesty has read it, I will have the honor to explain to you by what means it came into my possession. King William was a man of business, and Van Slyperken had done wisely in making this proposal. His Majesty at once sat down, with the Duke of Portland on one side and Lord Albemarle on the other. The latter took the letters which were arranged according to their dates and read them in a clear, distinct voice. As the reading went on, His Majesty made memorandums and notes with his pencil on a sheet of paper, but did not interrupt during the whole progress of the lecture. When the last and most important was finished, the two noblemen looked at His Majesty with countenances full of meaning. For a few moments His Majesty drummed with the second and third finger of his left hand upon the table, and then said, Pray, Mr. Van Slyperken, how did you obtain possession of these papers and letters, or make copies of these letters? Van Slyperken, who had been standing at the other side of the table during the time of the reading, had anxiously watched the countenance of His Majesty and the two noblemen, and perceived that the intelligence which the letters contained had created a strong feeling, as he expected. With a certain degree of confidence, he commenced his explanation. He stated that the crew of the cutter had been accustomed to frequent the lust house of a certain widow Vandersloosh, and that he had made her acquaintance by several times going there to look after his seamen. That this widow had often hinted to him, and at last proposed to him, that he should take letters for some friends of hers, At last she had told him plainly that it was for the Jacobite party, and he pretended to consent. That he had been taken by her to the house of a Jesuit, 169, in the Burr Street, nearly opposite to her Lust House, and that the Jesuit had given him some letters and fifty guineas for his trouble. He then stated that he had opened, copied, and resealed them. Further, that he had brought over one of the Confederates, who was now residing in the house of the syndic, Van Kraus. That he should have made all this known before, only that he waited till it was more important. That the last letters appeared of such consequence that he deemed it his duty no longer to delay. "'You have done well, Mr. Van Slyperken,' replied His Majesty. "'And played a bold game,' observed Lord Albemarle, fixing his eyes upon Van Slyperken, Suppose you had been found out cooperating with the traitors before you made this discovery. I might have forfeited my life in my zeal, replied Mr. Van Slyperken with adroitness, but that is the duty of a king's officer. That is well said, observed the Duke of Portland. I have a few questions to put to you, Mr. Van Slyperken, observed His Majesty. What is the cave they mention so often? It is on the bank of the Isle of Wight, Your Majesty, 
I did not know of its existence but from the letters, but I once lay a whole night in the cove underneath it, to intercept the smugglers, upon information that I had received, but the alarm was given, and they escaped. Who is their agent at Portsmouth? A Jew of the name of Lazarus, residing in Little Orange Street, at the back of the point, your majesty. Do you know of any of the names of the conspirators? I do not, your majesty, except a woman who is very active, one Moggy Salisbury. Her husband, not a month back, was the boatswain of the cutter, but by some interest or another he has obtained his discharge. My lord of Portland, take a memorandum to inquire who it was applied for the discharge of that man. Mr. Vanslyperken, you may retire. We will call you in by and by. You will be secret as to what has passed. I have one more duty to perform, replied Vanslyperken, taking some rouleaus of gold out of his pocket. This is the money received from the traders. It is not for a king's officer to have it in his possession. You are right, Mr. Vanslyperken, but the gold of traders is forfeited to the crown, and it is now mine. You will accept it as a present from your king. Mr. Vanslyperken took the gold from the table, made a bow, and retired from the royal presence. The reader will acknowledge that it was impossible to play his cards better than Mr. Vanslyperken had done in this interview, and that he deserved a great credit for his astute conduct. With such diplomatic talents he would have made a great prime minister. The council was ordered at twelve o'clock, my lords. These letters must be produced. That they are genuine appears to me beyond a doubt. That they are faithful copies, I doubt not, replied Lord Albemarle, but... But what, my Lord Albemarle? I very much suspect the fidelity of the copier. There is something more that has not been told, depend upon it. Why do you think so, my Lord? Because, Your Majesty, allowing that a man would act the part that Mr. Van Slyperken says that he has done to discover the conspiracy, still, would he not naturally, to avoid any risk to himself, have furnished government with the first correspondence, and obtain their sanction for prosecuting his plans? This officer has been employed for the last two years or more in carrying the dispatches to the Hague and it must at once strike your majesty that a person who can, with such dexterity, open the letters of others, can also open those of his own government. That is true, my lord, replied his majesty, musing. Your majesty is well aware that suspicions were entertained of the fidelity of the syndic, suspicions which the evidence of this officer have verified. But why were these suspicions raised? because he knew of the government's secrets, and it was supposed that he obtained them from someone who is in our trust, but inimical to us, and unworthy of the confidence reposed in him. Your Majesty's acuteness will at once perceive that the secrets may have been obtained by Meinherr Kraus by the same means as have been resorted to to obtain the secrets of the conspirators. I may be in error, and if I do this officer wrong by my suspicions, may God forgive me, but there is something in his looks which tells me, what, my lord, that he is a traitor to both parties, may it please your majesty. By the lord, Albemarle, I think you have hit upon the truth, replied the Duke of Portland. Of that we shall soon have proof. At present we have to decide whether it be advisable to employ him to discover more, or at once to seize upon the parties he has denounced but that had better be canvassed in the council chamber. Come, my lords, they be waiting for us. The affair was of too great importance not to absorb all other business, and it was decided that the house of Mynheer Kraus and of the Jesuit and the widow Vandersloosh should be entered by the peace officers at midnight, and that they and any of the conspirators who might be found should be thrown into prison that the cutter should be dispatched immediately to England, 
with orders to seize all the other parties informed against by Vanslyperken, and that a force should be sent to attack the cave, and secure those who might be found there, with directions to the admiral that Vanslyperken should be employed both as a guide and to give the assistance of the cutter and his crew. These arrangements having been made, the council broke up. King William had a conference with his two favorites, and Vanslyperken was sent for. Lieutenant Vanslyperken, we feel much indebted to you for your important communications, and we shall not forget, in due time, to reward your zeal and loyalty as it deserves. At present it is necessary that you sail for England as soon as our dispatches are ready, which will be before midnight. You will then receive your orders from the Admiral at Portsmouth, and I have no doubt you will take the opportunity of affording us fresh proofs of your fidelity and attachment. Mr. Vanslyperken bowed humbly and retired, delighted with the successful result of his maneuver, and with a gay heart he leapt into his calash and drove off. Yes, yes, thought he, Madame Vandersloosh, you would betray me? We shall see. Yes, yes, we shall see, Madame Vandersloosh. And sure enough he did see Madame Vandersloosh, who, in another calash, was driving to the palace, and who met him face to face. Van Slyperken turned up his nose at her as he passed by, and the widow, astonished at his presumption, thought, as she went on her way, "'Well, well, Mr. Van Slyperken, we shall see. You may turn up your sniveling nose, but stop till your head's in the halter.' "'Yes, Mr. Van Slyperken, stop till your head's in the halter.' We must leave Mr. Van Slyperken to drive, and the widow Vandersloosh to drive, while we drive on ourselves. The subsequent events of this eventful day we will narrate in the following chapter. End of chapter 45 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 46 of Snarleyow by Frederick Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In which there is much bustle and confusion, plot and counterplot. About two hours after the council had broken up, the following communication was delivered into the hands of Ramsay by an old woman, who immediately took her departure. The lieutenant of the cutter has taken copies of all your correspondence and betrayed you. You must fly immediately, as at midnight you and all of you will be seized. In justice to Mynheer Kraus, leave documents to clear him. The cutter will sail this evening, with orders to secure your friends at Portsmouth and the cave. Now by the holy cross of our Saviour, I will have revenge upon that dastard. There is no time to lose. Five minutes for reflection, and then to act, thought Ramsay, as he twisted up this timely notice, which, it must be evident to the reader, must have been sent by one who had been summoned to the council. Ramsay's plans were soon formed. He dispatched a trusty messenger to the Jesuits, desiring him to communicate immediately with the others, and upon what plan to proceed. He then wrote a note to Van Slyperken, requesting his immediate presence, and hastened to the morning apartment of Wilhelmina. In a few words he told her that he had received timely notice that it was the intention of the government to seize her father and him as suspected traitors, and throw them that very night in prison. Wilhelmina made no reply. For your father, my dearest girl, there is no fear. He will be fully acquitted. But I, Wilhelmina, must part immediately, or my life is forfeited. Leave me, Edward, replied Wilhelmina. No, you must go with me, Wilhelmina, for more than one reason. The government have ordered the seizure of the persons to be made in the night to avoid a disturbance. 
but that they will not be able to prevent. The mob are but too happy to prove their loyalty when they can do so by rapine and plunder, and depend upon it that this house will be sacked and leveled to the ground before tomorrow evening. You cannot go to prison with your father. You cannot remain here to be at the mercy of an infuriated and lawless mob. You must go with me, Wilhelmina. Trust to me, not only for my sake, but for your father's. My father's, Edward? It is that only I am thinking of. How can I leave my father at such a time? You will save your father by so doing. Your departure with me will substantiate his innocence. Decide, my dearest girl, decide at once. You must either fly with me, or we must part for ever. Oh, no, that must not be, Edward, cried Wilhelmina, bursting into tears. After some further persuasions on the part of Ramsay, and fresh tears from the attached maiden, it was agreed that she should act upon his suggestions, and with a throbbing heart she went to her chamber to make the necessary preparations, while Ramsay requested that Mynheer Krause would give him a few minutes of his company in his room above. The syndic soon made his appearance. "'Well, Mynheer Ramsay, you have some news to tell me, I am sure.' for Mynheer Krause, notwithstanding his rebuff from the king, could not divest himself of his failing of fetching and carrying reports. Ramsay went to the door and turned the key. I have indeed most important news, Mynheer Krause, and, I am sorry to say, very unpleasant also. Indeed, replied the syndic with alarm. Yes, I find from a notice given me by one of His Majesty's Council, assembled this morning at The Hague, that you are suspected of treasonable practices. God in heaven! exclaimed the syndic. And that this very night you are to be seized and thrown into prison. I, the syndic of the town? I, who put everybody else into prison? Even so. Such is the gratitude of King William for your long and faithful services, Mynheer Kraus. I have now sent for you that we may consult as to what had best be done. Will you fly? I have the means for your escape. Fly, Mynheer Ramsay? The syndic of Amsterdam fly? Never. They may accuse me falsely. They may condemn me and take off my head before the Stadthouse, but I will not fly. I expected this answer, and you are right, Mynheer Kraus. But there are other considerations worthy of your attention. When the populace know you are in prison for treason, they will level this house to the ground. Well, and so they ought, if they suppose me guilty. I care little for that. I am aware of that, but still your property will be lost. But it will be a matter of prudence to save all you can. You have already a large sum of gold collected. I have four thousand guilders, at least. You must think of your daughter, Mynheer Kraus. This gold must not find its way into the pockets of the mob. Now observe, the king's cutter sails tonight, and I propose that your gold be embarked, and I will take it over for you and keep it safe. Then let what will happen, your daughter will not be left to beggary. True, my dear sir, there is no saying how this will end. It may end well, but as you say, if the house is plundered, the gold is gone for ever. Your advice is good, and I will give you, before you go, orders for all the monies in the hands of my agents at Hamburg and Frankfurt and other places. I have taken your advice, my young friend, and though I have property to the amount of some hundred thousand guilders, with the exception of this house, they will hold little of it which belongs to Mynheer Kraus and my poor daughter, Mynheer Ramsay. Should any accident happen to you, you may trust to me, I swear to you, Mynheer Kraus, on my hope of salvation. Here the old man sat down, much affected, and covered his face. Oh, my dear young friend, 
what a world is this where they cannot distinguish a true and loyal subject from a traitor? But why could you not stay here, protect my house from the mob, demand the civic guard? I stay here, my dear sir? Why, I am included in the warrant of treason. You? Yes, and there would be no chance of my escaping my enemies. They detest me too much. But cheer up, sir. I think that, by my means, you may be cleared of all suspicions. By your means? Yes, but I must not explain. My departure is necessary for your safety. I will take the whole upon myself, and you shall be saved. I really cannot understand you, my dear friend, but it appears to me as if you were going to make some great sacrifice for my sake. I will not be questioned, Mynheer Kraus. Only this I say, that I am resolved that you shall be proved innocent. It is my duty. But we have no time to lose. Let your gold be ready at sunset. I will have everything prepared. But my daughter must not remain here. She will be by herself at the mercy of the mob. Be satisfied, Mynheer Kraus. That is also cared for. Your daughter must leave this house and be in a safe retreat before the officers come in to seize you. I have arranged everything. Where do you propose sending her? Not to any of your friends' houses, Mynheer Kraus. No, no, I will see her in safety before I leave. Do not be afraid. It must depend upon circumstances. But of that hereafter, you have no time to lose. God in heaven, exclaimed Mynheer Kraus, unlocking the door, that I, the syndic, the most loyal subject, well, you may truly say, put not your trust in princes. Trust in me, Mynheer Kraus, replied Ramsay, taking his hand. I do, I will, my good friend, and I will go to prison proudly, and like an innocent and injured man and Mynheer Kraus hastened down to his counting-house to make the proposed arrangements, Ramsay returning to Wilhelmina, to whom he imparted what had taken place between him and her father, and which had the effect of confirming her resolution. We must now return to the widow Vandersloosh, who has arrived safely, but melting with the heat of her journey, at the palace of The Hague. She immediately informed one of the domestics that she wished to speak with His Majesty upon important business. I cannot take your name into His Majesty, but if you will give it me, I will speak to Lord Albemarle. The widow wrote her name down upon a slip of paper, with which the servant went away, and then the widow sat down upon a bench in the hall and cooled herself with her fan. Frau Vandersloosh, said Lord Albemarle, on reading the name, let her come up. Why this, continued he, turning to the Duke of Portland, who was sitting by him, is the woman who is ordered to be arrested this night, upon the evidence of Lieutenant Van Slyperken. We shall learn something now, depend upon it. The Frau Vandersloosh made her appearance, sailing into the room like a Dutch man-of-war of that period, under full sail, high-pooped and broad-sterned. Never having stood in the presence of great men, she was not a little confused, so she fanned herself most furiously. "'You wish to speak with me?' said Lord Albemarle. "'Yes, your honor's honor. I've come to expose a sniveling traitor to His Majesty's crown. Yes, yes, Mr. Van Slyperken, we shall see now.' continued the widow, talking to herself and fanning away. "'We are all attentive, madam.' Mistress Vandersloosh then began, out of breath, and continued out of breath till she had told the whole of her story, which, as the reader must be aware, only corroborated all Van Slyperken had already stated, with the exception that he had denounced the widow. Lord Albemarle allowed her to proceed without interruption. He had a great insight into character, and the story of the widow confirmed him in his opinion of Vanslyperken. "'But my good woman,' said Lord Albemarle, 
Are you aware that Mr. Van Slyperken has already been here? Yes, Your Honor. I met him going back, and he turned his nose up at me, and I said then, Well, Mr. Van Slyperken, we shall see. Wait a little, Mr. Van Slyperken. And continued Lord Albemarle, that he has denounced you as being a party to all these treasonable practices? Me? Denounced me? He? Oh, Lord, oh, Lord! Only let me meet him face to face. Let him say it then, if he dares, the sniveling, cowardly, murdering wretch. Thereupon Mrs. Vandersloosh commenced the history of Van Slyperkin's wooing, of his cur snarliow, of her fancy for the corporal, of his finding her with the corporal the day before, of her beating him off with the brooms, and of her threatening to expose his treason. And so now, when he finds that he was to be exposed, he comes up first himself. That's now the truth of it, or my name's not Vandersloosh, your honor. And the widow walked up and down with the march of an elephant, fanning herself violently, her bosom heaving with agitation, and her face as red as a boiled lobster. Mistress Vandersloosh, said Lord Albemarle, let the affair rest as it is for the present, but I shall not forget what you have told me. I think now that you had better go home. At this dismissal the widow turned around. Thank your worship kindly, said she. I'm ready to come whenever I'm wanted. Yes, yes, Mr. Vanslyperkin, resumed the widow as she walked to the door, quite forgetting the respect due to the two noblemen. We shall see. Yes, yes, we shall see. Well, my lord, what do you think of this? said Lord Albemarle to the duke, as the widow closed the door. Upon my soul, I think she is honest. She is too fat for a traitor. I am of your opinion. The episode of the corporal was delightful, and has thrown much light upon the lieutenant's conduct, who was a traitor, in my opinion, if ever there was one. But he must be allowed to fulfill his task, and then we will soon find out the traitor. But if I mistake not, that man was born to be hung. We must now return to Mr. Van Slyperken, who received the note from Ramsay just as he was going down to the boat. As he did not know what steps were to be taken by government, he determined to go up to Ramsay and inform him of his order for immediate sailing. He might gain further information from his letters, and also remove the suspicion of his having betrayed him. Ramsay received Mr. Vanslyperken with an air of confidence. Sit down, Mr. Vanslyperken. I wish to know whether there is any chance of your sailing. I was about to come up to you to state that I have orders to sail this evening. That is fortunate, as I intended to take a passage with you. And what is more, Mr. Vanslyperken, I have a large sum in specie which we must contrive to get on board. Cannot we contrive it? I cannot go without it. A large sum in specie? Vanslyperken reflected. Yes, he would secure Ramsay as a prisoner and possess himself of the specie if he could. His entrapping Ramsay on board would be another proof of his fidelity and dexterity. But then Vanslyperken thought of the defection of the corporal, but that was of no great consequence. The crew of the cutter dared not disobey him when they were ordered to seize a traitor. While Van Slyperken was meditating this, Ramsay fixed his eyes upon him, waiting for his reply. "'It will be difficult,' observed Van Slyperken, "'to get the specie on board without being seen.' "'I'm afraid so, too. But I have a proposition to make. Suppose you get under way and heave to, a mile outside. I will then come off in the syndic's barge. I can have the use of it. Then nothing will be discovered.' Van Slyperken appeared to reflect again. "'I shall still run a great risk, Mr. Ramsay.' "'You will run some little, perhaps, but you will be well paid for it, I promise you.' "'Well, sir, I consent,' replied Van Slyperken. "'At what hour do you propose to embark?' 
about eleven or a little earlier. You will have a light over the stern. Hail the boat when you see it coming, and I shall answer, King's messenger with dispatches. That will be a blind to your crew. They supposed me a King's messenger before. Yes, that will be prudent, replied Van Slyperken, who then took his leave with great apparent cordiality. Villain, muttered Ramsay, as Van Slyperken shut the door, I know your thoughts. We must pass over the remainder of this eventful day. Wilhelmina had procured the dress of a boy, in which disguise she proposed to elope with Ramsay, and all her preparations were made long before the time. Mynheer Krauss was also occupied in getting his specie ready for embarkation, and Ramsay in writing letters. The dispatches from The Hague came down about nine o'clock, and Van Slyperken received them on board. About ten he weighed and made sail, and hove to about a mile outside, with a light shone as agreed. About the time arranged a large boat appeared, pulling up to the cutter. Boat ahoy! King's messenger with dispatches, was the reply. All's right, said Van Slyperken. Get a rope there from forward. The boat darted alongside of the cutter. She pulled ten oars, but as soon as she was alongside, a number of armed men sprang from her on the deck and beat the crew below, while Ramsay, with pistols in his belt and his sword in his hand, went aft to Van Slyperken. "'What is all this?' exclaimed the terrified lieutenant. "'Nothing, sir, but common prudence on my part,' replied Ramsay. "'I have an account to settle with you.' Van Slyperken perceived that his treachery was discovered, and he fell upon his knees. Ramsay turned away to give orders, and Van Slyperken darted down the hatchway and gained the lower deck. "'Never mind,' said Ramsay. "'He'll not escape me. Come, my lads, hand up the boxes as fast as you can.' Ramsay then went to the boat and brought up Wilhelmina, who had remained there, and conducted her down into the cabin. The boxes were also handed down, the boat made fast, and the conspirators remained in possession of the deck. The helm was taken by one of them, sail again made on the cutter, and the boat with a boatkeeper towed astern. End of chapter 46 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 47 of Snarleyow by Frederick Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Which is rather interesting. Mr. Van Slyperken's retreat was not known to the crew. They thought him still on deck, and he hastened forward to secrete himself even from his own crew who were not a little astonished at this unexpected attack, which they could not account for. The major part of the arms on board were always kept in Mr. Van Slyperken's cabin, and that was not only in possession of the assailants, but there was a strong guard in the passage outside, which led to the lower deck. "'Well, this beats my comprehension entirely,' said Bill Spurry. Yes, replied Short. And mine too, added Obadiah Cobble. Being as we are, as you know, at peace with all nations, to be boarded and carried in this way? Why, what and who can they be? I've a notion that Van Slyperkin's at the bottom of it, replied Spurry. Yes, said Short. But it's a bottom that I can't fathom, continued Spurry. My dipsy line aren't long enough either, replied Cobble. God for dumb, what it can be, exclaimed Jansen. It must be the treason. Mein God, yes, replied Corporal Van Spitter. It is all treason, and the traitor be Van Slyperken. But although the corporal had some confused ideas, still he could not yet arrange them. Well, I've no notion of being boxed up here, 
observed Cobble. They can't be so many as we are, even if they were stowed away in the boat like pilchards in a cask. Can't we get at the arms, Corporal, and make a rush for it? Mein Gott, de arms are all in de cabin, all but three pair pistols and the bayonets. Well, but we've handspikes, observed Spurry. God for dumb, give me de handspike, cried Jansen. We had better wait till daylight at all events, observed Cobble. We shall see our work better. Yes, replied Short. And in the meantime, get everything to hand that we can. Yes, replied Short. Well, I can't understand the maneuver. It beats my comprehension what they have done with Van Slyperken. I don't know, but they've kicked the cur out of the cabin. Then they've kicked him out, too, depend upon it. Thus did the crew continue to surmise during the whole night. But, as Billsbury said, the maneuver beat their comprehension. One thing was agreed upon, that they should make an attempt to recover the vessel as soon as they could. In the meantime, Ramsay, with Wilhelmina and the Jesuits, had taken possession of the cabin, and had opened all the dispatches which acquainted them with the directions in detail given for the taking of the conspirators at Portsmouth and in the cave. Had it not been to save his friends, Ramsay would at once have taken the cutter to Cherbourg, and have there landed Wilhelmina and the treasure. But his anxiety for his friends determined him to run at once for the cave, and send overland to Portsmouth. The wind was fair and the water smooth, and before morning the cutter was on her way. In the meantime the crew of the cutter had not been idle. The ladders had been taken up and hatches closed. The only chance of success was an attack upon the guard, who was stationed outside of the cabin. They had six pistols, about two hundred pounds of ammunition, but, with the exception of half a dozen bayonets, no other weapons. But they were resolute men, and as soon as they had made their arrangements, which consisted of piling up their hammocks so as to make a barricade to fire over, they then commenced operations, the first signal of which was a pistol shot discharged at the men who were on guard in the passage, and which wounded one of them. Ramsay darted out of the cabin at the report of the pistol. Another and another was discharged, and Ramsay then gave the order to fire in return. This was done, but without injury to the seamen of the cutter, who were protected by the hammocks, and Ramsay, having already three of his men wounded, found that the post below was no longer tenable. A consultation took place, and it was determined that the passage on the lower deck and the cabin should be abandoned, as the upper deck would be easy to retain. The cabin's skylight was taken off, and the boxes of gold handed up, while the party outside the cabin door maintained the conflict with the crew of the Jungfrau. When all the boxes were up, Wilhelmina was lifted on deck, the skylight was shipped on again, and as soon as the after hatches were ready to put on, Ramsay's men retreated at the ladder, which they drew up after them, and then put on the hatches. Had not the barricade of hammocks prevented them, the crew of the Jungfrau might have made a rush and followed the others on deck, but before they could beat down the barricades, which they did as soon as they perceived their opponent's retreat, the ladder was up, and the hatches placed over the hatchways. The Jungfraus had gained the whole of the lower deck, but they could do no more, and Ramsay perceived that if he could maintain possession of the upper deck, it was as much as he could expect with such determined assailants. This warfare had been continued during the whole morning, and it was twelve o'clock before the cabin and lower deck had been abandoned by Ramsay's associates. During the whole day the skirmishes continued, the crew of the Jungfrau climbing on the table of the cabin and firing through the skylight, but in so doing they exposed themselves to the fire of the other party, who sat like cats watching for their appearance, and discharging their pieces the moment that a head presented itself. 
In the meantime, the cutter darted on before a strong favorable breeze, and thus passed the first day. Many attempts were made during the night by the seamen of the cutter to force their way on deck, but they were all prevented by the vigilance of Ramsay, and the next morning the Isle of Wight was in sight. Wilhelmina had passed the night on the forecastle, covered up with a sail. None of his people had had anything to eat during the time that they were on board, and Ramsay was most anxious to arrive at his destination. About noon the cutter was abreast of the black gang shine. Ramsay had calculated upon retaining possession of the cutter and taking the whole of the occupants of the cave over to Cherbourg but this was now impossible. He had five of his men wounded, and he could not row the boat to the cave without leaving so few men on board that they would be overpowered, for his ammunition was expended, with the exception of one or two charges which were retained for an emergency. All that he could now do was, therefore, to put his treasure in the boat, and, with Wilhelmina and his whole party, make for the cave, when he could send notice to Portsmouth for the others to join them, and they must be content to await the meditated attack upon the cave and defend it till they could make their escape to France. The wind being foul for the cutter's return to Portsmouth would enable him to give notice at Portsmouth overland before she could arrive. There was a great oversight committed when the lower deck was abandoned, the dispatches had been left on Mr. Van Slyperken's bed. Had they been taken away or destroyed, there would have been ample time for the whole of his party to have made their escape from England before duplicates could arrive. As it was, he could do no more than what we have already mentioned. The boat was hauled up, the boxes of specie put in, the wounded men laid at the bottom of the boat, and, having at the suggestion of one of the men cut the lower riggings, halyards, etc., of the cutter to retard its progress to Portsmouth, Ramsay and his associates stepped into the boat and pulled for the cave. Their departure was soon ascertained by the crew of the Jungfrau, who now forced the skylight and gained the deck, but not before the boat had entered the cave. "'What's to be done now?' said Cobble. Smash my timbers, but they've played old Harry with the rigging. We must not in splice. Yes, replied Short. What the devil have they done with Van Slyperken? cried Bill Spurry. Either shoved him overboard, or taken him with them, I suppose, cried Cobble. Well, it's a nice job altogether, observed Spurry. Mein Gott, yes, replied the corporal. We will have a pretty story to tell the admiral. Well, they've rid us of him at all events. I only hope they'll hang him. Mein God, yes. He'll have his desserts, replied Cobble. God for Tom, I'd like to see him swing. Now he's gone, let's send his dog after him. Hurrah, my lads, get a rope up on the yard and let us hang Snarleyow. My God, I'll go fetch him, cried the corporal. You will, will you? roared a voice. The corporal turned round, so did the others, and there, with his drawn sword, stood Mr. Van Slyperken. You damn mutinous scoundrel, cried Van Slyperken. Touch my dog if you dare. The corporal put his hand up to the salute, and Van Slyperken shook his head with a diabolical expression of countenance. "'Now where the devil could he come from?' whispered Spurry. Cobble shrugged up his shoulders, and Short gave a long whistle, expending more breath than usual. However, there was no more to be said, and as soon as the rigging was knotted and spliced, sail was made on the cutter but the wind being dead in their teeth, they did not arrive until late the next evening, and the admiral did not see the dispatches till the next morning, for the best of all possible reasons, that Van Slyperken did not take them on shore. He had a long story to tell, and he thought it prudent not to disturb the admiral after dinner, 
as great men are apt to be very choleric during the process of digestion. The consequence was that when, the next morning, Mr. Van Slyperken called upon the admiral, the intelligence had been received from the cave, and all the parties had absconded. Mr. Van Slyperken told his own tale, how he had been hailed by a boat purporting to have a messenger on board, how they had boarded him, and beat down himself and his crew, how he and his crew had fought under hatches, and beat them on deck, and how they had been forced to abandon the cutter. All this was very plausible, and then Van Slyperken gave the dispatches opened by Ramsay. The admiral read them in haste, gave immediate orders for surrounding and breaking into the house of the Jew Lazarus, in which the military found nobody but an old tomcat, and then desired Mr. Van Slyperken to hold the cutter in readiness to embark troops and sail that afternoon. But troops do not move so fast as people think, and before one hundred men had been told off by the sergeant, with their accoutrements, knapsacks, and sixty pounds of ammunition, it was too late to embark them that night, so they waited until the next morning. Moreover, Mr. Van Slyperken had orders to draw from the dockyard three large boats for the debarkation of the said troops, but the boats were not quite ready. One required a new gunwale, another three planks in the bottom, and the third, having her stern out, it required all the carpenters in the yard to finish it by the next morning. Mr. Van Slyperken's orders were to proceed to the cave and land the troops to march up to the cave, and to cover the advance of the troops, rendering them all the assistance and his power in cooperating with the major commanding the detachment. But where the cave was, no one knew, except that it was thereabouts. The next morning, at eight o'clock, the detachment, consisting of one hundred men, were embarked on board of the cutter. But the major commandant, finding that the decks were excessively crowded, and that he could hardly breathe, ordered section first, section second, and section third, of twenty-five men each, to go into the boats and be towed, after which there was more room, and the cutter stood out for St. Helens. End of chapter 47 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 48 of Snarleyow by Frederick Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In which there is a great deal of correspondence, and the widow is called up very early in the morning. We must now return to Mynheer Kraus, who, after he had delivered over his gold, locked up his counting house and went up to the saloon determining to meet his fate with all the dignity of a Roman senator. He sent for his daughter, who sent word back that she was packing up her wardrobe, and this answer appeared but reasonable to the syndic, who, therefore, continued in his chair, reflecting upon his approaching incarceration, conning speeches, and anticipating a glorious acquittal until the bell of the cathedral chimed the half-hour after ten. He then sent another message to his daughter, and the reply was that she was not in the room, upon which he dispatched old Coops to Ramsay, requesting his attendance. The reply to this second message was a letter presented to the syndic, who broke the seal and read as follows. My dear and honored sir, I have sought a proper asylum for your daughter during the impending troubles, and could not find one which pleased, and in consequence I have taken the bold step, aware that I might not have received your sanction if applied for, of taking her on board the cutter with me. She will there be safe, and as her character might be, to a certain degree, impeached by being in company with a man of my age, I intend, as soon as we arrive in port, to unite myself to her, for which act, I trust, you will grant me your pardon. As for yourself, 
be under no apprehension. I have saved you. Treat the accusation with scorn, and if you are admitted into the presence of his majesty, accuse him of the ingratitude which he has been guilty of. I trust that we shall soon meet again, and that I may return to you the securities and specie of which I have charge, as well as your daughter, who is anxious once more to receive your blessing. Yours ever till death, Edward Ramsay. Mynheer Kraus read this letter over and over again. It was very mystifying. Much depends in this world upon the humor people are in at the time. Mynheer Kraus was, at that time, full of Cato-like devotion and Roman virtue, and he took the contents of the letter in true Catonic style. Excellent young man, to preserve my honor he has taken her away with him, and to preserve her reputation he intends to marry her. Now I can go to prison without a sigh. He tells me that he has saved me, saved me. Why, he has saved everything, me, my daughter, and my property. Well, they shall see how I behave. They shall witness the calmness of a stoic. I shall express no emotion or surprise at the arrest, as they will naturally expect, because I know it is to take place. No fear, no agitation when in prison, because I know that I am to be saved. I shall desire them to bear in mind that I am the syndic of this town, and must receive that respect which is due to my exalted situation. And Mynheer Van Kraus lifted his pipe, and ordered Koops to bring him a stone jug of beer, and thus doubly armed, like Cato, he awaited the arrival of the officer with all the stoicism of beer and tobacco. About the same hour of night that the letter was put into the hands of Mynheer Kraus, a packet was brought up to Lord Albemarle, who was playing a game of put with his grace the Duke of Portland. At that time put was a most fashionable game, but games are like garments, as they become old they are cast off and handed down to the servants. The outside of the dispatch was marked, To Lord Albemarle's own hands, immediate and most important. It appeared, however, as if the two noble lords considered the game of put as more important and immediate, for they finished it without looking at the packet in question, and it was midnight before they threw up the cards, after which Lord Albemarle went to a side table, apart from the rest of the company, and broke the seals. It was a letter with enclosures, and ran as follows. My Lord Albemarle, although your political enemy, I do justice to your merits, and to prove my opinion of you, address to you this letter, the object of which is to save your government from the disgrace of injuring a worthy man and a staunch supporter, to expose the villainy of a coward and a scoundrel. When I state that my name is Ramsay, you may at once be satisfied that, before this comes to your hands, I am out of your reach. I came here in the King's Cutter, commanded by Mr. Van Slyperken, with letters of recommendation to Mynheer Kraus, which represented me as a staunch adherent of William of Orange and a Protestant, and, with that impression, I was well received, and took up my abode in his house. My object, you may imagine, but fortune favored me still more in having in my power Lieutenant Van Slyperken. I opened the government dispatches in his presence, and supplied him with false seals to enable him to do the same, and give me the extracts which were of importance, for which I hardly need say he was most liberally rewarded. This has been carried on for some time, but it appears that in showing him how to obtain your secrets, I also showed him how to possess himself of ours, and the consequence has been that he has turned double traitor, and I have now narrowly escaped. The information possessed by Mynheer Kraus was given by me to win his favor for one simple reason, that I fell in love with his daughter, who has now quitted the country with me. 
He never was undeceived as to my real position, nor is he even now. Let me do an honest man justice. I enclose you the extracts from your duplicates made by Mr. Van Slyperken, written in his own hand, which I trust will satisfy you as to his perfidy, and induce you to believe in the innocence of the worthy syndic from the assurance of a man who, although a Catholic, a Jacobite, and, if you please, an attainted traitor, is incapable of telling you a falsehood. I am, my lord, with every respect for your noble character, yours most obediently, Edward Ramsay. This is corroboration of my suspicions, said Lord Albemarle, putting down the papers before the Duke of Portland. The Duke read the letter and examined the enclosures. Shall we see the king tonight? No, he is retired, and it is of no use. They are in prison by this time. We will wait the report tomorrow morning, ascertain how many have been secured, and then lay these documents before His Majesty. Leaving the two noble lords to go to bed, we shall now return to Amsterdam at twelve o'clock at night precisely. As the bell tolled, a loud knock was heard at the syndic's house. Coop, who had been ordered by his master to remain up, immediately opened the door, and a posse comitatus of civil power filled the yard. "'Where is Mynheer Kraus? inquired the chief in authority. "'Mynheer the syndic is upstairs in the saloon.' Without sending up his name, the officer went up, followed by three or four others, and found Mynheer Kraus smoking his pipe. "'Ah, my very particular friend, Mynheer Engelback, what brings you here at this late hour with all of your people? Is there a fire in the town?' "'No, Mynheer Syndic, it is an order, I am very sorry to say, to arrest you and conduct you to prison.' "'Arrest and conduct me to prison?' me the syndic of the town that is strange will you allow me to see your warrant yes it is all true and countersigned by his majesty i have no more to say mynheer engelback as syndic of this town and administrator of the laws it is my duty to set the example of obedience to them at the same time protesting my entire innocence coops get me my mantle Mynheer Engelback, I claim to be treated with the respect due to me as syndic of this town. The officers were not a little staggered at the coolness and sang-froid of Mynheer Kraus. He had never appeared to so much advantage. They bowed respectfully as he finished his speech. I believe, Mynheer Kraus, that you have some friends staying with you. I have no friend in the house except my very particular friend, Mynheer Engelback, replied the syndic. You must excuse us, but we must search the house. You have his majesty's warrant so to do, and no excuse is necessary. After a diligent search of half an hour, nobody was found in the house, and the officers began to suspect that the government had been imposed upon. Mynheer Kraus, with every mark of attention and respect, was then walked off to the Hotel de Ville, where he remained in custody, for it was not considered right by the authorities that the syndic should be thrown into the common prison upon suspicion only. When he arrived there, Mynheer Kraus surprised them all by the philosophy with which he smoked his pipe. But although there was nobody to be found except the syndic in the syndic's house, and not a soul at the house inhabited by the Jesuit, there was one more person included in the warrant, who was the widow Vandersloosh. For Lord Albemarle, although convinced in his own mind of her innocence, could not take upon himself to interfere with the decisions of the council. So, about one o'clock, there was a loud knocking at the widow's door which was repeated again and again before it awoke the widow, who was fatigued with her long and hot journey to the Hague. As for Babette, she made a rule never to awake at anything but the magical number six sounded by the church clock by her mistress's voice. 
Babette, cried the widow Vandersloosh. Babette. Yes, ma'am. There's a knock at the door, Babette. Only some drunken sailors, ma'am. They go away when they find they cannot get in. Here the peals were redoubled. Babette, get up, Babette, and threaten them with a watch. Yes, ma'am, replied Babette, with a terrible yawn. Knocking and thumping with strokes louder than before. Babette, Babette. I must put something on, ma'am, replied Babette, rather crossly. Speak to them out of the window, Babette. Here poor Babette came down to the first floor, and opening the window at the landing place on the stairs, put her head out and cried, If you don't go away, you drunken fellows, my mistress will send for the watch. If you don't come down and open the door, we shall break it open, replied the officer sent to the duty. Tell them it's no inn, Babette. We won't let people in after hours, cried the widow, turning in her bed and anxious to resume her sound sleep. Babette gave the message and shut the window. Break open the door, cried the officer to his attendants. In a minute or two the door was burst open, and the party ascended the staircase. "'Mercy on me! Babette, if they aren't come in!' cried the widow, who jumped out of her bed, and nearly shutting her door, which had been left open for ventilation, she peeped out to see who were the bold intruders. She perceived a man in black with a white staff. "'What do you want?' screamed the widow, terrified. "'We want Mistress Vandersloosh. Are you that person?' said the officer. "'To be sure I am. But what do you want here?' "'I must request you to dress and come along with me directly to the Stadthaus,' replied the officer, very civilly. "'Gott in Himmel! What's the matter?' "'It's on a charge of treasonable practices, madam.' "'Oh, I see. Mr. Van Slyperken.' "'Very well, good sir. I'll put on my clothes directly. I'll get up any hour in the night with pleasure to bring that villain. Yes, yes, Mr. Van Slyperken, we shall see. Babette, take the gentlemen down in the parlor, and give them some bottled beer. You'll find it very good, sirs. It's of my own brewing. And, Babette, you must come up and help me.' The officer did not think it necessary to undeceive the widow, who imagined that she was to give evidence against Van Slyperken, not that she was a prisoner herself. Still, the widow Vandersloosh did not like being called up at such an unseasonable hour, and thus expressed herself to Babette as she was dressing herself. "'Well, we shall see the ending of this, Babette. My under-petticoat is on the chair. I told the lords the whole truth, every word of it.' and i am convinced that they believe me too don't pull tight all at once babette how often do i tell you that i do believe you missed a hole the cunning villain goes there and says that i yes babette that i was a traitor myself and i said to the lords do i look like a traitor my petticoats babette how stupid you are why your eyes are half shut now you know I always wear the blue first, then the green, and the red last, and yet you will give me the first which comes. He's a handsome lord, that Duke of Portland. He was one of the bons before King William went over and conquered England, and he was made a lord for his valor. My rough Babette. The Dutch are a brave nation. My bustle now. How much beer did you give the officers? Mind you, take care of everything while I am gone. I shall be home by nine, I dare say. I suppose they are going to try him now, that he may be hanged at sunrise. I knew how it would be. Yes, yes, Mr. Van Slyperken. Every dog has his day, and there's an end of you, and of your cur also, I've a notion. The widow, being now duly equipped, walked downstairs to them, and proceeded with the officers to the Stadthouse. She was brought into the presence of Mynheer Engelback, who held the office of Provost. "'Here's the widow Vandersloosh, Mynheer.' "'Very well,' replied Engelback. 
who was in a very bad humor at the unsuccessful search after the conspirators, away with her. Away? Where? exclaimed the widow. Engelback did not condescend to make a reply. The officers were mute, but one stout man on either side seized her arms and led her away, notwithstanding expostulation and some resistance on her part. "'Where am I going? What is all this?' exclaimed the widow, terrified, but there was no answer. At last they came to a door, held open already by another man with a bunch of keys. The terrified woman perceived that it was a paved stone cell, with a brick arch over it, in short, a dungeon. The truth flashed upon her for the first time. It was she who had been arrested for treason. But before she could shriek, she was shoved in, and the door closed and locked upon her. And the widow sank down into a sitting posture on the ground, overcome with astonishment and indignation. Was it possible? Had the villain prevailed? was the question which she asked herself over and over again, changing alternately from sorrow to indignation, at one time wringing her hands, and at others exclaiming, Well, well, Mr. Vanslyperkin, we shall see. End of chapter 48 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 49 of Snarleyow by Frederick Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In which is related much appertaining to the pomp and glorious circumstance of war. The arrival of Ramsay and his party was so unexpected that, at first, Lady Barclay imagined that they had been betrayed and that the boat was filled with armed men from the king's cutter, who had come on shore with a view of forcing an entrance into the cave. In a minute every preparation was made for defense, for it had long been arranged that, in case of an unexpected attack, the women should make all the resistance in their power, and which the nature of the place enabled them to do. But, as many observed, the party, although coming from the cutter, and not badly armed, did not appear to advance in a hostile manner. After waiting some time near the boat, they advanced, each with a box on his shoulder. But what those boxes might be was a puzzle. They might be hand grenades for throwing into the cave. However, they were soon down to the rock at which the ladder was let down, and then Smallbones stood up with a musket in his hands, with his straddling legs and short petticoat, and bawled out, Who goes there? Ramsay, who was assisting Wilhelmina, looked up, surprised at this singular addition to the occupants of the cave. And Wilhelmina also looked at him and said, Can that be a woman, Ramsay? At all events, I've not the honor of her acquaintance. But she is pointing her musket. We are friends! cried Ramsay. Tell Mistress Alice it is Ramsay. Smallbones turned round and reported the answer, and then, in obedience to his orders from Mistress Alice, he cried out, in imitation of the sentinels, Pass, Ramsay, and all's well, presented his arms, and made a flying leap off the rock where he stood, down on the platform, that he might lower the ladder as soon as Ramsay was up, who desired everybody might be sent down to secure the boxes of specie as fast as they could, lest the cutter's people, releasing themselves, should attempt an attack. Now there was no more concealment necessary, and the women as well as the men went down the precipitous path and brought up the treasure, while Ramsay introduced Wilhelmina to Lady Barclay, and in a brief but clear narrative told her all that had passed and what they had now to expect. There was not a moment for delay. The Cutter's people might send the dispatches overland if they thought of it, and be there as soon, if not sooner, than themselves. Nancy Corbett was summoned immediately, and her instructions given. 
the whole of the confederates at portsmouth were to come over to the cave with what they could collect and carry about their persons and in case of the cutter sending overland with the precaution of being in disguise of arms and ammunition there was sufficient in the cave which ramsay now felt was to be defended to the last until they could make a retreat over to the other side of the channel in half an hour nancy was gone and that very night had arrived at portsmouth and given notice to the whole of the confederates upon consultation it was considered that the best disguise would be that of females and in consequence they were all so attired and before morning had all passed over two or three in a boat and landed at ride where they were collected by moggy salisbury who alone of the party knew the way to the retreat they walked across the island two and three one party just keeping out of sight of the next ahead of them and arrived without suspicion or interruption conducted by moggy salisbury lazarus the jew and sixteen stout and desperate men who had remained secreted in the jew's house ready to obey any order however desperate the risk might be of their employers when they were all assembled at the brow of the precipice with the exception of lazarus who looked like a little old woman a more gigantic race of females was never seen for determined upon a desperate resistance if discovered they had their buff jerkins under their female garments they were soon in the cave and very busy under ramsay's directions preparing against the expected attack sir robert barclay with his boat had been over two days before and it was not known when he would return that his presence was most anxiously looked for may be readily conceived as his boat's crew would double their force if obliged to remain there and his boat would enable them with the one brought by ramsay to make their escape without leaving one behind before the attack could be made nancy corbett as the reader may have observed did not return to the cave with the conspirators as she was not suspected she determined to remain at portsmouth till the last and watch the motions of the authorities the cutter did not arrive till the evening of the second day and the dispatches were not delivered to the admiral till the third morning when all was bustle and preparation nancy corbett was everywhere she found out what troops were ordered to embark on the expedition and she was acquainted with some of the officers as well as the sergeants and corporals an idea struck her which she thought she could turn to advantage she slipped into the barrack yard and to where the men were being selected and was soon close to a sergeant whom she was acquainted with so you've an expedition on hand sergeant tanner yes mistress corbett and i'm one of the party i wish you joy replied nancy sarcastically oh it's nothing mistress corbett nothing at all only some smugglers in a cave we'll soon rout them out i've heard a different account from the admiral's clerk why what have you heard first tell me how many men are ordered out a hundred rank and file eight non-commissioned officers two lieutenants one captain and one major bravo sergeant you'll carry all before you why i hope so mistress corbett especially as we are to have the assistance of the cutter's crew better and better still replied nancy ironically i wish you joy of your laurel sergeant <laughs> why do you laugh mistress corbett and what is it that you have heard at the admiral's office what you may hear yourself and what i know to be true there is not a single smuggler in the cave no exclaimed the sergeant what nobody there yes there is somebody there the cave has been chosen by the smugglers to land their goods in but some of them must be there in charge of the goods yes so there are but they are all women the smugglers wives who live there what an expedition let me see 
one gallant major one gallant captain two gallant lieutenants eight gallant non-commissioned officers and a hundred gallant soldiers of the buffs all going to attack and rout and defeat a score of old women but you're joking mistress nancy upon my life i'm not sergeant you'll find it true the admiral's ashamed of the whole affair and the cutter's crew swear they won't fire a single shot by the god of war exclaimed the sergeant but this is cursed bad news you bring mistress corbett not at all your regiment will become quite the fancy you'll go by the name of the lady killers ha 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 i wish you joy sergeant ha 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 nancy corbett knew well the power of ridicule she left the sergeant and was accosted by one of the lieutenants she rallied him in the same way but are you really in earnest nancy said lieutenant dillon at last upon my soul i am but at the same time i hear that they will fight hard for they are well armed and desperate like their husbands and they swear that they'll all die to a woman before they yield so now we shall see who fights best the women or the men i'll back my own sex for a gold jacobus lieutenant will you take the bet good god how very annoying i can't i won't order the men to fire at women i could not do so if they were devils incarnate a woman is a woman still and never the worse for being brave lieutenant dillon as i said to sergeant tanner your regiment after this will always go by the name of the lady killers damn exclaimed the lieutenant but now i recollect there must be more there those who had possession of the cutter and who landed in her boat yes with forty boxes of gold they say but do you think they would be such fools as to remain there and allow you to take their money that boat started for france yesterday night with all the treasure and is now safe at cherbourg i know it for a fact for one of the men's wives who lives here showed me a letter to that effect from her husband in which he requests her to follow him but i must go now good-bye mr lady keller the lieutenant repeated what nancy had told him to the officers and the major was so much annoyed that he went up to the admiral and stated what the report was and that there were only women to contend with it is mentioned in the dispatches i believe observed the admiral that there are only women supposed to be in the cave but the smugglers who are on board the cutter have left with the species yesternight admiral so that we shall gain neither honor nor profit at all events you will have the merit of obeying your orders major lincoln the major made no reply but went away very much dissatisfied in the meantime the sergeant had communicated with his non-commissioned officers and the privates ordered on duty and the discontent was universal most of the men swore that they would not pull a trigger against women if they were shot for it if they were shot for it and the disaffection almost amounted to mutiny nancy in the meantime had not been idle she had found means to speak with the boat's crew of the jungfrau stated the departure of the smugglers with their gold and the fact that they were to fight with nothing but women that the soldiers had vowed that they would not fire a shot and that moggy salisbury who was with them swore that she would hoist up her smock as a flag and fight to the last this was soon known on board of the jungfrau and gave great disgust to every one of the crew who declared to a man that they would not act against petticoats much less fire a shot at moggy salisbury what a mountain of mischief can be heaped up by the insidious tongue of one woman after this explanation it may be supposed that the zeal of the party dispatched was not very great the fact is they were all sulky from the major downwards among the military and from van slyperken downwards among the naval portion of the detachment nancy corbett satisfied with having effected her object had crossed over the night before and joined her companions in the cave 
and what was extremely fortunate on the same night sir robert barclay came over in the lugger and finding how matters stood immediately hoisted both the boats up on the rocks and taking up all the men prepared with his followers for a vigorous resistance naturally to be expected from those whose lives depended upon the issue of the conflict the next morning the cutter was seen coming down with the boats in tow hardly stemming the flood from the lightness of the breeze when nancy corbett requested to speak with sir robert barclay she stated to him what she had done and the dissatisfaction among the troops and seamen in consequence and submitted to him the propriety of all the smugglers being dressed as women as it would operate more in their favor than if they had fifty more men to defend the cave sir robert perceived the good sense of this suggestion and consulted with ramsay who strongly urged the suggestion being acted upon the men were summoned and the affair explained to them and the consequence was that there was a scene of mirth and laughter which ended with every man being fitted with women's attire the only one who remained in the dress of a man was a woman wilhelmina kraus but she was to remain in the cave with the other women and take no part in the coming fray end of chapter forty nine recording by arnold banner thurmond north carolina Chapter Fifty of Snarleyow by Frederick Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In which the officers, non commissioned officers, and rank and file are all sent to the right about. About noon, the Jungfrau hove to off the cave, and the troops were told off into the boats. About half-past twelve the troops were in the boats already. About one Mr. Van Slyperken had hoisted out his own boats, and they were manned. Mr. Van Slyperken, with his pistols in his belt and his sword drawn, told Major Lincoln that he was all ready. Major Lincoln, with his spy-glass in his hand, stepped into the boat with Mr. Van Slyperken, and the whole detachment pulled for the shore and landed in the small cove where they found the smugglers boats hoisted up on the rocks at which the men appeared to be rejoiced as they took it for granted that they would find some men to fight with instead of women the major headed his men and they commenced a scramble up the rocks and arrived at the foot of the high rock which formed the platform above at the mouth of the cave when the major cried halt a very judicious order considering that it was impossible to go any farther the soldiers looked about everywhere but could find no cave and after an hour's strict search major lincoln and his officers glad to be rid of the affair held a consultation and it was agreed that the troops should be re-embarked the men were marched down again very hot from their exertions and thus the expedition would have ended without bloodshed had it not been for the incautious behavior of a woman that woman was moggy salisbury who having observed that the troops were re-embarking took the opportunity while sir robert and all the men were keeping close to hoist up a certain undergarment to a pole as if in derision thus betraying the locality of the cave and running the risk of sacrificing the whole party in it. This, as it was going up, caught the eye of one of the seamen in the boat, who cried out, "'There goes the ensign up to the peak at last!' "'Where?' exclaimed the major, pulling out his telescope. "'Yes, by heavens, there it is, and there then must be the cave.' Neither Sir Robert nor any of the conspirators were aware of this maneuver of Moggy's, for Smallbones, perceiving what she had done, hauled it down again in a minute afterwards, but it had been hoisted, and the Major considered it his duty to return, so once more the troop ascended the precipitous path. Moggy then went into the cave. "'They have found us out, sir,' said she. "'They point to us, and are coming up again. I will stand as sentry. 
The men won't fire at me, and if they do, I don't care. Sir Robert and Ramsay were in close consultation. It appeared to them that by a bold maneuver they would be able to get out of their scrape. The wind had gone down altogether. The sea was as smooth as glass, and there was every appearance of a continued calm. If we could manage it, and I think we may, then the sooner the affair is brought to an issue, the better. Moggy had now taken a musket on her shoulder, and was pacing up and down the edge of the flat in imitation of a sentry. She was soon pointed out, and a titter ran through the whole line. At last, as the major approached, she called out, "'I say, soldier, what are you doing here? Keep off, or I'll put a bullet in your jacket.' "'My good woman,' replied the major, while his men laughed, "'we do not want to hurt you, but you must surrender.' "'Surrender?' cried Moggy. "'Who talks of surrendering? Hoist the colors there.' Up went the chemise to the end of the pole, and Smallbones grinned as he hoisted it. "'My good woman, we must obey our orders.' "'And I must obey mine,' retorted Moggy. "'Turn out the guard there.' All the women now made their appearance, as had been arranged, with muskets on their shoulders, headed by little Lily with her drawn sword. The sight of the child commanding the detachment was hailed with loud cheers and laughter. "'That will do, that will do,' cried Sir Robert, fearful for Lily. "'Let them come in again.' "'They'll not fire first, at all events,' cried Moggy. "'Never fear, sir. Guard, turn in,' continued she, upon which Lily and her squadron then disappeared. "'Upon my honor, this is too ridiculous,' said Lieutenant Dillon. "'Upon my soul, I don't know what is to be done,' rejoined the Major. "'Moggy, we must commence hostilities somehow or another,' cried Sir Robert from within. Smallbones here came out with his musket to release Moggy, and Moggy retired into the cave. The Major, who imagined that there must be a path to the cave on the other side, now advanced with the determination of finding it out, and somehow or another putting an end to this unusual warfare. "'If you please, you'll keep back or I'll fire,' cried Smallbones, leveling his musket. The Major went on, heedless of the threat. Smallbones discharged his piece, and the Major fell. "'Confound that she-devil! Are you hurt, Major?' cried Lieutenant Dillon. "'Yes, I am. I can't move.' Another shot was now fired, and the sergeant fell. "'Hell in flames! What must we do?' But now the whole party of smugglers poured out of the cave, as women with bonnets on, and commenced a murderous fire upon the troops, who fell in all directions. The captain, who had assumed the command, now attempted to find his way to the other side of the cave, where he had no doubt he should find the entrance. But in so doing the soldiers were exposed to a most galling fire, without being able to return it. At first the troops refused to fire again. For that they had to deal with the smugglers' wives they made certain of. Even in the thickest of the smoke there was nothing masculine to be seen and those troops who were at a greater distance and could return the fire did not. They were rather amused at the character of the women, and not being aware that their comrades were falling so fast, remained inactive. But there is a limit to even gallantry, and as the wounded men were carried past them their indignation was roused, and at last the fire was as warmly returned but before that took place one half of the detachment was hors de combat. All the assistance which they might have received from the covering party of sailors on the beach was neutralized. They did not know how much the soldiers had suffered, and although they fired in pursuance of orders, they would not take any aim. For some time the soldiers were forced on to the eastern side of the rock, which, as the reader may recollect, was much more precipitous than the western side, where it was descended from by the latter. Here they were at the mercy of the conspirators, 
who, concealed below the masses of the rock on the platform, took unerring aim. The captain had fallen, Lieutenant Dillon was badly wounded and led back to the boats, and the command had devolved upon a young man who had but just joined the regiment, and who was ignorant of anything like military tactics, even if they could have been brought into play upon the service. "'Do you call this fighting with women, Sergeant Tanner?' said one of the men. "'I've seen service, but such a murderous fire I was never in. Why, we've lost two-thirds of our men. And we shall lose them all before we find out the mouth of this cursed cave. The regiment has lost its character for ever, and I don't care how soon a bullet settles my business.' Ramsay now detached a party of the men to fire at the covering party of seamen who were standing by the boats in the cove, and who were unprotected, while his men were concealed behind the masses of rocks. Many fell, wounded or killed, and Van Slyperken, after shifting about from one position to another, ordered the wounded men to be put into his boat, and with two hands he pulled off, as he said, to procure more ammunition leaving the remainder of his detachment on shore to do as well as they could. "'I thought as how this work would be too warm for him,' observed Bill Spurry. "'Yes,' replied Short, who at the moment received a bullet in his thigh and fell down among the rocks. The fire upon the seamen continued to be effective. Moved from their post they did not, but one after another they sank wounded on the ground. The soldiers were now without any one to command them, for those who had forced their way to the western side of the rock, finding that advance or retreat was alike impossible, crawled under the sides of the precipice to retreat from a murderous fire which they could not return. The others were scattered here and there, protecting themselves as well as they could below the masses of stone, and returning the fire of the conspirators surely and desperately. But of the hundred men sent upon the expedition, there were not twenty who were not killed or wounded, and nearly the whole detachment of seamen had fallen where they stood. It was then four o'clock. The few men who remained unhurt were suffering from the extreme heat and exertion and devoured with thirst. The wounded cried for water. The sea was still calm and smooth as a mirror. Not a breath of wind blew to cool the fevered brows of the wounded men, and the cutter, with her sails hanging listless, floated about on the glassy water about a quarter of a mile from the beach. "'Now is our time, Sir Robert.' "'Yes, Ramsay. Now for one bold dash. Off with this woman's gear, my men. Buckle on your swords and put pistols in your belts.' In a very short time this order was complied with, and, notwithstanding some of the men were wounded in this day's affair, as well as in the struggle for the deck of the cutter, the three bands from Amsterdam, Portsmouth, and Cherbourg mustered forty resolute and powerful men. The ladder was lowered down, and they descended. Sir Robert ordered Jemmy Ducks and Smallbones to remain and haul up the ladder again and the whole body hastened down to the cove, headed by Sir Robert and Ramsay, seized the boats, and shoved off for the cutter. End of chapter 50 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 51 of Snarleyow by Frederick Marriott this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In which the Jacobite cause is triumphant by sea as well as by land. The great difficulty which Sir Robert Barclay had to surmount was to find the means of transport over the channel for their numerous friends, male and female, then collected in the cave. Now that their retreat was known, it was certain that some effective measure would be taken by government, by which, if not otherwise reduced, they would be surrounded and starved into submission. The two boats which they had were not sufficient for the transport of so numerous a body, consisting now of nearly one hundred and fifty individuals, 
and their means of subsistence were limited to a few days. The arrival of the cutter with the detachments was no source of regret to Sir Robert, who hoped, by the defeat of the troops, to obtain their boats and thus make his escape. But this would have been difficult, if not impossible, if the cutter had been under command, as she carried four guns, and could have prevented their escape, even if she did not destroy the boats. But when Sir Robert observed that it had fallen calm, it at once struck him that if, after defeating the troops, they could board and carry the cutter, all their difficulties were over. Then they could embark the whole of their people, and run her over to Cherbourg. This was the plan proposed by Sir Robert, and agreed to by Ramsay, and to accomplish this, now that the troops were put to the rout, they had made a rush for and obtained the boats. As for the women left in the cave, they were perfectly secure for the time, as, without scaling ladders, there was no possibility of the remaining troops, even if they were rallied, being able to effect anything. That part of the crew of the Jungfrau who had perceived them rush down to the beach reported it to Mr. Van Slyperken, who had gone down to his cabin, not choosing to take any further part in the affray or to risk his valuable life. Van Slyperken came on deck, where he witnessed the manning of the boats and their pushing out of the cove. They are coming to attack us, sir, said Cobble, who had been left in charge of the cutter when Mr. Van Slyperken went on shore. Mr. Van Slyperken turned pale as a sheet. His eyes were fixed upon the form of Ramsay, standing up on the stern sheets of the first boat, with his saber raised in the air. He immediately recognized him, panted for breath, and could make no reply. The crew of the cutter, weakened as they were by the loss of most of their best men, flew to their arms. Cobble, Cornelius, and Jansen, and Corporal Van Spitter were to be seen in the advance, encouraging them. "'God for Dom! Let us have one slap for it!' cried Jansen. "'Mein Gott, yes!' shouted the Corporal. Van Slyperken started up. "'It's no use, my men! It's madness! Useless! Sacrifice of life! They are two to one! We must surrender! Go down below, all of you! Do you hear? Obey my orders!' "'Yes, and report them, too, to the Admiral,' replied Cobble. "'I never heard such an order given in my born days, and fifty-odd years I have served in the King's fleet.' "'Corporal Van Spitter, I order you below!' "'All of you, below!' cried Van Slyperken. "'I command here. Will you obey, sir?' "'Mein Gott, yes,' replied the corporal, walking away and coolly descending the ladder. The boats were now within ten yards of the cutter, and the men stood irresolute. The corporal obeying orders had disheartened them, and some of them followed the corporal. "'It's no use,' said Cobble. I sees now it's of no use. It's only being cut to pieces for nothing, my men, but I won't leave the deck. Cobble threw away his cutlass and walked aft. The other men did the same, all but Jansen, who still hesitated. Cobble caught the cutlass out of his hand and threw it overboard, just as the boats dashed alongside. God for Dom, muttered Jansen folding his arms and facing the men who jumped on the cutter's deck. Ramsay, who was first on board, when he perceived that the men were standing on the decks without making any opposition, turned and threw up the points of the swords of some of his men who were rushing blindly on, and in a minute all was quiet on the decks of the Jungfrau. Mr. Van Slyperken was not to be seen. At the near approach of the boats he had hastened into his cabin and locked himself in, his only feeling being that Ramsay's wrath must cool and his life be spared. "'My lads,' said Sir Robert to the crew of the cutter, "'I am very glad that you made no resistance to a force which you could not resist, as I should have been sorry if one of you had lost his life. But you must now go down below and leave the cutter's deck in our possession.' 
Perhaps it would be better if some of you took one of your boats and went on shore to pick up your messmates who are wounded. If you please, sir, we will, said Cobble, coming forward, and the cutter is yours as far as we are concerned. We will make no attempts to retake her at all events, for your kindness in thinking of our poor fellows lying there on the beach. I think you will promise that, my lads, continued Cobble, turning to the men. Yes, we promise that, said the men. Cobble then took the crew with him and pulled on shore to the cove, on the margin of which they found all their men lying either killed or wounded. Dick Short, Spurry, and nine others were taken up on board. Those that were quite dead were left upon the sand. Leaving only ten men on board the cutter, which, however, was sufficient to cope with the few of the Jungfrau remaining on board, had they been inclined to forfeit their word, Sir Robert and Ramsay then returned with the rest of the party to the boats and pulled on shore, for the rest of their assailants were not subdued. About twenty of the soldiers still remained unhurt and were sitting down on the rocks. Ramsay, as soon as he landed, showed a white handkerchief on a bayonet fixed to the muzzle of a musket. "'Sergeant Tanner,' said one of the men, "'there's a flag of truce.' "'Is there?' I'm not sorry for it. They are two to one even now. I'll go forward to meet it. The sergeant advanced to meet Ramsay. We might, if we pleased, oblige you to surrender or cut you to pieces, that you must own. But we have no wish to hurt you. There are too many good men dead already. That's true, replied the sergeant, but it's one comfort you have turned out at last to be men and not women. We have, but to the terms. You were sent to take possession of the cave. You shall have possession as soon as we are gone, if you will draw off your party higher up this cliff, and allow us to embark without molestation. If you do not immediately accept these terms, we shall certainly attack you. Or you may do better if you please. Pile your muskets, collect your wounded men, bring them down to the beach all ready to put into the boats, which, as soon as we are safe, we will give you possession of. Now, is it a truce or not? You must be immediate. Yes, then, it is a truce, for I see no chance of better terms. I am commanding officer, and you have the faith of Sergeant Tanner. The sergeant then returned, and when halfway called to his men, Party, fall in, pile arms. The soldiers, worn out by the long conflict, and aware that they had no chance against such superior numbers, gladly obeyed, and were now divided in sections of three and four, collecting the wounded and carrying them down to the cove. Sir Robert and his men hastened to the rock, the ladder was lowered, and all was on the alert for embarkation. Lady Barclay and Lily flew into his arms, while Wilhelmina hung on Ramsay but they allowed but a short time for endearment. Time was too precious. The luggage had all been prepared, and the chests of specie were lowered, the bundles thrown down, and in a quarter of an hour the cave was cleared of all that they could take away with them. The women then descended, and all hands were employed carrying away the specie and luggage down to the boats. As soon as one boat was loaded with the boxes of money, Lady Ramsay, Lily, and Wilhelmina were put into it, and one half of the men went with them on board of the cutter, where Cobble had already arrived with the wounded seamen. Ramsay remained with the other boat to embark the women and luggage. When all was in, he called the sergeant, pointed out to him the latter, and told him that he might find something worth his trouble in the cave. "'Is there a drop of anything to drink, sir?' for we who are whole are dying with thirst, and it's cruel to hear the poor wounded fellows beg for water. You will find both water and spirits in plenty there, sergeant, and you may tell your own story when you arrive at Portsmouth. We shall never contradict you. The list of killed, wounded, and missing will tell the story fast enough, replied the sergeant. But run up there, my lads, and get some water for these poor fellows, 
Good-bye, sir, and many thanks. Good-bye to you, Sergeant Tanner, said one of the women in the boat. Nancy Corbett, by all that's wonderful, cried the sergeant. I told you so, sergeant. You'll never lose the name of Lady Keller. Pretty lady killing, muttered the sergeant, turning away in a rage. Ramsay took the boats on board, and as soon as they were cleared, they were towed on shore to the cove by some of the Jungfrau's men. During this time, the ladies, as well as the women, had remained aft on deck, Van Slyperken having locked himself up in his cabin. But Sir Robert now ordered his men to force the cabin door and take Mr. Van Slyperken forward on the lower deck. When the door was opened, Van Slyperken was found in his bed, more dead than alive. He was pulled out and dragged forward. The ladies were then handed below, and as soon as the specie had been put down and the luggage cleared from the upper deck, the women were ordered to go down on the lower deck, and Mr. Van Slyperken ordered to be brought up. End of chapter 51 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 52 of Snarleyow by Frederick Marriott This LibriVox recording is in the public domain In which a great deal of loyalty is shown to counterbalance the treason of Van Slyperken we must not, however, forget the syndic and the widow Vandersloosh, whom we left in confinement in Amsterdam. We left Mynheer Kraus smoking his pipe, and showing to those about him how great a great man always proves himself when under adversity. The widow also, had she performed in public, would have been acknowledged to have been a great woman. She could not but lament the present, for she was on the floor of a dungeon, so she occasionally wrung her hands, but she looked forward to the future and to better times, not abandoning herself to despair, but comforting herself with hope, as might have been clearly proved by her constant repetition of these words. Well, well, Mr. Van Slyperken, we shall see. That the night appeared long to both parties is not to be denied but the longest night will have its end, so long as the world continues to turn round. The consequence was that the morning came as usual to the syndic, although the widow, from the peculiarity of her situation, had not the same advantage. After morning comes breakfast, in the natural order of mundane affairs, and kings being but men, and subject to the same wants as other mortals, his Majesty, King William, sat down and dispatched a very hasty meal, in company with His Grace the Duke of Portland and the Right Honorable the Lord Albemarle. History does not record, as it sometimes does in works of this description, by what viands His Majesty's appetite was stimulated. We must therefore pass it over, and, as His Majesty did on that occasion, as soon as breakfast was over, proceed the business. Have you received information, my lord Albemarle, how many of the conspirators have been seized? May it please your majesty, I am sorry to inform you that all who were innocent have been imprisoned, and all who were guilty have escaped. Upon this intelligence his majesty looked very grave. How do you mean, my lord, said he, after a pause, the conspirators have all received some friendly notice, and the only two who are in custody are the syndic, Mynheer Kraus, and the woman who keeps the Lust House. And you put the syndic down as an innocent person, my lord? If your majesty will be pleased to read this communication, replied Lord Albemarle, presenting Ramsay's letter and enclosures, you will then be of my opinion. King William took the letter and read it. What Ramsay, he who was attainted with Sir Robert Barclay? The same, your majesty. So near us, and escaped? But what credence would you place in him? 
Every credence may it please your majesty. I believe him to be incapable of a lie. A traitor like him? A traitor to your majesty, but most true to his Catholic majesty, King James, that was. But if I venture to point out to your majesty, the enclosures prove that Lieutenant Van Slyperkin's word is not of much value. He at least is a double traitor. Yes, a little hanging will do him no harm. You are sure this is his writing? There can be no doubt of it, your majesty. I have compared it. You will see to this, my lord, and now to the syndic. He has, as your majesty will perceive, been grossly deceived and suspected without reason. And the woman? Was here yesterday, and fully convinced me that Van Slyperken was a traitor, and that she was innocent. His grace of Portland was present. Well, my lord, you may give orders for their release. Of course, a little surveillance will be advisable. You will justify the proceedings to the council this afternoon. But may I presume to submit to your majesty that the public affront offered to the syndic should be repaired? Certainly, send for him, replied his majesty carelessly. I will receive him tomorrow morning. And his majesty left the room. Lord Albemarle immediately dispatched a courtier with an order for the release of the syndic and the Frau van der Sloosh, with a note to the former stating that His Majesty would receive him on the following day at noon. But while this act of justice had been preparing at the Palace of the Hague, there were other acts, not quite so justifiable, performing at the town of Amsterdam. The sun made its appearance more than an hour before the troops of the Royal Guard. Mobs were collected in knots in the street and in front of the Hotel de Ville, or Stadthouse, and the object of their meeting was to canvass the treason and imprisonment of the syndic, Mynheer van Kraus. Shame! Shame! Death to the traitor! Tear him to pieces! And long life to King William! were the first solitary remarks made, the noise and hubbub increased. The small knots of people gradually joined together until they formed a large mob, all burning with loyalty, and each individual wishing to give a practical evidence of it. Again were the cries of, Long live the king! and Death to the traitors! to be heard with loud huzzas. A confused din followed, and the mob appeared, as if simultaneously, to be all impelled in one direction. At last the word was given, which they all waited for. To his house, to his house, down with it, death to the traitor! And the loyal mob hastened on, each individual eager to be the first to prove his loyalty by helping himself to Mynheer Krause's goods and chattels. In the Low Countries this species of loyalty always has been and is now very much the fashion. In ten minutes the gates were forced open. Old Coops knocked down and trod underfoot till he was dead. Every article of value that was portable was secured. Chairs, tables, glasses, not portable, were thrown out of the window. Wilhelmina's harp and pianoforte battered into fragments beds, bedding, everywhere flew about in the air, and then the fragments of the furniture were set fire to, and in less than an hour Mynheer Krause's splendid house was burning furiously, while the mob cheered and cried, Long live King William! Before the courier could arrive from The Hague, all that was left of Mr. Krause's property was the bare walls. Merchandises, everything was consumed, and part of the building had fallen into the canal and choked it up, while fifteen scheuts waiting to be discharged of their cargoes had been obliged to retreat from the fury of the flames, the phlegmatic skippers looking on with their pipes in their mouths and their hands in their wide breeches pockets. The loyal mob, having effected their object, gradually retired. It is singular that popular feeling is always expressed in the same way. Had the mob collected for disloyal purposes, 
they would have shown their disloyalty just in the like manner, only it would have been the Stadthaus instead of that of Mynheer Krauss. But now there was a fresh impetus given to the feelings of the mob. The news had been spread like wildfire, that Mynheer the syndic had been proved innocent, and ordered to be immediately liberated, and was sent for by his majesty, upon which the mob were undecided whether they should prove their indignation at this unjust imprisonment of their worthy magistrate by setting fire to some public building, or by carrying him in triumph to his own house, which they forgot they had burnt down. Fortunately, they decided upon the latter. They surrounded the Stadthaus with cries of, long life to our worthy syndic, prosperity to Mynheer Kraus, and rushing upstairs they caught him in their arms and carried him triumphantly through the streets, bringing him at last to the smoking ruins of his own house, and there they left him. They had done all they could, they had carried him there in triumph, but as for building the house up again, that was impossible. So, as Mynheer Kraus looked with dismay at the wreck of all his property, the loyal mob dispersed, each feeling that he had been a little too hasty in possessing himself of a small share of it. What a fine thing is loyalty! Mynheer Kraus found himself alone. He looked with scorn and indignation upon the scene of violence, and then walked away to an hotel, particularly disgusted with the loyal cry of, Long live King William! In the meantime, the door of the dungeon where the widow Vandersloosh was incarcerated was thrown open, and she was informed that she was no longer a prisoner. The widow, indignant that she should have been confined for her loyalty, raved and walked majestically out of the Stadthouse, not deigning to answer to the compliments offered to her by some of the inferior officers. Her bosom swelled with indignation, and she was determined to tell His Majesty a bit of her mind, if she should obtain access to him, and the next day she took the trouble to go all the way to The Hague again to see His Majesty. But His Majesty wasn't at home, and Lord Albemarle, to whom she sent in, was indisposed, and His Grace, the Duke of Portland, was particularly engaged so the widow had the journey for nothing, and she declared to Babette that she never would put her foot under the palace roof again as long as she lived. But although Madame Vandersloosh was not received at court that day, the syndic Mynheer Kraus was. When he sent in his name, Lord Albemarle led the syndic by the hand to His Majesty. "'We have been too hasty, Mynheer Kraus,' said His Majesty, with a gracious smile. Mynheer bowed low. I regret to hear that the populace, in their loyalty, have burnt down your house, Mr. Kraus. They were too hasty. Mynheer Kraus made another low bow. You will continue your office of syndic of the town of Amsterdam. Pardon me, Your Majesty, replied Mynheer Kraus respectfully but firmly. I have obeyed your summons to appear in your presence, but will request that your majesty will release me from the burden. I have come to lay my chain and staff of office at your majesty's feet, it being my intention to quit the town. You are too hasty, Mynheer Kraus, replied his majesty with displeasure. May it please your majesty, replied Kraus, he who has been confined as a prisoner in the Stadthaus is not fit to exercise his duties there as a judge. I have served your majesty many years with the utmost zeal and fidelity. In return, I have been imprisoned and my property destroyed. I must now return to a station more suitable to my present condition. And once more, with every assurance of loyalty, I beg to be permitted to lay my insignia of office at your majesty's feet. Mynheer Kraus suited the action to the word. The king frowned and turned away to the window, and Mynheer Kraus, perceiving that his majesty's back was turned upon him, walked out of the door. Too hasty, thought Mynheer Kraus, I am loyal and thrown into prison, 
and am expected to be satisfied with the plea of being too hasty? My house is burnt down, and the plundering mob have been too hasty? Well, well, it is fortunate I took Ramsay's advice. My house and what was in it was a trifle, but if all my gold at Hamburg and Frankfurt, and in the charge of Ramsay, had been there, and I had been made a beggar, all the satisfaction I should have received would have been a smile and the excuse of being too hasty. I wonder where my daughter and Ramsay are. I long to join them. From which mental soliloquy it will be evident to the reader that Mynheer Krause's loyalty had been considerably diminished, perhaps thinking that he had paid too dear for the commodity. Upon his return, Mynheer Krause publicly announced that he had resigned the office of syndic, much to the astonishment of those who heard of it, and much to the delight of his very particular friend, Engelback, who the next morning set off for The Hague, and had an interview with his grace, the Duke of Portland, the result of which was that upon grounds best known to the parties, for history will not reveal everything, Mynheer Engelback was recommended to fill the office of syndic of the town of Amsterdam, vacant by the resignation of Mynheer Kraus, and that, in consequence of this, all those who took off their hats to Mynheer Kraus but two days before, and kept them on when they met Mynheer Engelback, now kept them on when they met Mynheer Kraus, and pulled them off very politely to Mynheer Kraus's very particular friend, Mynheer Engelback. End of chapter 52. Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina. Chapter 53 of Snarleyow by Frederick Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Trial and execution of two of the principal personages in our history. We left Sir Robert Barclay on the deck of the cutter, the ladies and women sent down below, and Mr. Van Slyperken on the point of being dragged aft by two of Sir Robert's men. The crew of the Jungfrau, at the time, were on the lower deck, some assisting the wounded men, others talking with Jemmy Salisbury and his wife, whom they were astonished to find among the assailants. Why, Jemmy, how did you get a berth among those chaps? I'll tell you, said Moggy, interrupting. When he was last at Portsmouth, they heard him playing his fiddle and singing. And they took such a fancy to him that they were determined to have him to amuse them in the cave. So one evening they kidnapped him, took him away by main force, and kept him a prisoner ever since. That's carrying the joke rather too far, observed one of the men. Mein Gott, yes, replied the corporal. But I am at liberty again now, at all events, replied Jemmy, taking the cue from his wife. And if that chap Van Slyperken don't command the cutter any more, which I've a notion he will not, I shall enter as boatswain, eh, Dick? Yes, replied Short who was swinging in his hammock. "'Well, when I found that Jemmy couldn't be found, that my dear darling duck of a husband, my jewel, a box of diamonds, aren't you, my Jemmy? Didn't I tear my hair and run about the streets like a mad woman?' continued Moggy. "'At last I met with Nancy Corbett, whose husband is one of the gang, and she told me where he was, fiddle and all.' and I persuaded her to let me go to him, and that's why we both are here. This was a good intention of Moggy's, and as there was nobody who took the trouble to disprove it, it was received as not the least apocryphal. But now Mr. Van Slyperken was dragged past them by two of the conspirators, and all the men of the Jungfrau followed on deck to see what was to take place. When Mr. Van Slyperken had been brought aft, his legs tottered, and he could hardly stand. His face was livid, and his lips white with fear, and he knew too well that he had little mercy to expect. 
Now, sir, said Sir Robert, with a stern air, hear the accusation against you, for although we may be lawless, we will still be just. You voluntarily entered into our service and received our pay. You are one of us, with only this difference, that we have taken up the cause from principle and loyalty, and you joined us from mercenary motives. Still, we kept our faith with you, for every service performed you are well and honorably paid. But you received our money and turned against us, revealed our secrets, and gave information to your government by which that gentleman, pointing to Ramsay, and many others, had not they fortunately received timely notice, would have perished by the gibbet. Now, sir, I wish to know what you can bring forward in your defense. What have you to urge that you should not die the death which you so traitorously prepared for others? Die? exclaimed Vanslyperken. No, no, mercy, sir, mercy. I am not fit to die. Few are, but this is certain, that a villain like you is not fit to live. On my knees I ask mercy, cried the frightened wretch, dropping down. Mr. Ramsay, speak for me. I will speak, replied Ramsay, but not for you. I will show you that even if you were to escape us, you would still be hung. For all your extracts of the dispatches I have, with full explanation, put into the hands of the English government. Do you expect mercy from them? They have not shown much as yet. Oh, God! Oh, God! exclaimed Vanslyperken, throwing himself down on the deck in despair. Now, my lads, you have heard the charges against this man, and also that he has no defense to offer. What is your sentence? Death, exclaimed the conspirators. You men belonging to the cutter, you have heard that this man has betrayed the present government of England, in whose pay and service he was at the time. What is your opinion? Hereupon Obadiah Cobble hitched up his trousers and said, Why, as a matter of opinion, I agrees with you, sir, whomsoever you may be. My God, yes, sir, exclaimed the corporal. And all the crew cried out together, Death, death, which, by the by, was very mutinous. You perceive that you are doubly condemned as a double traitor, said Sir Robert. So prepare to die. The religion you profess I know not, but the time you will be allowed to make your peace with your God is fifteen minutes. Oh, groaned Van Slyperken, with his face to the deck. Up there, my lads, and get a whip on the yard arm, said Ramsay. Some of the party went to obey the order, and they were assisted by the seamen of the Jungfrau. But while they were getting the whip ready on the starboard, Jimmy Ducks was very quietly employed getting another on the larboard yard arm, which nobody took notice of. As soon as the whip and the cord with the hangman's noose made fast to it were all ready, it was reported to Sir Robert by Corporal Van Spitter, who stepped up to him with his usual military salute, Sir Robert took off his hat in return. His watch had been held in his hand from the time that he had passed sentence upon Van Slyperken, who still remained prostrate on the deck. It is my duty to inform you, sir, that but five minutes are left of the time awarded to you, said Sir Robert to Van Slyperken. Five minutes, exclaimed Van Slyperken, jumping up from the deck, but five minutes? To die in five minutes, continued he, looking up with horror at the rope at the yard arm and the fatal noose at the end of it, held in the hand of Corporal Van Spitter. Stop! I have gold, plenty of gold. I can purchase my life. Kingdoms would not purchase it, said Sir Robert scornfully. Oh, exclaimed Van Slyperken, wringing his hands, must I leave all my gold? You have but two minutes, sir, observed Sir Robert. Let the rope be put round his neck. This office was performed by Corporal Van Spitter, 
The corporal was quite an amateur. "'Mercy! Mercy!' cried Van Slyperken, again falling on his knees and holding up his hands. "'Call upon heaven for mercy. You have but one minute left.' But here an interruption took place. A female made her appearance on the other side of the deck, dragging by a cord the hero of our novel, Snarleyow, who held back with all his power, shirking his head to the right and to the left, but it was of no use. He was dragged opposite to where Van Slyperken knelt. As the reader may guess, this person was Smallbones, who had tied on a bonnet and muffled up his face so as not to be observed when he first went on board. Jemmy Ducks now assisted, and the whip on the larboard yard arm was made fast to a cord with a running noose for the hanging of the cur. The sight roused Van Slyperken. "'My dog!' exclaimed he. "'Woman, leave that dog alone. Who are you that dare touch my dog?' The female turned round, threw off her bonnet and handkerchief, and exhibited to the terrified lieutenant the face of the supposed departed Smallbones. "'Smallbones!' exclaimed the crew of the Jungfrau in a breath. "'God of mercy, help me! God of mercy!' cried Van Slyperken, aghast. "'I suppose that you do come for to go for to know me now, anyhow,' said Smallbones. "'Hath the sea given up its dead?' replied Van Slyperken, in a hollow voice. "'No, it aren't, cause why? I never was a drown,' replied Smallbones. "'No thanks to you, though. But if so be as I supposes you are going to be hung, as I'm a good Christian, I'll forgive you, that is, if you'll be hung, you know.' Van Slyperken, who now perceived that Smallbones had been, by some miracle, preserved, recovered himself. "'If you forgive me,' replied Van Slyperken, "'then pray do not ill-treat my dog.' "'I's not forgiven him, anyhow. I owes him enough, and now I'll have his account settled, by gum. When you goes up there, he goes up here, as sure as I'm Peter Smallbones.' "'Be merciful!' exclaimed Van Slyperken, who, strange to say, forgot his own miseries in pleading for his darling cur. "'He be a convicted traitor, and he shall die, by gum!' cried Smallbones, smacking his fist into the palm of his hand. During the conversation the time allotted to Van Slyperken had long expired, but the interest occasioned by it had inclined Sir Robert to wait till it was over. "'Enough,' cried Sir Robert. "'Your time is too long expired. Commend your soul to God. Let the rope be manned.' "'Now, Jemmy, stand by to toddle forwards,' cried Smallbones. "'One moment. I ask for but one moment,' cried Van Slyperken, much agitated. "'Only one moment, sir.' "'For what?' "'To kiss my poor dog,' replied Van Slyperken, bursting into tears. Strange and almost ridiculous as was the appeal, there was a seriousness and a pathos in Van Slyperken's words, and a manner which affected those who were present like a gleam of sunshine. This one feeling which was unalloyed with baser metal shone upon the close of a worthless and wicked life. Sir Robert nodded his head, and Van Slyperken walked with his rope round his neck over to where the dog was held by Smallbones, bent over the cur, and kissed it again and again. "'Enough,' cried Sir Robert. "'Bring him back.' Corporal Van Spitter took hold of Van Slyperken by the arm and dragged him to the other side of the deck. The unfortunate wretch was wholly absorbed in the fate of his cur, who had endeavoured to follow his master. His eyes were fixed upon Snarleyow, and Snarleyow's were fixed upon his master. Thus they were permitted to remain for a few seconds, when Sir Robert gave the signal. Away went the line of men who had manned the starboard whip, and away went Jemmy Ducks on the larboard side, and at the yard-arms of the cutter were suspended the bodies of Van Slyperken and Snarleyow. 
thus perished one of the greatest scoundrels and one of the vilest curs which ever existed they were damnable in their lives and in their deaths they were not divided by the manuscript records found in the jacobite papers it appears that the double execution took place on the third of august in the year of our lord seventeen hundred End of chapter 53. Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina. Chapter 54 of Snarleyow by Frederick Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In which affairs begin to wind up. There are few people whose vindictive feelings are not satisfied with the death of the party against whom those feelings have been excited. The eyes of all on deck, that is, all except one, were at first directed to the struggling Van Slyperken, and then, as if sickened at the sight of his sufferings, were turned away with a feeling very near akin to compassion. One only looked, or never thought of Van Slyperken, and that one was Smallbones, who watched the kicking and plunging of his natural enemy, Snarleyow. Gradually the dog relaxed his exertions, and Smallbones watched, somewhat doubtful, whether a dog who had defied every other kind of death would condescend to be hanged. At last Snarleyow was quite still. He appeared nearly to have gone to where the wicked cease from troubling and the weary are at rest. "'He won't come to life any more this time,' said Smallbones. "'But I'll not let you out of my hands yet. They say a cat have nine lives, but by gum some dogs have ninety. There was a dead silence on the deck of the cutter for a quarter of an hour, during which the bodies remained suspended. A breeze then came sweeping along, and ruffled the surface of the water. This was of too great importance to allow of further delay. Sir Robert desired the seamen of the Jungfrau to come aft, told them he should take their cutter to Cherbourg to land the women and his own people, and that then they would be free to return to Portsmouth. All that he requested of them was to be quiet and submissive during the short time that he and his party were on board. Cobble replied for the ship's company. As for the matter of that air, there was no fear of their being quiet enough when there were more than two to one against them. But that, in fact, they had no animosity, for even if they did feel a little sore at what had happened, and their messmates being wounded, what was swinging at the yard-arm made them all friends again. The gentleman might take the cutter where he pleased, and might use her as long as he liked and when he had done with her, it was quite time enough to take her back to Portsmouth. Well then, as we understand one another, we had now better make sail, said Sir Robert. Cut away that rope, continued he, pointing to the whip by which Van Slyperken's body was suspended. Jansen stepped forward with his snicker see, the rope was divided at once, and the body of the departed Van Slyperken plunged into the wave and disappeared. "'They mayn't cut this, though,' cried Smallbones. "'I'll not trust him. Jimmy, my boy, get up a pig of ballast. I'll sink him fifty fathoms deep. And then, if so be he come up again, why, then, I give it up for a bad job.' Jimmy brought up the pig of ballast. The body of Snarleyow was lowered on board, and, after having been secured with diverse turns of the rope to the piece of iron, was plunged by Smallbones into the wave. "'There,' said Smallbones, "'I don't think that he will ever bite me any more, anyhow. There's no knowing, though. Now I'll just go down and see if my bag is to be found, and then I'll dress myself like a Christian.' The cutter flew before the breeze, which was on her quarter, and now that the hanging was over, the females came on deck. One of the Jesuit priests was a good surgeon, and attended to the wounded men who all promised to do well, and, as Bill Spurry said, they'd all dance yet at the corporal's wedding. 
I say, Corporal, if we could only go to Amsterdam instead of going to Portsmouth. Mein Gott, yes, replied the Corporal, and, acting upon this idea, he went aft and entered into conversation with Ramsay, giving him a detail of the affair with the widow, and of her having gone to the Hague to accuse Van Slyperken, ending with expressing his wish of himself and the crew that they might go to the Hague instead of going to Portsmouth. Nothing could please Ramsay more. He was most anxious to send a letter to Mynheer Kraus to inform him of the safety of his daughter, and he immediately answered that they might go if they pleased. Mein Gott, but how, Mynheer? We no have the excuse. But I'll give you one, replied Ramsay. You shall go to the Hague. The corporal touched his hat with the greatest respect, and walked forward to communicate this good news. The crew of the Jungfrau and the conspirators or smugglers were soon on the best of terms, and as there was no one to check the wasteful expenditure of stores, and no one accountable, the liquor was hoisted up on the forecastle, and the night passed in carousing. "'Well, he did love his dog after all,' said Jimmy Ducks. "'And he's got his love with him,' replied one of the smugglers. "'Now, Jemmy, let's have a song.' "'It must be without the fiddle, then,' replied Jemmy, "'for that's jammed up with the baggage. So here goes.' "'I've often heard the chaplain say when Davy Jones is nigh "'that we must call for help in need to providence on high.' But then he said most plainly, too, that we must do our best, our own exertions failing, leave to providence the rest. I never thought of this much till one day there came on board a chap who ventured to join as seaman by the Lord. His hair hung down like reef points, and his fizz was very queer for his mouth was like a shark's and turned it down from ear to ear. He hadn't stood his hammock not much longer than a week, when he swore he had a call and the Lord he was to seek. Now where he went to seek the Lord I can't at all suppose. T'was not on deck, for there I'm sure he'd never showed his nose. He would not read the Bible, it warn't good enough for him. The course we steered by that, he said, would lead us all to sin. That we were damned and hell would gape, he often would us tell. I know that when I heard his jaw, it made me gape like hell. A storm came on, we sprang a leak, and sorely were we tired. We plied the pumps, twas spell and spell, with lots of work beside. And what do you think this beggar did, the trick I do declare? He called us all to leave the pumps and join with him in prayer. At last our boatswain Billy, who was a thundering Turk, goes up to him and says, my man, why don't you do your work? I'll vaunt you worst of sinners, I must save my soul, he cried. Confound your soul, says Billy, then you shall not save your hide. Acquaintance then he made soon with the end of the forebrace. It would have made you laugh to see his methodisty face. He grinned like a roast monkey and he howled like a baboon. He had a dose from Billy that he didn't forget soon. Take that, said Billy, when he done, and now you'll please to work. I read the Bible often, but I don't my duty shirk. The pumps they are not choked yet, nor do we yet despair. When all is up, or we are saved, we'll join you in a prayer. And now we'll have one from the other side of the house, said Moggy, as soon as the plaudits were over. Come then, Anthony, you shall speak for us and prove that we can sing a stave as well as honester men. With all my heart, William, here's my very best. The smuggler then sang as follows. Fill, lads, fill, fill, lads, fill. Here we have a cure 
for every ill if fortune's unkind as the northeast wind still we must endure trusting to our cure in better luck still drink boys drink drink boys drink the bowl let us drain with right good will if women deceive why should we grieve forgetting our pain love make again with better luck still sing lad sing sing lad sing our voices will raise be merry still if dead to-morrow we brave all sorrow life's a weary maze when we end our days tis better luck still as the wounded men occupied the major part of the lower deck and there was no accommodation for the numerous party of men and women on board the carousing was kept up until the next morning when at daylight the cutter was run into cherbourg the officers who came on board went on shore with the report that the cutter belonged to the english government and had been occupied by sir robert and his men who were well known the consequence was an order for the cutter to leave the port immediately as receiving her would be tantamount to an aggression on the part of france but this order although given was not intended to be rigidly enforced and there was plenty of time allowed for sir robert and his people to land with their specie and baggage ramsay did not forget his promise to the corporal he went to the french authorities stated the great importance of his forwarding a letter to amsterdam immediately and that the way it might be effected would be very satisfactory that aware that king william was at the hague they should write a letter informing him of the arrival of the cutter and that his majesty might not imagine that the french government could sanction such outrages they had sent her immediately on to him under the charge of one of their officers to await upon his majesty and express their sentiments of regret that such a circumstance should have occurred the authorities were aware that to obey sir robert would not be displeasing to the court of versailles and that the excuse for so doing could only be taken as a compliment to the english court therefore acted upon this suggestion a french officer was sent on board of the cutter with the dispatch and ramsay's letter to mynheer krause was committed to the charge of the corporal before the sun had set the young frau was again at sea and on the third morning anchored in her usual berth off the town of Amsterdam. End of chapter 54 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 55 of Snarleyow by Frederick Marriott This LibriVox recording is in the public domain in which we trust that everything will be arranged to the satisfaction of our readers. The French officer who was sent to explain what had occasioned the arrival of the cutter in the port of Cherbourg immediately set off for The Hague and was received by Lord Albemarle. As soon as his credentials had been examined, he was introduced to His Majesty King William. It appears, said His Majesty to Lord Albemarle, after the introduction, that these Jacobite conspirators have saved us one trouble by hanging this traitor Van Slyperken. Yes, Your Majesty, he has met with his deserved punishment, replied Lord Albemarle. Then addressing himself to the officer, we will return our acknowledgments for this proof of good will on the part of the French government, said His Majesty, bowing. My Lord Albemarle, you will see that this gentleman is suitably entertained. The officer bowed low and retired. This is an over-politeness which I do not admire, observed His Majesty to Lord Albemarle. Let that person be well watched. Depend upon it, the letter is all a pretext, 
there is more plotting going on. I am of your majesty's opinion, and shall be careful that your majesty's commands are put in force, replied his lordship, as King William retired into his private apartments. The cutter had not been half an hour at anchor before Obadiah Cobble went on shore with the corporal. Their first object was to apply to the authorities that the wounded men might be sent to the hospital, which they were before the night. The next was to deliver the letter to Mynheer Kraus. They thought it advisable to go first to the widow Vandersloosh, who was surprised at the sight of her dear corporal, and much more enraptured when she heard that Mr. Van Slyperken and his cur had been hanged. "'I'll keep my word, corporal,' cried the widow. "'I told you I would not marry until he was hung. I don't care if I marry you to-morrow.' "'My God! Yes, to-day!' "'No, no, not to-day, corporal, or to-morrow either. We must wait till the poor fellows are out of the hospital.' for I must have them all to the wedding. Mein God, yes, replied the corporal. The widow then proceeded to state how she had been thrown into a dungeon, and how she and Mynheer Kraus, the syndic, had been released the next day, how Mynheer Kraus's house had been burned to the ground, and all the other particulars with which the reader is already acquainted. This reminded the corporal of the letters to Mynheer Kraus, which he had for a time forgotten, and he inquired where he was to be found. But the widow was too prudent to allow the corporal to go himself. She sent Babette, who executed her commission without exciting any suspicion, and made Mynheer Kraus very happy. He soon made his arrangements and joined his daughter and Ramsay, who had not, however, awaited his arrival, but had been married the day after they landed at Cherbourg. Mynheer Kraus was not a little surprised to find that his son-in-law was a Jacobite, but his incarceration and loss of his property had very much cooled his loyalty. He settled at Hamburg, and became perfectly indifferent whether England was ruled by King William or King James. Ramsay's marriage made him also less warm in the good cause. He had gained a pretty wife and a good fortune, and to be very loyal a person should be very poor. The death of King James in the year following released him from his engagements, and as he resided at Hamburg he was soon forgotten, and was never called upon to embark in the subsequent fruitless attempts on the part of the Jacobites. As it was necessary to write to the Admiralty in England, acquainting them with the fate of Mr. Van Slyperken, and demanding that another officer should be sent out to take the command of the Jungfrau, a delay of three or four weeks took place, during which the cutter remained at Amsterdam. For Dick Short and Cobble were no navigators, if they had wished to send her back, and, moreover, she had so many of her crew at the hospital that she was weak-handed. It was about a month after her arrival at Amsterdam that every soul belonging to the cutter had gone on shore, and she was left to swing to the tide and foul her hawse, or go adrift as she pleased, for she had to take care of herself. This unusual disregard to naval instructions arose from the simple fact that on that day was to be celebrated the marriage of widow van der Sloosh and corporal van spitter great indeed had been the preparations all the ingenuity and talents of jemmy ducks and moggy and bill spurry for he and all the others were now discharged from the hospital had been summoned to the assistance of the widow and babette in preparing and decorating the lust house for the important ceremony which the widow declared King William himself should hear of, cost what it might. Festoons of flowers, wreaths of laurel garlands for the ceiling, extra chandeliers, extra musicians, all were dressed out and collected in honor of this auspicious day. The whole of the crew of the cutter were invited, not, however, to feast at the widow's expense, 
neither she nor the corporal would stand treat, but to spend their money in honor of the occasion. And it must be observed that since their arrival in port, the young Frau had spent a great deal of money at the widow's, which was considered strange, as they had not for some time received any pay. And it was further observed that none appeared so wealthy as Smallbones and Corporal Van Spitter. Some had asserted that it was the gold of Mr. Van Slyperken, which had been appropriated by the crew to their own wants, considering themselves as legitimate heirs. Whether this be true or not, it is impossible to say. Certain it is that there was no gold found in Mr. Van Slyperken's cabin when his successor took possession of it. And equally certain it was that all the Jungfraus had their pockets full of gold, and that the major part of this gold did ultimately fall into the possession of the widow Vandersloosh, who was heard to say that Mr. Van Slyperken had paid the expenses of her wedding. From these facts collected, we must leave the reader to draw what inference he may please. The widow, beautifully dressed, a white kersey petticoat, deep blue stockings, silver buckles in her shoes, a scarlet velvet jacket with long flaps before and behind, a golden cross six inches long suspended to a velvet ribbon, which was attached halfway between the cross and her neck, a large gold heart, gold earrings, and on her head an ornament, which in Holland and Germany is called a zitternabel, shook and trembled as she walked along to church, hanging on to the arm of her dear corporal. Some of the bridges were too narrow to admit the happy pair to pass abreast, the knot was tied. The name Vandersloosh was abandoned without regret for the sharper one of Van Spitter, and flushed with joy and the thermometer at ninety-six, the cavalcade returned home and refreshed themselves with some beer of the Frau Van Spitter's own brewing. Let it not, however, be supposed that they dined tete-a-tete. -tete. No, no, the corporal and his wife were not so churlish as that. The dinner party consisted of a chosen set, the most particular friends of the corporal. Mr. Short, first officer and boatswain, Mr. William Spurry, Mr. and Mrs. Salisbury, and last, although not the least important person in this history, Peter Smallbones, Esquire, who, having obtained money somehow, was now remarkable for the neatness of his apparel. The fair widow, assisted by Moggy and Babette, cooked the dinner, and when it was ready, came in from the kitchen as red as a fury, and announced it. And then it was served up, and they all sat down to table in the little parlor. It was very close. The gentlemen took off their jackets, and the widow and Moggy fanned themselves, and the enormous demand by evaporation was supplied with foaming beer. None could have done the honors of the table better than the corporal and his lady, who sat melting and stuck together on the little fubsy sofa, which had been the witness of so much pretended and so much real love. But the Lust House is now lighted up. The company are assembling fast. Babette is waddling and trotting like an armadillo from corner to corner, Babette is here, Babette there, it is Babette everywhere. The room is full, and the musicians have commenced tuning their instruments. The party run from the table to join the rest. A general cheer greets the widow as she is led into the room by the corporal, for she had asked many of her friends as well as the crew of the Jungfrau, and many others came who were not invited so that the wedding day, instead of disbursement, produced one of large receipt to the happy pair. Now then, Corporal, you must open the ball with your lady, cried Bill Spurry. Mein Gott, yes. What shall it be, Madame Van Spitter? A waltz, if you please. The musician struck up a waltz, and Corporal Van Spitter, who had no notion of waltzing, further than having seen the dance performed by others, seized his wife by the waist, 
who, with an amorous glance, dropped her fat arm upon the corporal's shoulder. This was the signal for the rest. The corporal had made but one turn before a hundred couple more were turning also. The whole room seemed turning. The corporal could not waltz, but he could turn. He held on fast by the widow, and with such a firm piece of resistance he kept a centrifugal balance. And without regard to time or space he increased his velocity at a prodigious rate. Round they went, with the dangerous force of the two iron balls suspended to the flywheel which regulate the power of some stupendous steam engine. The corporal would not, and his better half could not, stop. The first couple they came in contact with were hurled to the other side of the room. A second and third fell, and still the corporal wheeled on. Two chairs and a table were swept away in a moment. Three young women with baskets of cake and nuts were thrown down together, and the contents of all their baskets were scattered on the floor, and— Bravo, corporal, resounded from the crew of the Jungfrau. Babette and the two bottles of ginger beer were next demolished. Jimmy Ducks received a hoist, and Smallbones was flattened to a pancake. Everyone fled from the orbit of these revolving spheres, and they were left to wheel by themselves. At last Mrs. Van Spitter, finding that nothing else would stop her husband, who, like all heavy bodies, once put in motion, returned it in proportion to his weight, dropped down and left him to support her whole weight. This was more than the corporal could stand, and it brought him up all standing. He stopped, dropped his wife, and reeled to a chair, for he was so giddy he could not keep his legs, and so out of breath that he had lost his wind. "'Bravo, Corporal!' was shouted throughout the room, while his spouse hardly knew whether she should laugh or scold him well. But it being the wedding night, she deferred the scolding for that night only, and she gained a chair and fanned and wiped and fanned and wiped again. The Corporal, shortly afterwards, would have danced again. But Mrs. Van Spitter, having had quite enough for that evening, she thanked him for the offer— was satisfied with his prowess, but declined on the score of the extreme sultriness of the weather, to which observation the corporal replied as usual, "'Mein God, yes!' The major part of the evening was passed in dancing and drinking. The corporal and his wife, with Babette, now attending to the wants of the customers, who, what with the exercise, the heat of the weather, and the fumes of tobacco, were more than usually thirsty, and as they became satisfied with dancing, so did they call for refreshments. But we cannot find space to dwell upon the quantity of beer, the variety of liquors which were consumed at this eventful wedding, with which we wind up our eventful history, nor even to pity the breathless, flushed, and overheated Babette, who was so ill the next day as to be unable to quit her bed nor can we detail the jokes, the merriment, and the songs which went round, the peals of laughter, the loud choruses, the antic feats performed by the company. Still more impossible would it be to give an idea of the three tremendous cheers which shook the Lust House to its foundations, when Corporal and Mistress Van Spitter, upon their retiring, bade farewell to the company assembled. The observation of Jemmy Salisbury, as he waddled out, was as correct as it was emphatic. "'Well, Dick, this has been a spree.' "'Yes,' replied Dick Short. End of chapter 55 End of Snarleyow Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina